Welcome everyone. This is Mainframe Comic Con, man. Thank you everyone for hanging out on the show today and for the rest of the day. Guys, don't miss it. It's going to be epic. It's going to be artists, writers, creators. It's going to be off the chain, guys. Don't miss it. I'm telling you. And don't forget, all oh, every single penny you donate to the show goes to Hero Initiative. I'm telling you, man. Go to MainframeComicCon.com. You can donate right there. But we got more people to hang out, more panel members. And let's see who's be jumping on right now. What is going on, guys? Welcome to Mainframe Comic Con. And we are ready. We are set. We are going to be talking to artists. We are going to be talking to a lot of people throughout the day. And it's going to be very interesting. It's going to be very fun. So I hope you guys can stay tuned through the day and come in, see your favorite interviews, be with us, right, um, right at us and ask your questions. We're going to be talking to really, really great um, people today. So we're looking forward to doing this. Well said, Angel. That is my friend, Angel. So thank you, Angel, for hanging out. We're going to bring in someone else in a few minutes. But today we're going to have a very special guest. He is one of them right now. This is Mark from Splash hey. Page Art. Mark, thank you for hanging out, man. Tell them who yeah, you are. Nice, nice to join you guys. Uh, so I am... Um, an art dealer by trade. I work with Paolo Rivera, our, our main guest that will be coming on shortly. Uh, I've been working with him since he came out of Rhode Island School of Design uh, at a, as a youngster at the age of 22. So um, we go way back. Um, so a lot of his fans are going to be joining us today. I've been communicating with him. And this panel will be unlike most panels at the show. Um, Paolo will be drawing for everybody uh, throughout the, the panel. Uh, we, he's also produced um, 12 pieces of artwork that uh, we'll be showing the images of. And uh, you all um, can communicate in the comment section. The first person that says, take it, uh, will win the piece. Um, so I know uh, we'll be showing those images shortly so everybody can... Uh, get a taste for what they're going to see. Uh, Paolo is extraordinarily talented. Um, so um, his painted stuff is, is hard to come by. And uh, today you guys are going to get a chance to, um, to buy uh, one of those pieces. So we're also going to be uh, doing uh, three auctions during the show as well. Uh, there's a uh, painted battle damage Spider-Man that uh, Paolo has already painted. That's a larger piece that nine inches by 12 inches. He'll be painting uh, Captain America for us today um, during the show. And then uh, a real special thing, uh, he we are going to be auctioning off um, a commission opportunity. So he'll be doing that piece in about a month for the winner. Uh, but he, he hasn't done commissions in years for people. He's too booked up trying to get uh, caught up on ones he took a million years ago. Uh, so um, so this will be people's opportunity to um, win a piece of their choosing what they want Paolo to, to paint for them. Uh, so uh, some pretty exciting stuff today. Very cool, very cool, man. Um, I'm very excited to actually be here. Um, I want to say thanks to um, everyone that, especially the Comic Corp, to invited me to be on the uh, host to show uh, with Paolo and with Mark and with Angel. It's going to be a great time, guys, so don't forget to stick around after the show for the rest of the shows throughout the day. It's going to be amazing, like I mentioned. Uh, it's going to be going on all day, even tomorrow. I'm telling you, don't miss it, guys. So so what do you think, Rod? Let's, uh, let's roll through the 12 pieces of artwork so everybody can get a taste for um, what they're going to uh, hopefully take home with them today. So, Alec, if you want to... Row through the 12, so got some Wolverine painted piece. How about that? Wow. That's awesome right there, huh? Yes, sir. Oh, Lord. Venom there for everybody. Some nice slime dripping down. All right. I know uh, Tick, is, uh, Tick is a popular choice uh, for Paolo. He did that 
because he loves the tick. So, all right. What else? Oh, yeah. Very cool. Spider Ham from Spider Verse. All right. Mary Jane. Wow. I bet Edwin would love that. Yes. Oh, man. all right. Yep, so this one has some detail background, well, a background and more detail than the other ones. Uh, Joker, Spider-Ham, and coming up, a Michael Batten, uh, Michael Keaton Batman, there we go, uh, will be uh, $275. All the other 4 by 6s are $200. Oh, check this out. Like some Jean Grey there, Angel? That's pretty nice. Now, Paolo worked on Hellboy, um, um, a couple miniseries, so there you go. Nice Hellboy there. All right, Harley. There you go. First Batman, Catwoman. Michelle Pfeiffer. Yeah. There's the Michael Keaton. It's a beautiful piece. And then this piece is a larger piece. It's a nine by 12 battle damage Spider-Man uh, that we will be auctioning uh, uh, auctioning later in the panel. So I think uh, we might be ready to have Paolo join us here. Here we go. All right, the main guests, people, you guys, uh, the person you want to see Hopefully, we'll be joining us shortly. Let me, let me introduce the guy. He does not need no introduction, but our guest, he's going to be coming on the show in a few seconds. Man, the guy does amazing artwork, like Mark said. And, man, he's done art on several things, especially Daredevil, one of my favorites. Even Spider-Man, we just seen it right there. He's actually done collaborations with Mark Wade. He is the man from Daytona, Florida, Paulo Rivera, which is waiting on Paulo now. Yeah. I seen I seen some of the stuff he did for Daredevil, and I know you're excited to talk to him about Daredevil. So I know there's gonna be some questions <laughs> regarding Daredevil. So I'm really hoping um, when the time comes, we get a little bit of that insight regarding Daredevil. Yeah, I'm just curious. I just want to know, you know. When he first started to do it, his thoughts on it, you know, how excited was he? Like, I get excited when I see his stuff now and, you know, my books. And uh, and when I found out he's into Beardo, I just get pumped up, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> but I'm so happy to uh, just be here to hang out. Yeah. Hey, Mark, some, some, of the, some of the guys in the chat are asking to see the pieces again. Some of the pieces, especially I see people asking for the Mary Jane piece. They want to see that, and they want to see the Gene uh, Gray piece too. So I don't know if you can show those again while we wait for Paulo. Sure. So we're rolling through the pieces, but we are not uh, making them available for sale right now. We'll do that here in a minute after we talk with Paulo. Uh, but yeah, um, Alec, uh, roll through them again for people. And backstage, Mark, we were talking, and how long you how long you know Paolo for now? Well, I think he came out of Rhode Island School of Design in 2003, and I met him, I think, the summer after that at, um, um, it was Wizard World Philadelphia, oh. I believe. Um, so um, that was probably just a few months after he graduated. So, yeah, it's been uh, 17 years now. So he... Uh, so uh, we have worked with each other for a long time and you know he was super talented coming out of uh RISD um and he's just gotten even better uh as you guys I'm sure are aware. Yeah. So uh I'm hearing from Paolo looks like he's having some uh camera trouble but he'll be joining us uh, shortly. So he uh, started out uh with um uh, Joe um, Quesada brought him in from uh, RISD to paint. Um, oh, here we go. We got his camera feed now. That's the Captain America uh, that he's penciled out that he'll be painting. 
Can you guys hear me? Uh, okay, sure. now we can hear you. Yep. All right. Rod? Hey, Paulo, how you doing, sir? Well, I heard him a second ago, but don't yeah. hear him now. Um, we're getting there, though. Um, so he came out to paint a series of one shots uh, called Mythos. Uh, so um, it was all the main characters. I don't know if you guys have checked them out or not, but uh, Mythos, <laughs> X-Men, Fantastic um... Four. Take your time, Paolo. We're here, bro. Hi, guys. Yep. Hey, Paolo. Pretty good. All right. Well, it looks like your feed might be frozen, but we can see Cap's face just fine. Oh, and we lost him. All right. So you'll have to excuse our technical difficulties, uh, people, but uh, we're getting there. Uh, but so he did um, fully painted pieces. They were 16 inches by 24 inches on masonite in oils. Um, so um, uh, pretty crazy. All the interior pages were painted this way. The covers were painted this way. Um, and so he did oh, Ghost Rider, Fantastic Four, X-Men, um, Spider-Man. Uh, and then so that... That was a several year project for him. Um, and then uh, eventually he switched from painting everything to pencil and inking. And um, his father, Joe Rivera, um, lives in Miami and he was a painter of painting vehicles, um, you know, painting, um, you know, spray, um, what do you call it? Um, uh, you know, painting on people's cars and motorcycles and that kind of thing. So um, Paulo saw an opportunity because penciling and inking takes uh, a while. And he saw an opportunity to teach his dad how to ink because he's already an artist. And so um, several, several years ago, his dad started inking his work. So Paulo will pencil it and then his dad will ink it. Um, so it's... Uh, you know, it's a family kind of thing now, which is awesome for both of them, you know. Uh, but yeah, he he doesn't get to paint like he used to um, uh, as much. But uh, obviously, today's pieces, he's stopping down and painting uh, some stuff for people. So oh, airbrushing. Thanks, Eric. My brain wasn't working there. <laughs> Do you have like a specific art piece that he's done that that's like stands out the most in, in your eyes when you see his stuff like yeah that's the one i like the most Paolo. um it's hard to say so yeah bad. i mean he's done some fantastic stuff um uh i don't have it handy but there's a piece on my website right now uh splashpageart.com under his gallery uh that i think it's an avengers cover um but it has uh, Captain America, Scarlet Witch, underwater, uh, with a giant octopus attacking, and the details of the waves and all the other characters and stuff are amazing. Um, some of the pieces he did for the Marvel movies, uh, he did. Um, he was asked to do a cast poster, so uh, an image that was printed as a poster that given away to cast members only um, for several of the. Um, several of the Marvel movies. And so some of those are like fantastic. His likenesses are incredible. Like to get a likeness right is very difficult. And so uh, I know he put a, a ton of work into making sure he got it right. Um, but um, yeah, those are fantastic. I don't know if you guys have, have checked them out. Okay. He, he has a, a piece that I, I, I bought just maybe about a year ago from Ghost Rider, I think is issue one, the variant for that. When I when I when the guys told me that I was gonna talk to him, that was another book that I said I, I had to ask, you know, because um there's a there's a very big difference um when, when artists draw um males and females, some artists prefer to go one way or another. And I think what he did was very, very cool with that cover. Um very I don't know, she looks very very happy, very young. Um, enjoying her life, how you know portraying uh, her superhero. So it's it's a really cool cover. 
Well, let's uh, let's take another shot. Uh, supposedly, Paolo is uh, in the background. So, Alec, if you want to bring Paolo on, if you see him, if not, so not seeing him. But why don't we do this? Um, why don't we throw up a piece of artwork for uh, somebody to bid on or to take? So first person who says take once this piece, this image appears, wins it. Uh, you'll just email me, mark at splashpageart.com afterwards, um, and we'll work out the details. So Wolverine, who wants a Wolverine? $200. First person to say take it gets it. Uh, so looking at comments, let's see if anybody wants it. I'm sure somebody will. And these are these are one of one, right, Mark? Yeah, these are original hand painted. Uh, so he pencils them out and then does the ink line work around it and uh, watercolor um, painting. So, um, so yeah, they're one of a kind. All right, so it looks like James Griffin is our winner with "I'll Take It." Um, so wow. congratulations, James. Good for you, man. Yeah, um, congratulations. Just sir. drop me drop me an email. Um, you other take it, uh, maybe next time. Uh, so, uh, James, uh, good for you. Uh, so, Lord, so, yeah, man. all right, great. Alec, you can take that Wolverine down, great. How much they're going for again, Mark? So, so that piece was uh, $200. It's uh, four inches by six inches, um, a hand-painted piece. So, um so yeah, uh, there are a few pieces that would be more than 200. The Spider-Ham, the Michael Keaton Batman, and uh, the animated Joker piece. Those are 275. Okay. Um, so. We're just waiting, guys. We're waiting on Paulo Rivera. He'll be on the show. He's having some tech issues, but um, you know, things happen. We move forward and we're hanging out with Mark from Splash Page Art, and um, he just sold one of the piece that um, Paolo did, and hanging out with Angel right here, uh, my friend, um, so. And a reminder you all, uh, don't forget, um, this event is benefiting um, Hero Initiative, so if you guys uh, go to the main page of mainframecomiccon.com and donate, um, it'll send some love to them. Uh, obviously, their mission is to help out uh, creators in the industry. Um, and now obviously we're all experiencing, um, tough times. So, uh, they're able to help people who really need it right now. So, um, so go to the main page of mainframe and, and donate to hero initiative y'all. Yeah. It's a great thing that comic corp is doing right it's now. It's pretty, pretty cool, man. Pretty cool. Well, it looks like Paolo is trying to make it back in again, but not seeing his feed. Um, so hopefully we'll get these technical difficulties worked out shortly so you can see the person that you really want to see. Um, We're looking forward to seeing the Can you the guys nice hear me? Part one. Yes, sir. Okay, now we can hear you. Can't see your video feed, but we can hear your voice. So that's a start. Okay. Um, I wonder why. Why can't? I have no oh. idea why it's not working. Are you using a phone or computer? I mean, it, it says uh, everyone can see and hear you. I'm using. Uh, a, at the. I'm using a phone. At the bottom of your screen, you know, there's a cam slash mic button. Uh, you could click on that and see if um, your camera um, default is your phone cho choice uh, to make sure it's connected. I, I don't know what other choice it would be. I see your skull right now, um, and that just disappeared. But uh, we, can, uh, we can start by talking to you uh, and... If we can get your feed, video feed going, great. Yeah. We, your skull is uh, um, coming in yeah. and, and disappearing. Uh, that... <laughs> Can 
Can you still hear us? I think he's trying that, to that that is in fact power? that is that is my real skull. It's a CT scan of uh no, that's oh, cool. yeah. my skull. <laughs> At least me from Yeah, I, I can hear you guys. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we can hear you. So, um, Rod, if you want to talk with Paolo for a minute yeah. and we can proceed without uh, video. I can um, hear you guys. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me. We can there hear might, you. We there might be you. a delay on the audio, too. So, Paolo, man, I just got to ask you right off the bat, man. So, how you got into all this drawing stuff, man? And then uh, I want to talk about a little little story with you and someone in college and how and how was that experience okay hope you're still there buddy i'm i'm sorry you guys are cutting cutting in and out uh i don't know if it's my internet or what Might be an internet issue. Yeah. We can hear you at the moment. Yeah, I'm. I can see you guys, uh, and I can every once in a while hear you. It's probably your internet feed, brother. Yeah, sorry about this. I I have no idea what's going on. We'll run down the first question. I just I was asking okay. how you got into the whole comic book drawing stuff. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Maybe repeat that. I don't know if you got that. Uh, Paulo, you still there, bud? Yeah, I'm. I'm I'm here, uh, but you guys, uh, it's just super choppy. Okay. Can you try that question again, Ron? All right, Paulo. Once again, man, we just I'm here wondering how you got into the business of drawing comics, and then there's a little story of, of, with you in college, and I just want to question what was that experience like with someone. Oh, no, this okay. Uh, well, I, I, I got the job of, I, I got the job before I had graduated. I, uh, I met Jim Kruger while I was still in high school. So that was before I even started college. And, uh, I met him and Alex Ross at a convention in Orlando. And, uh, I kept in contact with Jim over the years and he actually hired me to do some work on his personal properties like uh, foot soldiers. And uh, then my junior year of college, he actually brought me into the Marvel offices and using all of the work that I had done for him as my portfolio, I showed a bunch of editors uh, all of my work. And, uh, and then I got Joe Casada's contact uh, email and he got back to me the next day and basically said I was hired. So um, my first job was uh, Iron Man number 63 cover and uh, I got my first check from Marvel. My parents brought it to me while I was working at the Olive Garden. So <laughs> I haven't worked there since. <laughs> that I did not know. I did not know the Olive Garden part, but I knew the rest of that story. That's funny. <laughs> did you yeah, immediately just, quit the Olive Garden one of my, that day? One of my favorite sketches is, um, I, I, <laughs> I did not immediately quit, uh, but it was pretty, pretty close to it. <laughs> That's, you, you'll notice I kept working until I got that first check. I guess that check was very good. But uh, some of my first, uh, it was uh, it, like, you know, my parents, they took a picture of me. Uh, you know, they, they actually came and uh, sat at my table and uh, gave it to me as, as my tip at the end of the meal. <laughs> that must have been a surprise. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad I don't work there anymore. <laughs> uh, well, I knew the check was coming. 
<laughs> we, we all had our fingers crossed, but uh, I thought Marvel was good for it. <laughs> oh, that's cool. But uh, yeah, so some of my earliest sketches uh, for Marvel were on the back of uh, Olive Garden order tickets. I, I think I still have one. So, you know, nice. my, uh, my 15 minute break, I would sketch on the back of a order ticket. That's great. That's awesome. <laughs> Hey Mark, how about um, one, of, one, one of those uh, buy it now, sell it things? One of the art pieces? Yeah, uh, let's uh, throw up another. So far, we sold a Wolverine piece, um, Paolo. So let's roll uh, the next piece for you guys. Here we go. All right, that Venom is awesome. Someone's going to be clicking, okay. take it, take it, take it. Let's see what we got. Venom is extremely hot right now. So you want this piece. It's a, it's a one of a kind. So there it goes. That sold quick. Cool. All right. So Ronald Hillman, looks like you are the winner. Um, so just drop me an email. Oh, thank you. And congratulations. Hey, Paulo, how long did it take you to do that venom? Do you remember? Uh, most of the heads, uh, the four by six heads, take anywhere from an hour to two hours. Uh, the fully, the fully painted ones can take like three or more, uh, but I only did one fully painted one, which was, uh, Batman, but the venom, I think took about an hour. Venom's pretty quick. Uh, the ones that take the longest are, are uh, <laughs> the, the redheads. So Carnage. Mary Jane, uh, oh. Jean Grey took a while. Okay. Anybody that's got a, <laughs> anybody who's got a lot of hair. Okay. That's right up my alley. You know? Oh, and the uh, Catwoman uh, stitches took a long time. I guess you're a big fan of painting a kingpin then, huh? <laughs> hey, I could do a... Hey, <laughs> <laughs> guys. All right. Yo, hey, I'm, I'm going gonna, gonna to try and sign in uh, oh. on a... I'm gonna try and sign in from my iMac. Okay. Take your time, man. Take your time. So. Once again, man, thank you everyone in the chat. Thank you everyone for hanging out on Mainframe Comic Con. And there he is, the man himself. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry guys, I, I yeah. think it's... It, Can you hear your daughter in the background? Can you hear me? We, yes, we sir. Can see you. I heard him. Everybody likes your Batman shirt. <laughs> Can you, can you hear us, Paolo? All right, so. All right, can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah. there we go, yay. Mike, um, the, the person that bought the Wolverine piece is asking if there's any chance that piece can be dedicated. So uh, Paolo still has the art in his possession, so I am sure he would be cool with um, personalizing it. Uh, so uh, Paolo, you hearing that? I'll, I will make sure Paolo knows to uh, sign it to James. Uh, so we'll get you taken care of, uh, James. Just uh, email me like I mentioned earlier, and we'll get that um, taken care of. We can see you, Paolo. You hearing us, Paolo? Mark, we have a question yeah. on the commission spot. Okay. Um, uh, I think I've got. It. All right. Can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, so sorry about that. I, I guess it's just my phone. Uh, it's not an internet thing. 
Gotcha. So uh, to answer the commission spot thing, it'll be a little later in the panel. Obviously, we're 30 minutes in and running behind because of technical difficulties. So uh, we'll probably be doing that pretty quick. Um, but uh, um, Paolo, I guess if you, you're going to show us that capital or. All right, there you go. Can you all check that out? Captain America laid out in pencil so far. Um, be, since uh, we. Since we're working with a shorter time frame, uh, we're probably going to roll through the uh, I'll take it pieces uh, um, quickly. So why don't we roll another one now um, for I take it with. Oh, all right. Tick. I know that's uh, uh, one of Paolo's favorite characters. So let's see uh, who is into the tick. Um, first, I'll take it gets it. I'll take it. Well, <laughs> you already have it. But I know. Paying, I, I, paying yourself two hundred dollars seems like a bad idea. That's how I'm getting through the pandemic. I uh, want to say thanks, Paulo, for hanging out with us, man. Really do appreciate your time, even though we had tech issues, but you're here right now, um, guys, man. Thank you, everyone in the chat, for hanging out with us. Mark, too, and uh, Angel. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Don't forget, man. Donate Hero Initiative. They go to Main Street, Mainstream Comic Con dot com. You can donate right there. Mainframe Comic Con. There it is. Thank you for correcting me. No problem. All right. Well, I'm not sure if we're having a lag or people aren't feeling the tick, but we don't have. I'm not seeing any. I'll take it yet, but uh, maybe we'll have one here in a sec. Who doesn't love the tick? Oh, okay. So now we have Spider Ham. I know there's a bunch of people interested in this because I was getting emails way ahead of time once uh, it hit your Instagram feed. So, um, so we got Jam six five three four on uh, Spider Ham uh, gets. Uh, so Jam six five three four. Make sure that was the Spider Ham you wanted. If you don't want the Spider Ham, let me know. That was Tick. So Jam6534, you are the winner. Spider Ham. Congratulations. We will roll the tick again later. Um, I don't know if we were having lag or y'all are being finicky. Nobody, nobody wants the got. tick. It's just uh, me. <laughs> I doubt that. I doubt that. So what you got going on right there, Paulo? Let people know. Uh, this is what I should have been doing from the beginning. <laughs> it's, uh, cap, uh, you know, already penciled and I'm just, I'm just inking it in. And then at the end I will, uh, color it in in watercolor and I'm, I'm inking it in the most awkward position ever. Hey, Pablo, sure so if, if I know this is going to be a, a kind of like a huge question because you've done so much stuff um, for different people. If you had to choose a character that you love doing all the time or that you, you think it's the best, I don't know, it comes out the best when you work on that character, what would it be or who would it be? Uh, I, I think the, the character that I do best is probably – Probably Spidey, uh, just because I, I, I just like the way he moves, um, and I I like I, you know I love his costume. Like I, I know people complain about the webbings, but uh, I I never really it never bothered me. Um, although I do really like the the black and white costume. That's that one's a lot of fun. I've never gotten a chance to draw it in a well, no, no, I did draw it in a comic once but it wasn't for the whole issue. They were all flashback things. Okay. Uh, but yeah, I'd, I'd say Spidey. Uh, I mean, I've gotten to draw most of the Marvel characters. I'll tell you who I can't draw. Thor. I can't Thor? Draw Thor. You I don't can't. like him? No, I, I, I like him. I just care. <laughs> I can't draw him. Like, I, uh, what, I, what I always want to do is I just want to copy Olivier Coipel, but I feel bad when I do that. <laughs> Oh, I, I feel like I'm stuck. One of these days, I'm just going to go all in. I'm just going to do an Olivier Coipel uh, Thor story. 
Uh, although I like uh, the new one with uh, Nick Klein's Thor. I like that as well. Maybe I'll copy him too. But yeah, when I like draw my own Thor, I can't like every time I do it, uh, I'm not a fan. Uh, can, well, you the, my, uh, can you hear my son upstairs? Yeah, someone's having a bad day. And a uh, bad night. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, your, uh, your movie Thor, um, obviously um that like this you do a great job with you know M movie store i can do because like i'm just i'm just copying like i can copy you know anything it doesn't matter but if i'm like gonna create something like when i draw spidey i can draw from my head and when i'm done i feel like it's mine you know it doesn't look like anybody else's spidey and when i draw thor it's just uh, i don't like it when i'm finished some of the some of the guys in the chat are asking paulo um what are you working on right now regarding comics? Are you doing something specifically? Uh, most of the time I'm wiping butts for as long as the <laughs> schools are closed. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, when, when the pandemic hit, this is day 154 for us. We, uh, I, I canceled all my uh, freelance except for like one thing for Sideshow. So I've got one project going. I can't show it, but it's going to be awesome when it's done. Um, but everything else I just, I canceled, uh, and I'm just doing commissions and it's commissions from 2008. So wow. back when Obama was still president, oh, wow. <laughs> if right, you so. can remember that. <laughs> hey, uh, let's roll another piece out yep. for sale. Um, so, uh, we can get, okay. Uh, yeah. Mary Jane. All right. Somebody's going to want that for sure. Um, let's see who the winner is. Of the Mary Jane. All right, looks like Lou. Let's see, that went fast. Ryan, wait, it's scrolling fast. What do we got here? Um, Ryan Walters looks like the first on my screen. Oh, um, I, I know that name. So, so Ryan, congratulations. You got MJ. I'm jealous. Thanks, Ryan. I need so I had somebody ask a minute ago about the commission spot. Uh, yes, we'll be auctioning that off shortly um, here in the uh, in the panel. Uh, it's going to be auction, not straight price, because there are a ton of people that have been trying to get a commission from Paolo for years. Trust me, I've got the emails to prove it. <laughs> um, but uh, Paolo, like you said, um, um, is still fulfilling requests from a long time ago. Uh, so yeah. he, he isn't taking commissions these days. This is a special opportunity. So we felt like to give everyone a fair shot, we're gonna auction it off. Um, and that will be something he's going to do in about a month period of time. So you'll win it today, you'll know about it, and then he will um, do it in about a month when the schedule opens up. Um, and so, the winner will email me. I'll have their information. They can tell us um, what character they want. Obviously not Thor, but uh, <laughs> right. it, it can right. be Thor. It just, just um, put it like I know. Olivier Coipel Thor, or I could do a Walt Simonson Thor, but I can't do a Rivera Thor. <laughs> um, but yes, we'll be auctioning that uh, shortly. Uh, let's uh, let's keep rolling with the uh, pieces. So yes. let's throw yes. up another piece. Uh, so, all right. Yeah. I'm an old school TMNT fan, but I'm embarrassed oh, yeah. to say I always get confused on the colors. Which one is this? Is this Don? No, that's Leo. Blue? That's Leo. What? Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm horrible. Excuse me? You are I no know, longer my art rep. Hey, Mark, they, they were, Mark, they were in black and white when I was reading TMNT. <laughs> yeah. So uh -huh. It's kind of hard to figure out which one's which. Just saying. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark, what so, weapon does he have? <laughs> Uh, katana. Yeah. So who's that, Mister? I read him in black and white. Uh, hold on, brother. I'm trying to see who won that. You can bust my balls later. All right. Um, Yo, Paul. To see... I, I gotta ask you, Paul and uh, Mark. He's looking to see yeah. who, who's taking it. You. Know, I'm a big Daredevil fan. Everyone knows that in the community. Man, how was it like just drawing some Daredevil? Oh, it was awesome. Uh, I mean, that that was one. 
it was just kind of what everything aligned with, uh, you know, the creative team, the editor, like just everything fell into place. And uh, it, it was just, a, you know, and then that's also when I brought my dad in to start inking me. So it, it was just, it was a great time. Uh, 2011, like I, I, uh, I was actually, I was on Spidey at the time. Steve Wacker pulled me off Spidey and said, I've got something for you. And at first I wasn't sure. And he's like, I'm taking you off Spidey. And I was like, uh, cause you know, Spidey's one of my favorites. I'm like, are you sure you want to do this? And he's like, I'm sure. Cause he had lined it all up. And, uh, I went to Florida to stay with my parents for a month, trained my dad to ink <laughs> and then left him home <laughs> and went back and, uh, and just hit the ground running. Uh, and that's also the fastest I've ever drawn anything. I was, I was going on and off with Marcos Martin. So I, I was getting a, an issue done about every seven weeks, which for me is super fast. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not fast for the industry, but, uh, for me, that, that was my, probably my most productive ever. Uh, and you know, all the stories were great. Uh, Mark Wade just, you know, I, I wasn't sure where. I didn't really want it to go very dark and and that's kind of what sold me on it was that Steve said, you know, the darkness is still there, but it's going to be hidden under a smile. <laughs> so I was like, oh, that's perfect. So I got to draw a kind of a happy go lucky daredevil uh, with all this kind of, you know, rage and whatnot simmering just underneath. So it was, uh, I don't know, it was just the whole experience was great. And then I left. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I'd stayed like a little bit longer, maybe uh, teamed up with Chris Domi for a little bit longer, but uh, still, it was, it was a great experience all the way around. Hey, so um, we're going to spread the love a little bit, um, and the second person here, Eric Winger, is going to be the winner, uh, Jam6354, or 6534, you already got the spider ham, so we're going to throw some love down to Eric, it looks like you are the winner on Leo. Um, we've got a question for you, Paolo. Um, how did you like doing Exo Man of War for Valiant? The character study on Splash Page is great. Oh, thanks. Uh, yeah, that was for when they were going to have me redesign his look back in, I think, 2016. Uh, they ultimately didn't end up using it, but that's the kind of stuff that I wish I had gotten more of a chance to do because I, I love doing character studies and I love you know, coming up with new designs for old characters. Uh, I just, it's just not something that's come up very much because usually when I, I come on to a, a new series, I just kind of default to the, the classic style. Um, so this was a nice, I don't know, with, with XO, it, he, he's a character where by design, his suit can do anything. So it's just really a, a freeing type of uh, project where there are really no constraints. It's like, you want to have like a glowing orb floating next to him, tied to him through some umbilical cord. Sure. Go for it. Like it just doesn't matter. And so I could try anything. And I, I did a, a bunch of like one inch little studies at, at the bottom, just, just to see what my brain could come up with, or, you know, looking at the historical record, uh, you know, he's a Teutonic uh, warrior. So I just looked at a lot of that, you know, old stuff and just tried to bring in some of that with a little bit of the modern and, um, and then ultimately, ultimately it didn't get used, but, uh, it was a, it was a great process. I did get to draw him in a story, uh, for the Valiant and that was fun, but he wasn't like a main character. He was just like one of the heavy guns that would come in, blow stuff up and, uh, fly off. <laughs> but yeah, he was a lot of fun. Uh, hey, I, yeah, I didn't so... go ahead. Go ahead, Paolo. Keep on. Oh, I, I just was just saying, uh, I didn't read a ton of Valiant comics when I was growing up, but I was familiar with all the, the characters through Wizard Magazine. And that, that's the case for a lot of, uh, a lot of comic stuff because that's, Wizard was something I got every month, no matter what. So I knew who everybody was, who all the creators were and characters, that kind of stuff. So we had some confusion about the Leo piece. People were answering who um, they thought um, it was. Um, and so uh, we're going to throw Leo back up there um, to get a clarification. Let's see who wants Leo. First person to say, I'll take it now, uh, gets it. So let's try that again. 
I think you confuse people, Mark. <laughs> I know. Uh, obviously, with the shorter time period, we're having to smush the uh, I'll take it's closer together. So uh, I wasn't sure what the I, I'll take it's from the MJ versus the Leo. So um, uh, I got gotcha. So, uh, all right. I'm waiting for an I'll take it on Leo. Oh, guys, I wanted to follow up the questions um, when you were talking about Thor, um, the movie design or Chris Hemworth. Uh, Mark was telling us earlier that you had a chance to do some posters and everything else. Did you get to meet the crew and the cast? <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, no, I never got to meet anybody. Everything is just done uh, just virtually. I get a lot of emails. I do get to sign into their like ultra secret uh reference stash that's kind of like the best part for me because i you know usually when you're a comic book artist you're working alone i mean you get a script or something but everything else is up to you like everything if it were a movie like you wouldn't be the screenwriter but you'd literally be everyone else and with this uh you know i basically had the whole marvel production art team behind me where you know all of their designs all of the photo shoots with the actors uh, and then someone who was gathering all that reference for me. So they actually created a package, especially with the last two posters, uh, the Avengers Infinity War and Endgame. Uh, it was the most amount of reference I've ever gotten in my entire life and probably ever will get because it was 30 plus characters uh, on, just, that was just on the right. And then on the left, you had all the villains. And so, you know, the, the amount of uh, just reference that I had for that was, I'll probably never have that again. But the the best part was I didn't have to collect it. They just sent it to mm -hmm. me. And so, those were it, those were exclusives to the cast, right? That didn't come out to the public? Yeah, yeah, it was exclusive to the cast. Uh, so the first one I did of those was Captain America. I can actually show you guys uh, some of them. Yeah, that's, that's what I was going to. <laughs> uh, let's see. I think, so the first one I did was in 2011. Um, and they're done for the casting crew. Uh, I got the job because I had emailed Casada when I knew there was going to be a Captain America movie. And I told him that they needed to have illustrated posters, uh, just to do, you know, service to the movies and, and just the books and everything that went into them. And uh, he forwarded that to Kevin Feige. And Kevin actually got back to us and said, I, I can't have you do the, the main poster, but I wanted to do a gift for the cast and crew. And so ultimately it, it, it allowed me to do, uh, basically have more freedom than I would have if I had, you know, had to do it for you know, the actual marketing department. So, you know, this first one, was, uh, let's see, yeah, so they're 16 by 24. This one I did completely, like the original looks exactly like this. I hand lettered everything and it took forever. Um, actually, not everything. I did not do the uh, the bottom credit block, yeah. but every, everything else, all this stuff, all that. And uh, this is a pretty faithful print of what the original looks like. Um, but you know, if if I had gotten the job to do the poster for that was out in theaters, I don't think they would have let me paint him punching Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very iconic picture, though. That's that's <laughs> one of the the things that everybody talks about when they're talking about Captain America and the movies and everything else. That epic punch. So that's something yeah, yeah, that I mean, was that's, awesomely captured. Exactly. I mean, that's the first thing I think of, and you know, and the the fact that they were able to kind of do it in the movie with a wink and a nod was perfect. Like this. when I saw that, I knew they were really looking at the source material. Uh, so then I did, uh, well, this is the third one. This is Captain America Civil War. Uh, this one took a while because we ended up, I, I wanted to show everybody's like actual face and then show them in action. So this was kind of the solution we came up with. Um, uh, this one's painted all digitally, uh, as was 
as were the uh, the other two Avengers posters. So I, I did three traditionally, which was Captain America, the uh, Winter Soldier one, which is this one. This one was done all traditionally. And then the last one was uh, Iron Man 3, which is kind of like the odd one out. Um, they they wanted it to look like a, a paperback novel. That is some um, beautiful stuff there you got there, Paulo. Some oh, of the guys you. in the chat are asking if there's any possibility they can get their hands on those. Uh, so, Mark, I don't know if you want to answer that or is any uh, way I, that I, Paulo wants to I, answer that. Yeah, I, I can answer it. The, the short answer is no. Uh, <laughs> what, so uh, I ended up getting some extra copies of uh, the first three. And uh, I don't think I'm allowed to sell them. But what I've, what I've been doing is I've been uh, putting them up for a charity auction. So I've already put out three of them in the past. Um, and, you know, put them up for uh, various charities. I will probably do another one this year because everybody needs money this year. <laughs> uh, so the, I haven't done, oh, I did, I did the, uh, the reason I don't have the Avengers covers is because I auctioned those off earlier this year to support the, uh, now I can't even remember that. It was the independent booksellers. Um, but they usually go for about a grand because they're so limited. Uh, I have a copy of each except for Avengers. So if I do put them up, uh, which will be sometime this year, uh, I'll put it out on uh, social media. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. We'll um, have, maybe we'll very, have Alec. Oh, there, Paulo, I have to say, but we're going to have to get to the artwork now. Let's sell some more pieces, man. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah. So, uh, so why don't we do this? Um, why don't we take the battle damage Spider-Man? This is a nine by 12. Um, now was this ink and watercolor? The yep. battle damage. Yep. So this is a larger, like a full commission size. This is an auction. Okay. So, um, his pieces in this range normally sell in this 700 plus range. We'll start this off at $400. Uh, the first person is say 400 starts the bidding. So, uh, and if we don't have people interested here, don't worry. I'm going to sell this on the website. We'll be able to sell any of these items on the we website that don't get um, sold here in the panel. But uh, first person to say 400 starts the bidding. Um, we're not going to start less than that because I know we can sell it oh, easily oh. for twice that. So Gene, uh, okay. Eric, 400. Gene, if you want it. Okay. David is 450. So um so we're going to, uh, so David, 450. Do you want to, do you want to run All some right. time on that, Mark? Specific amount yeah, of time? Uh, yeah, uh, we'll give it, uh, let's see, it is 1255. Let's say uh, we got a minute, uh, 1256. We're going to call it time. Uh, Gene Long for 550. Eric, you got it, 600. Yes. So uh, getting some love on this, you should. It's uh, obviously a character that Paolo um, loves to do and also uh, very famous for. So uh, Eric, uh, 600, maybe going once, we'll see. Um, anybody else want some battle damage? Spider-Man, 600. Uh, how long does it normally take you to do a nine by 12 like that, Paolo? Uh, Spidey is one of the faster ones, so maybe three hours. Gotcha. Awesome. All right, Eric, you're at 700 right now. Gene and Eric are going at it. Good deal. And we're almost up on time. So let's say, uh, say going once at 700 to Eric. Going twice to Eric at 700. All right, last chance. Here we go. Looks like Eric, you are the winner at 700. Congratulations! That's awesome. Thanks, Eric. Uh, so, uh, so just drop me an email, Eric, uh, on that, and let's go straight into. I'll take it. Let's throw up another image. See if uh, this one gets some love. Uh, so, next character is 
All right. So this one is 275. Awesome animated Joker piece. Uh, first to say, I'll take it on the Joker. Okay, Lou Valente, you are the winner. Congrats. That's awesome. That's awesome. Great piece. Thanks, Lou. So good deal. So once again, drop me an email. Um, so um, time-wise, it looks like you're not going to be able to finish that cap, um, but, um, but we will maybe do what we did last time here in a minute and auction off the Captain America here in a sec, knowing that it's going to be um, like the Battle Damage Spider-Man uh, ink and watercolor. Uh, so, hell, let's let's jump right into it. Let's say, um, uh, let's start again with 400 on Captain America, see if uh, people want to start the auction. So first person to say 400 starts the auction. There you go. Let's see what it looks like. Awesome. So we're uh, in the what midway stage. What what takes yeah. longer for you? Laying it out than watercolor, or watercolor? Uh, watercolor is usually pretty quick. So I, I'd say, well, it's a, it's about in thirds. The penciling usually takes slightly longer, and then inking is fairly quick, and then inking takes about as long as as coloring. So if this gotcha. if this takes three hours, uh, you know, penciling would take about one and a half. Gotcha. All right, so we are at 500 right now. Uh, Kit Walker is at 500 on that. So um, let's keep it going. We got. Uh, let's give it another minute. Um, so Kit, 500. Any anyone else want to go after Kit for that Captain America? It is going to turn out great. I know. I've seen uh, lots of. Let's see five. Let's see 550. There it is. All right. Hey, Richard. Good to see you. Um, Paolo probably knows Richard too. I'm very familiar with Richard. He's been a good customer for a while and a big fan of Paolo's stuff. So Richard, you're at 550. Oh, thanks Richard, how you doing? 580. Right. So this is not only a one of a kind piece for you guys, but this is also helping out. So everything, every single dollar helps. So yeah, guys. Yeah, yeah. All right, so uh, Ryan, uh, 600. Ryan Walters going once. Oh, Kit, 620. There you go. Jumping in. Wow. Thanks, guys. Don't forget, guys, to donate to Hero Initiative or at Mainframe Comic Con. Yep, you can do that on the main page of uh, MainframeComicCon.com. So Kit Walker going once at 620. Get a 600. All right, going twice. That's 620. All right. So it looks like Kit Walker is getting it at 620. Uh, congratulations. Oh, well, we got less. Okay. So, okay. Uh, well, we got last minute, uh, last second bidding here. So, Ryan, you're currently. 650. Oh. Okay, Kit, you're at 700. Going once, 700 oh, to Kit. Going twice. Kit Walker, you're at 700. And let's call it sold to Kit Walker at 700. So, Kit, uh, congratulations. Thanks, Kit. Had to pay a little more, but that's okay. Good deal. Um, congrats on that. Um, nice. So just email me um, and uh, all right. So let's throw up another piece. This will be, I take it. Uh, let's see what we got, Alec here. Oh yeah, I want this one, but uh, I'll let you guys. Uh, first I'll take it on uh, Phoenix and uh, Mary Jane. All right, let's see. Beautiful piece. Sold. It's all right, so who we got? Um, oh, Rich again. Uh, Rich, I love you, but uh, did we get one for you yet? No, you're bidding. Okay, Rich, you're it then. All right, Rich, you got um, Jean Grey. Just trying not to dupe people, trying to spread the love. So uh, congrats, Rich. Good for you. Thanks, Rich. Um, so um, 
think that's it, right? No, we're, no, st we're, I, we're I still we're still missing the Michelle here. Pfeiffer, right? Yeah, yeah. So let's uh, let's throw the next piece up. Let's make this happen for people. Obviously, we got some. Oh, Hellboy. Okay, who doesn't want his Hellboy? Um, so let's uh, first. I'll take it. Um, I did not see you, Jesse. Sorry, on mine. Richard was first. Ryan was second. You were third on Hellboy. So I mean on. Uh, uh, Jean Grey. So now we're doing Hellboy first to say I'll take it on Hellboy. Um, and you all, I'm looking at my screen. I don't know what your screen shows. So sorry if your screen looks different than mine, but um, uh, but I am looking back at the, back at the order and um, Richard was the first to take it on my screen um, after Ryan Walter's uh, comment. So anyhow, we are trying, we are putting Hellboy up now. So the first Hellboy person just say, I'll take it. Um, so we're having discussions about who got it, but on my books, uh, sorry guys, are the ones that count and Rich got Jean Grey. So we got a uh, Ronald Hillman on, well, I got it. take it. Ron yeah, so okay. Thanks, Ronald. Yeah, thanks. All right. Um, what do we got? We got uh, Michelle Pfeiffer. Maybe one other. Okay, we got Harley. Let's do Harley. So first on Harley. So Ron was the last one on Hellboy. So let's see Harley. This should get takers. Some yeah, everybody should. loves Harley. Yep. All right. So Brooke B, I'll take HQ. Good for you, Brooke. Got you down. Drop me an email. Uh, so Thanks, Brooke, Brooke, you got Harley. Congrats. Sorry, Jill. Not this time, it looks like. So uh, all right, let's uh let's roll the next piece up. There you go, there it Catwoman. Is. So Catwoman, first person to say, I'll take it. So Edgar. All right. So Jill, I know you wanted that, but I'm afraid Edgar got you this time. Edgar. Thanks, Edgar. You are the Catwoman. So is that everything, Alec, or do we have any more uh, that we have not covered? Oh, okay. Michael Keaton, Batman. So here we go. Um, Ooh, I just, that's the last one I finished. So this is $275. Uh, if you want the Michael Keaton, Batman, let's see. I'll take it. Okay. Um, let's look at those lips. <laughs> <laughs> so Stephanie, you need to clarify for me if that was, I'll take it on Batman. If so, you got it. But I uh, wasn't sure. Oh, let's see. Oh, actually, sorry, my screen just people are jumping. Okay, so maybe. I think Richard. Yeah. I think I have, yeah. I have Richard and then Ryan. Okay, so I am trying to spread the wealth, though, y'all. And Richard and Ryan both already have one. Um, so um, let's say Stephanie is the winner. So, awesome. Stephanie, congratulations. Thanks, Stephanie. Stephanie got the Batman. All right. Um, so, I think if everybody is ready, um, we will do the the full auction um, for the, uh, the commission spot. Um, why don't we start it off uh, 500 because um, uh, this should easily go above um, the other ones. Uh, this is a unique experience. So, um, so 500, first person to say 500 starts the auction. Yeah. All right. We whoever, got John. Whoever you want me to paint uh, any character and it can even be uh, movie characters if you want. Usually oh, I, right. I do uh, extra for movies. 
Yeah, awesome. Yeah, normally Paolo charges extra for movie likenesses, so he's throwing that in right now. Uh, looks like 800. Um, David Wasserman was the first 800, so Ron, if you want it, you better go above. Okay, 900. I'm looking at uh, Peter Rowe at 900. Uh, Eric, no, it's not full body. It's a bust, but um, um, 9 by 12 as opposed to the smaller um, sixes. So it's a 9 That's by what 12. what it looks like right now. <laughs> <laughs> so it will be like Battle Damage Spider-Man or Captain America, except you get to choose whatever character. Um, well, and, and it's fully painted. Okay, so this one will be fully painted, which means I'll, I'll acrylic an gouache. So um, we are at 1,000 right now. Michael Ferrer, if I'm not killing your name, Michael. It's, it's something like this. It's a little smaller. This is a print on 11 by 17. So it's smaller than this, but this is to show uh, the level you know, what of quality. Fully, fully, fully painted looks like. 1,200. Awesome. So Michael, you're at 1,200. We got you there. Um, so yeah, these, this is a super rare experience. Like, uh, Paulo said, he hasn't taken commissions for years. That's awesome. Uh, so he'll, he'll do a likeness. Uh, if you're wanting a likeness right now, David, yep. you're at 1250. And if it's Chris Evans, I'll pay you. <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's not true. All right, Michael, you're at 1300. Is, is that your favorite Avenger from the MCU? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Usually, I mean, I wore my Batman shirt today, but that's only because my cap shirt is dirty. I also, I have two cap shirts. I'm about to buy a third. <sighs> nice. They don't just give you free Captain America shirts from Marvel anymore. I you, guess you that you're not Marvel, for Mark, merchandising. You, I know. Are you familiar that's, with that company? Yes, I'm being <laughs> facetious. <laughs> All right, so um, they did. They did give me a daredevil leather jacket when I first started. I'll I'll give them that, but I think that was more a present from Casada than Marvel corporate. Gotcha. All I'll right, so it. it looks like going once. Uh, Michael Ferrer at thirteen hundred. Do you still have that daredevil jacket, Paolo? And does it fit? It never fit. Uh, <laughs> <they> get, <laughs> They gave you like a teenage I think it, girl I think it size. Meant <laughs> it was meant to be a gift, but it, it didn't fit. You were supposed to give it back to Gasala. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, Michael, you, Michael Fair at fourteen hundred. I bet you you could probably sell that jacket if you still have it. By the way, that's probably worth. Yeah. Some, let's let's some auction money. it off right now. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to see a picture of it, brother. All right, Michael at 1400 going once. Uh, going twice. twice, Michael Ferrer at 1400. All right, last chance, people. Here we go. About to drop the hammer. Boom. Michael Ferrer, congratulations. Uh, Thank you so much. 1400. Go get and, uh, what, and they want you to gonna, go get the jacket. I, I want to know what what's he gonna ask for. I'm dying. Hey, Michael, what uh, what character? Why don't you chime in? Do you know what character you want Paolo to do? You're not necessarily committed to that right now, but he's interested uh, yeah, in he, knowing what you got, Michael. Gotta have a lot of hair. <laughs> beast, um, beast from the X Men. <laughs> What you got, Michael? Do you know what character would you like Paolo to do? I'm just curious. And congrats, by the way. Yeah, maybe he's got stage fright. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thor from Ragnarok. <laughs> that I can do. I can do Thor Ragnarok. All right, good deal. Well, congrats, uh, Michael. Uh, that is awesome. So just drop me an email and we'll get that arranged. That's going to be at least a month, right, Paolo? Yep. Yep. All, All right. right. Thank Good you, deal. Michael. Awesome. So I think that brings the show to an end. I think we hit that yeah. hour, a little over hour mark. We had some tech issues, but we pushed forward. Uh, I want to say 
Um, it's a complete honor to hang out with you, Mr. Rivera. Thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, Mark, thanks, man, for being on the show, too. So a lot of pieces. It was epic. And I yeah. want to see that finished artwork Michael's going to get when he, he gets that. Just, uh, we also want to remind the, the people in the chat, the pieces that didn't sell, those will be online, right, Mark? Yeah, um, I don't have them up on splashpageart.com uh, yet, but um, probably on Monday I will load those. Um, I think we tick, and there was maybe one other piece that did not sell. Nobody wants to tick. Oh, Leo, um, Leo, and I, I know I own a comic book shop in addition to the art business. So I got a guy in my store. I'm sure we'll buy that if, okay. um, so it might not even hit the website. We'll see. It, um, if he doesn't buy it, then uh, we'll put it on the website. Um, but yeah, the tick and Leo, um, Michael Ferrer is saying Leo for some reason now, but uh, unless he, Oh, he wants it. Oh, he now, now we have some. Now we have some love for uh, Leo. Um, looks like. Uh, oh, Lou. I mean, okay, Lou. first person is Lou Valente. So, Lou, um, you've got the uh, you got the Leo. Uh, so good, awesome. good deal. Um, so the only one we have left is the tick. Any last love for the tick before we close this off? <laughs> and uh, for those mentioning, um, my email is mark at splashpageart.com. Um, I don't have access to comments, it looks like, but uh, maybe um, somebody can type that out for me. Um, Alec or uh, one of my uh, – there you go. Thanks, uh, Appreciate that. Awesome. So there you go. Um, uh, Ryan, we can definitely sell it for 200 on the website. Thank you for your interest, but, uh, but uh, we'll get some love there. Uh, trust me. Um, so, uh, well, bummer that we uh, ate some time with tech issues, Paolo, but I was awesome yeah. hanging Sorry out. Sorry about with that you. guys. I'm going to get a new phone. I'm going to, I'm going to use the money that you guys just gave me and I'm going to buy me a new phone. <laughs> so thank Sounds you like for supporting point. me. Hey, Angel, Rod, nice to meet you guys. Thanks a bunch mm -hmm. uh, for your, um, for your assistance today. I'm sure yeah, we're going to see guys. you in more panels today. Yep. Um, so, well, thanks everybody for, uh, for jumping in and checking it out. Um, Paolo, um, have fun wiping those butts and- uh, I will. And uh, hopefully we'll today. see something- I've got help today, so we're all good. Awesome, good. <laughs> all right, guys. Hopefully we'll uh, see something soon from you. All right, Paolo, Mark, Angel, Take stay on. I'll see you guys later on and make sure at 1.30, man, we're gonna have Ariel Alavetti. So stay tuned for that right here on the B hallway. So thank you guys for hanging out with us awesome. right now. Take care. Right. Thank you. Cool. Thanks so much, guys. All right. See Appreciate you guys.
Hello, everybody. Hello. Hi, Tom. Hi, Ashley. Hi, Jason. <laughs> hello, good sir, Tom. And hello to everyone that is watching us live or many years later in the post-apocalyptic future that people would watch <laughs> YouTube videos in. <laughs> uh, we are uh, Jason Inman. And Ashley Victoria Robinson. And we are joined by the lovely Mr. Tom Merritt of the Daily Tech News Show and Sword and Laser. And Ashley, why are we here? What are we talking about? Well, today we are talking about podcasting and tips from pros because Jason and I consider ourselves pros and Tom is pretty much the godfather of podcasting and Patreon. So we asked him to come and help us and help the audience talk about creating a community of geek goodness and sharing it to people all around the world. And this is a panel that we have been trying to do for a really long time. We bullied Tom into agreeing to do this at two different events and Mainframe <laughs> is finally giving us the stage to do it. So thank you to them as well for having us on. Now, really quickly, just in case anybody is watching this panel and they're like, well, what do you guys know about podcasting? Mr. Merritt, um, would you like to uh, shout out your bona fides and your expertise of where you get this expertise of podcasting? Yeah, I'm sure there's somebody named Adam that probably uh, doesn't want you to call me the godfather of podcasting, but I have been doing it for uh, a long time. Uh, I, I started podcasting at CNET in 2005, March 2005, uh, with a show called Buzz Out Loud that, that lasted for quite a long time. Uh, I went from Buzz Out Loud to doing a show called Tech News Today at the Twit Network, did that for several years, and uh, then went out on my own. Uh, and I've been doing Daily Tech News Show uh, for six years. And as you mentioned, I also do a uh, science fiction and fantasy book club podcast called Sword and Laser. I do a cord cutting podcast called Cord Killers. Uh, we're just about to relaunch Current Geek, which is all about like deep dives into geek that. topic. Oh yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> by the way. Uh, and and uh, I, I do East Meets West. I've been doing East Meets West since 2005, which is just kind of an old school. Let's just talk about anything podcast. So yeah, I've been I've been doing podcasts for. 15 years uh, in lots of different settings, lots of different formats. Uh, so I've, at the very least, I've got longevity. <laughs> yeah. I do want to say, uh, with all respect to uh, the aforementioned Adam and to yourself, we all know that Conan O'Brien invented podcasting in 2019. Right, so we're yeah. we're just yeah. here giving our best advice. That's right. He's we can, we in a long line of people who invented podcasting. Yeah, really. <laughs> Uh, and if anyone else doesn't know as well, Jason and I host the Geek History Lesson mm -hmm. podcast with the uh, amazing Mr. Jeremy Skinner has shouted out in the chat. We've been doing it for six years. We are almost at 350 episodes. And even though we look like babies next to Tom, mm -hmm. uh, we've been doing it for, for quite a while in the world of podcasting. So we wanted to chat mm -hmm. um, kind of in three different stages about what it was like to create a podcast. So... With all of our bona fides out of the way, if you're not impressed now, hold on. It's only going to get better. Be. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with, you know, the basic question that everybody out there is asking, which is how do you start a podcast? And I would love it if we could talk about how to focus your idea, because the seed of an idea is the most powerful thing. We can get to equipment. We can get to community building. All that's great. But where does the idea come from? How do we refine it? Yeah, I, well, the the interesting thing is, like you say, starting a podcast equipment wise, service wise, is easier than ever. There's so many different ways to do it. Uh, you don't have to to DIY it uh, like you did back in the day. So it really is important to focus on having something to say. Uh, and I think what was true 10, 15 years ago is still true, which is you shouldn't do a podcast just because you want to be successful at podcasting. You need to be what? passionate <laughs> about what you're going to talk about, right? But I heard there's this mad Conan O'Brien money in podcasting, Tom. <laughs> yes. If your name is Conan and O'Brien, possibly. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I, I think I think you need to you need to really have something you care about talking about, uh, and and it, that can be anything. And in fact, that's the beauty of podcasting is even if your idea seems a little niche or, or a little narrow, that could be a very successful podcast. It may not get the Conan O'Brien level <laughs> of of numbers, uh, but you don't need huge numbers to have a successful podcast. You just need people who really care about supporting what you're doing. Yeah. For us, it was interesting when we started looking at creating Geek History Lesson, um, it went through a lot of different iterations. At first, 
we come up with this idea of sort of a debate podcast um, where, you know, Ashley would pick one side of some sort of debate and I said, you know, like if so would be the idea of um, who do we think is the better lightsaber fighter? Is it Darth Vader? Is it Obi-Wan? And let's debate like the evidence to show that. And then we focused it around education because when we started in 2014, that was sort of the buildup or the lead up of like when YouTube and everything, like the learning aspect of YouTube is. And I still say that online, I think that that is still like the most powerful aspect of the online marketing machine is how can you educate someone with your expertise that they don't have? And that's led us to literally geek history lesson because I think I said that I was like, let's just call it exactly what it is. It's a geek history lesson. It makes the yeah. most sense, you know. We and I think a lot of people get stuck on the name, but we got stuck on the name for a very long time. And then we actually followed in your grand tradition of calling the show what it <laughs> <Yeah>. is. <Yep. laughs> sure, that to be very helpful. <laughs> Find a placeholder title and then stick with it for six years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah basically. <laughs> <laughs> like this is this is good enough. Um, what led you to decide to do DTNS on your own after you'd sort of been working for these larger networks for a long time? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, um, the, the short version of the story is my wife had to move to Los Angeles, uh, for a job. I did the show for the network for a year from Los Angeles, but the network was up in Northern California, uh, and they just didn't want me to do the show remote anymore. So I was kind of off on my own. I could have gone and joined another network, mm -hmm. uh, but I had done this enough that I'm like, well, I know how to make the content, right? And the tools, even six years ago, were pretty easy to be able to record and publish. And I had acquired all the equipment that I needed to do that well. So I said, why don't I just try this? Uh, mm -hmm. And my advice to a lot of people in, in all kinds of content, but in podcasting as well, is if you have an idea, just start recording it. Just start doing it. Uh, and see what people think and go from there because it, it doesn't have to be this this grand produced thing from the beginning. That Not that that's a bad way to do stuff, but if you're just getting started, you're likely not to have as many ears on you. Now, I, I was certainly going to have more people interested in what I was doing, but I had been doing that kind of thing. So I just said, well, let, let me do what I do and see if that appeals to people, even if I'm not part of a wider network. Now, Tom, I'd love to ask you, one of the questions, of course, when you're thinking about your podcast is, what's the release schedule? You mm -hmm. know, we can now, a, a lot of podcasts, bigger podcasts, but back in the day, there were a lot of monthly podcasts. Um, I think weekly is the standard, but even now, there are daily podcasts. Mm -hmm. So for the 2020 sort of landscape we're in, what would you recommend? What do you feel? I, I still feel weekly is probably your best bet. Mm, uh, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> As someone who does has done a daily show for 15 years, don't do daily. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but in all seriousness, I, I think what, what you're trying to balance is uh, your workload and return versus interest, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and not that you can't do a successful monthly podcast, but it's harder to keep people interested. You're putting out fewer episodes. So if you are down the road trying to monetize it, you have fewer episodes to monetize. Whereas weekly keeps people in the habit, keeps people coming back, keeps people interested and engaged. Uh, but it's not having so much in there that it's five times the work, uh, which you know Monday, a Monday through Friday podcast mm -hmm. can be, or it's too much inventory for you to monetize. There are some advertisers out there who don't want to monetize uh, a daily podcast because they, they feel like it's too much uh, and 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 they 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 want to shine on a weekly uh, spotlight and patrons sometimes feel the same way. Uh, mm -hmm. Daily Tech News Show is a Patreon that you back monthly because asking people to back per episode would just be too much when you have that many episodes. We yeah. do the same thing for Geek History Lesson and that is I I think for us it's an ongoing debate and I'm sure for you it's an ongoing debate as well. Like do you change that? How is the audience going to respond? And also, uh, we come to Tom for a lot of Patreon advice. So, <laughs> yeah, it's well, it's also the idea too, where we live in a world now where there's just so much content. There's more content than you could ever put out there. And I remember um, we used to be part of the Audio Boom Network, and they're one of the bigger podcast networks out there. They do a lot of like blank check and whatever. And um, I remember they once told us they were like, "Do not do." more than a weekly podcast because we find through our analytics across every one of our shows 
that having the second show doesn't help you at all. Really, it doesn't help you in terms of subscribers or downloads or more listens. Like you're just literally splitting the weekly listens across two episodes. Yeah, so. and 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 it, it, you know, if folks listening or watching are like, well, then why is this daily guy on here telling us to do it <laughs> the weekly? Uh, it's it, you know, there are formats like news, right? And the yeah. reason we do daily uh, is because it's news, and we know that people are gonna you know want to have the latest version. And so being able to put something out daily. So there may be reasons to do it daily and monthly may have your content may dictate it, but mm -hmm. by and large, I think most stuff and most of the podcasts I do outside of daily tech news show are weekly. I think you've hit on something really interesting though. And you've, you've mentioned it on a couple of the points. It, the question that you have to know, especially when you're coming right out the gate is what is the goal of your podcast? You know, and, and you talked about like, oh, advertising and like we look, we'll keep joking about Conan O'Brien because it's just an easy shot to take. <laughs> Everyone is subscribed to it. We get it. Right. Um, Serial's all relieved now that all the uh, energy <laughs> is focused towards Conan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but a, a lot of people start podcasts because they just want an excuse to chat with their friends every week, yes. which is a totally admirable thing to do, a completely wonderful reason to start a show. But that is very different than if you're trying to create a platform or if you're trying to create this as a stepping stone to something else. And I think they are all very valuable goals. I think the only reason, and I'm going to echo what Tom said earlier, to not start a podcast is to get rich quick because it just won't happen. Because yeah. neither will happen, rich yeah. or quick. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a great question in the chat here from uh, Rishi B, who said, hey, Rishi what, B. Uh, what about seasonal? Um, which I think is a very important question here mm -hmm. because that has become the thing. A lot of podcasts like Serial, we mentioned before, have picked up this thing uh, where they only put out 10 episodes once a year, 10 episodes, sometimes three times a year. It's been a while since we've had a, a season of Serial. Um, for me personally, and I'd love to hear your thought, both your thoughts on this. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of think that you can only do seasonal if you've got the name or the brand power to back it up, to keep people interested in your feed. Because I'm one of those people that when I'm done with a podcast or it is seasonal, I delete it out of my RSS uh, app, uh -huh. whatever, whatever app I use. I don't park it in there. So when I hear like if you release a new episode a year later, I'm like, oh, crap. And I got to re-download it and do this. I'm not one of the, I don't sit on a person's feed waiting for that next season to come. Tom, what do you feel about a seasonal podcast? Yeah, I've, I've just started doing some seasonal podcasts. I think workflow wise, they're great because again, yeah. uh, you know, not having to meet that weekly grind means that you can focus more. I think they're very good for storytelling podcasts, mm. for, uh, you know, uh, documentary style podcasts, yeah. uh, a single topic podcasts. So I just did one called Know a Little More that's seasonal because each episode is a single topic and it gives me time to produce it. Current Geek Chronicles is going to be seasonal because we put a lot of effort into producing them. So it, they, again, it goes back to what kind of content are you doing and what does your audience expect? Because the way you keep someone like Jason from deleting that feed <laughs> is to get them in the mindset of, oh, this isn't going to be gone for a long time. This yep. wasn't the season's over and I never know when it's coming back. You want to get people in the habit of knowing like, oh, it's only going to be a month break while we create a whole new season of episodes. And, and so I, I'm not going to delete it because I know it's coming back. I, mm -hmm. I, I think that's an important point that I hadn't really thought of till you mentioned that. Like you really need to message. I mean, I'm honestly like I'm if I if I if you if, if, perfect, like a lot of podcasts current ones out there don't do what you just said if if i had those podcasts if they they ended their last episode and they're like this is our season finale we will be back in three months i'd leave it in my feed but most of them end even big professional ones like with a lot of money and a lot of brand power behind let's just them. say it's cereal <laughs> uh, yeah when is cereal coming back <laughs> there you go conan we're focused on cereal now coming back um and i but i think that's a, the important thing about like setting a schedule and being very clear with yes. your audience and clear with your expectations of both yourself your workflow and then your consumer because I've done the same thing. Like uh, Serial is not, I'm not currently subscribed to it because I don't know when it's coming back. Um, but something in that same vein, there's a CBC show called Uncover and they do seasonal shows and they mm -hmm. let you know ev their shows begin every April. So every April, you know, the new show is going to begin and then it will run its course and dedicating yourself to the schedule that you've set, whether you're a crazy person who's doing a daily show or you're a lazy person and you're doing a weekly show, um, that will help you retain your audience. And I think for people who might be watching who've had their podcast for maybe like a year or a year and a half and are looking to level up, 
that's when you can do sort of these macrocosmic things like community management mm -hmm. or uh, managing your audience, which is also something that Jason and I really look to Tom for is how you involve your audience and how you maintain them in the future of your show once you figured out this is the equipment I'm going to buy. This is the schedule I'm going to set. These are the kind of topics that I'm going to cover. And I think that's a perfect way to talk about what are some tips for the first year of your podcast? Now, my mm -hmm. first tip would be, and we, we were very stringent about this on our podcast, where the first year we did it, we set a weekly schedule and we said for the first year, we can't miss a single week. I want, to, I want people to have 52 solid weeks uh, that they know every Monday our podcast will be there in their feed. And we hit it for the first month. And I think over the course of our podcast, we've been pretty good. Like we only take the most time we've ever took off from regular episodes is two weeks. And that was, and we even did a special episode where we're like, this is why we're taking two weeks off. This is where, you know, don't go away. Please don't be like me and delete the, the <laughs> podcast out of your app. Um, but we're very clear and, and we want people to be very, to uh, be dependable or, or understand our schedule. Um, I think that's very important for your first year. Tom, what do you think is an important hint or tip for the first year of your podcast? Yeah. Uh, it's, it, it's changing all the time. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to tell you what I think works. Uh, but, but you kind of have to pay it. The uh, first principle is pay attention to your community and your audience, even if it's small, uh, and listen to them because if what they're saying seems to contradict what any of us are saying, uh, you might want to pay attention to that because mm -hmm. not, not, there's not a one size fits all. But what I, what I do say, especially when you're, you're starting from a small audience is, make those audience audience members stars of your show uh get find an excuse or a way to read every email or or posting that you get and thank people for it uh it sounds kind of crazy like yeah but i can't possibly include all the people but when you're starting and you don't have that many people interacting mm -hmm. you can you absolutely can and if you find a way to include them and i say find a way because you may be like this email is kind of crappy uh but Maybe you find a way to say like, let me take one sentence out of it, or maybe just thank the person for writing in like, Hey, Pat, really appreciated getting your email. Thanks for that. Really, you know, and write them back, communicate with your audience. You have the bandwidth to make the community you do have feel especially part of your show in the early days. And, and you should take advantage of that advantage that you won't have later if your audience gets bigger. Yeah. Uh, now, another, I think, tip for your first year, and this would be something that uh, is very applicable to our panel right now, is I assume a lot of people are making podcasts that have guests. And especially when you're starting out, every guest you bring in will be hopefully bigger and more famous than what you currently are. <laughs> um, this was definitely something in our case, the first time that we sent an email to Tom. Uh, <laughs> and my biggest piece of advice, and Ashley, I would love to uh, sure. hear you chime in on this. Um, because we, you know, and I'm not trying to say we're, we're as famous as the Mr. Famous Tom Merritt here, mm -hmm. but, uh, um, you know, we've been doing a podcast for five years now. And now six, we six years, six years, excuse me. <laughs> uh, uh, yes. Don't want to throw off that last year. Uh, and now we get emails for people who are like asking us and, you know, really quickly what podcast you want to do and what podcast you don't. And it's all based on how the email is written, because and my biggest piece of advice to everybody out here is write a professional style email that doesn't make you seem like a crazy person because you would be <laughs> surprised at how many blank random emails you get. And you're just like, I think there's something wrong with this person that just emailed me. I, I don't know if I feel safe going on their podcast. Uh, do you echo that as well? I look as a female, I'm very <laughs> scared of everybody on the internet, just like blanket <laughs> statement. Um, you learn who's really nice. Like, uh, we have a couple people here in the chat that are like longtime GHL listeners yeah. who we know are like real sweeties. Hi, Josh. Um, and, and and so when you have a relationship with somebody that you've managed, like Tom said, over the course of developing your podcast, that can make it a lot easier. I love it when people start their own shows and then ask us to be on it. Like mm -hmm. that is truly like the coolest thing. And I'm like, oh, I'm like your podcast stepmom. Like that's the greatest. But we get a lot of blind solicits. And I would encourage people, if you're reaching out to someone with a bigger profile than you, you have to treat it like it's a business transaction. Yeah. Uh, 
you, it's hard when you listen to a podcast because it is very personal and you're getting a lot of information about the person you're listening to, but we're all still strangers here. And I know there is the illusion that we're all buddies and there is a level of familiarity, but if we've never met in person, it's just like you're reaching out to somebody if it was a newspaper interview. I, I would love to throw out a quick tip that I do to this day when I'm emailing people that I'm nervous about contacting or people that I really admire and respect. Um, everyone out there, I would highly recommend Googling how do you write a professional email that someone will read. I still do it to this day because I think that they might, they change like, oh, they're like, now we're finding that people open this type of email and this type of email. And if I'm reaching out to somebody that I've never emailed before, somebody who I really respect or admire or I'm a fan of, I will pick up those tips and I will make sure that my email has those or is professional or whatever tips they recommend. And it's a very easy resource to make your email better to where the person might actually respond. I wanna just add two things above all else. One, um, make sure that there's something in the email so that uh, I believe or anyone believes that you know who they are. We've all <laughs> yeah. been working on projects, especially crowdfunding projects where you're, you've got your list of 50 people you wanna hit and you really wanna, and you're just copy pasting, make sure you change the name or the opening or, or whatever it is that you're tweaking. Uh, because I can't tell you how many oh. Dear Veronica emails I've gotten. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. Um, or here's here's a little secret. I'm the one who manages the Geek History Lesson email. Mm -hmm. uh, and most people just go, thanks, Jason. Yeah. <laughs> when I write back and it's like, you got to sort of read the, the one, room The other one bit. you get a lot is a lot of people will be like, Dear Victoria. And we're like, who's Victoria? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and then the, the other thing that I think is very important, especially if you are inviting someone to come on your show, uh, give them possible dates and give them possible times. It is your show. You are producing it. Mm -hmm. It's okay to say we tend to record on Thursdays around 6 p.m. Pacific time, but we can be flexible. That's great. Mm -hmm. But just saying any time, you're putting a lot of pressure on your guest to become a producer of your show that they don't have any stake in. And then that will discourage people from interacting with you and reaching back out to you. And if you want to play in that person's, you know, kiddie pool, mm -hmm. you have to make it as easy as possible. Yeah. And, and, and telling them how long you'll need them yeah. for is going yeah. to help too, because if, if you only need them for an hour or less, uh, they may be more likely to say, oh yeah, I can do that. Whereas if you don't say how long they're going to assume it's kind of an open-ended thing and like, oh, do I want to spend a lot of time? Yeah. 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 It's very easy. I think, especially, um, for, you know, very successful people to ignore an email than to write a reply back. And so you want to always make sure that the email you send is very easy to reply to. Um, and I think that would uh, is the biggest advantage of getting a response back. Yeah. Uh, I also think that once you've started the show, it's important that you make sure that there are things that you are willing to change to make the show fun and interesting for yourself because you and your audience are the people who are going to have to keep listening and ultimately keep producing. So something that we did when we finally started to stray away from our typical lesson formats, we started doing lists and that was like really fun and really interesting and a lot less work. So it balanced out our relationship with the research on the show. And now we do movie retrospectives, but every thing that we've changed, we've changed with the consent of our audience and as something that keeps us interested. And I also think that's something that you do really well, Tom, of bringing in like new segments or new ideas so that you're like, yeah, you've been listening to the show forever, but it's still fun and it's still evolving. Well, I, I would love to throw that towards you because I know, again, you are in this upswell of upgrading Current Geek, which is a very long running podcast. And what, what led you guys to be like, okay, we want to change this now and why? Yeah, that's, uh, it was Scott Johnson, my co-host on that show's idea. But what was funny is I had been thinking along the same lines because mm -hmm. what we were coming across was there was a lot of work that went into preparing Current Geek and there was a devoted following that enjoyed what we were doing, but it didn't feel to us like it was delivering what we were capable of. And I think both of us wanted a challenge that would take us off the grind of having to, in my case, you know, research and, and post uh, and write up uh, five stories for us to talk about, having to bring in all these different segment ideas and to say like, well, what if we went off live? So the first thing we did actually was we stopped doing the show live, which we had been doing forever. Uh, and that took a little bit of the pressure off. But then the second thing was, was Scott's idea of like, what if we just pre-produced it? What if we we went 
the same topics that we cover, but we spent more time on them and we only did one per episode. Uh, and that led to us, you know, looking at all these documentary shows out there that are successful, like the radio labs of mm -hmm. the world and saying, okay, well, what, what would our take on that format be? And suddenly we were, we were creating this thing uh, on our own with help. Like we were like, okay, well, we're going to need a writer researcher. We're going to need a producer. And we put that all together. It's actually the opposite of the way I do daily tech news show. Daily tech yeah. news show is done collaboratively with the audience from as formally as taking surveys to just more informally in our discord chat, uh, finding out what people like. And we, we sort of, you know, swerve and, and add segments and remove segments and change formats dynamically over time, which on a daily show I think is essential, right? Because it can get, you know, in a rut if you don't do that. So it's that constant line of communication. With Current Geek, we decided, okay, we know this might be a little scary to the audience, but we're going to over communicate. We're going to tell people like, this is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. We think it's going to be better. We've built up a lot of trust. We hope we can cash in on that trust. Uh, let us take a flyer on this. And they backed it on Kickstarter. Uh, they love the first episode. And in a couple of weeks, we'll find out if they like the rest of the season. I hope they do. Yeah. As to, uh, D, uh, uh, I was gonna say DTNS, uh, which also, but as to current geek listeners, that's very, very exciting for us <laughs> too. I also would love if we could chat really quickly about it um, because you've brought up Veronica and you've brought up Scott, my space dad from the Red Shirt Diaries. But <laughs> Tom, you work with a plethora of co-hosts in addition to doing a lot of producing on your own. Jason so who do you I, dislike the yeah, most? who's the biggest no. <laughs> jerk? Uh, we, Obviously we all know Veronica. We all know it's yeah. Scott. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure, throw the woman under the bus. <laughs> um, but I would love if we could chat just really briefly about like working with a co-host or working with a collaborator on a show. And Especially for you, because a lot of your collaborators um, are don't in, live with you. They're in different. <laughs> they're in different states. Yeah, uh, I think only now, only my producer Roger uh, is in the same county as me. He's not even in the same city. Uh, and my co-host Sarah on, on Daily Tech News Show uh, lives up in, in Northern California. She just moved. Uh, my co-host Veronica on Sword and Laser, who I, I threw under the bus because she's the nicest person. Yeah, I know. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, she, she lives up in the Bay Area. Uh, a lot of my my contributors and, and co-hosts live elsewhere. Scott Johnson's out in Utah. Uh, and, and the reason I like having collaborators is because it divides the work, first of all. You don't feel all the pressure on yourself. And it brings in other perspectives. It allows you to see some things that you don't get otherwise. And, and you can bounce off each other. And I think that makes for, uh, for better content when you, it's not just your single perspective all the time. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to ask you another question, Tom. You've been around this podcasting game, if we can call it a podcasting game, for uh, uh, longer than most. Not as long as Conan as Brian, as we know. Um, <laughs> but... What is a tip you would give out for how do you keep growing your show slash audience? How do you keep that number going up instead of down? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, Cause I'm always, <laughs> I always feel like I've plateaued, even though Tom, I, we it, want the magic key. Please, <laughs> yes. We're asking personally, like, actually we don't, we don't know if anybody's ever going to listen to this ever again. Like we actually, Tom, we need, we desperately need help. There's so no. many different <laughs> levers to pull and they're, and, and they're always changing, right? Uh, you know, getting reviews on iTunes uh, for the longest time and still is, is a, is a way to maybe get more visibility in the iTunes store, but it's kind of a black box. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know if it works the same way as it used to. Uh, one tried and true method, I think, is to get people on your show, uh, get get guests on your show so that their listeners are likely to come and say like, oh, I, I, I like that Jason Inman. What, what's that show that mm -hmm. he's on, you know, uh, and go check that out. Um, I, I, I think guesting on other shows and, and putting yourself out there as someone who's like, hey, you know what? I've got an idea. It fits into your content. Would you like me to have be a guest? Again, all that stuff about being businesslike and respectful and yeah. understanding the show applies. Uh, but a lot of shows will appreciate that if you're like, if you're adding contribution to their show and then it exposes you to a whole new audience as well. Uh, th the rest of it is just, you know, hopefully hitting on the nerve of the people who like the kind of content that you're doing. Yeah. All right. Let's ask the question that I know everybody thinks about because everyone's trying to get rich quick. When in a podcast life, is it good to start thinking about sponsorship and monetization and is Patreon the way to go as a blanket statement across the board? Yeah, sure. It's it. 
I, I tend to say it's never really too early to think about it, uh, but I wouldn't focus on it. You want to focus on your content. I, yeah. I'm a true believer in, you know, if you do very good content, the rest becomes a lot easier. Uh, so I, I tend to spend most of my time on content. Monetization is not really something you're going to concern yourself until you get to, you know, a few thousand listeners where you can actually make any money off, off of advertising or even Patreon. Uh, the nice thing about a Patreon is it also is a community builder. So I would probably look to bring a Patreon into your show earlier as just a way to manage a community and make a membership and make a little club. Uh, there are other versions of Patreon out there, mm -hmm. but for me, I, I haven't found any that give me the things that Patreon does. There's a lot of- I agree with uh, that. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of complaints of like, ah, but Patreon takes all this money. I'm like, yeah, but they also give you something for that They're, doing it. They're providing a service. I can't wait yeah. for when Tom moves over to OnlyFans. It's going to be incredible. Wow. Okay. <laughs> uh, only Mike. Tomorrow. It's, it's, I, I like, the, yeah. it's the private uh, podcaster uh, section here. Um, you know, it's funny, Tom, I love that you hit on the idea of like, spearheading that community because for geek history lesson we have found a lot of success in polls on our patreon mm -hmm. because again usually the people that sign up for your patreon are the super fans of whatever you do they're the ones that are willing to be like i am paying for this because i like you so much and it's interesting because when we put up ideas up there um we've been proven wrong a couple of times and i'm glad to have been proven wrong where we're like oh they're all going to go for option a and they all vote for option c and you're like oh i would have never considered that so i'm glad that i was able to literally ask our audience that question and that is a valuable tool that patreon is given it i guess yeah you, know? you, you have to be careful because it's not scientific but certainly when you get an overwhelming response yeah. like that it's yeah. worth paying attention to uh an early example with daily tech news shows we had a calendar segment where we talked about tech conferences and earnings reports and things coming up and what was interesting is we asked people uh to be rate the different sex the different segments and there were segments that had a lot of people that hated them and a lot of people that loved them the calendar segment had neither people didn't care if it was gone. They're ambivalent. <laughs> they yeah. like, you got to get rid of it. And we're like, that's a segment that definitely needs to go because no one is going to notice if it's gone. Uh, and it's not going to anger anyone if it's yeah. gone because it's it's apparently something that's just inert, right? You know, so we got rid of it. Nice. Um, so there's another question that I'd love to, as we wrap up this panel here, what do you think, Tom, are the advantages slash disadvantages of joining a larger podcast network because you know we have Earwolf, um, Headgum, uh, Frog Pants. Yeah, is I would consider in that Headgum. Yeah, sure. um, fun. Yeah, there's all kinds of these, um, and now even Spotify has become mm -hmm. one of these things where Spotify is trying to wrap up a bunch of podcasts. Um, now, for anybody starting their podcast, I would not worry about Spotify till you're way down the road, or you have a celebrity like say Conan O'Brien on your podcast. Um, <laughs> but never what, heard of it. <laughs> yeah, who is this guy? Um, some <laughs> new podcaster. Uh, anyways, um, w Tom, what do you think are the advantages of joining a larger network? Or let me ask you this, because you are sort of in this space as well. Is there an advantage to starting your own network? <laughs> Yeah, I would say don't start your own network unless you feel like all you can do is start your own network, right? Like that that is a business. That is a whole mm -hmm. separate thing. And if you're like, "Oh no, I want to do that. It sounds fun. I'm in a position. Great." Uh, I don't think starting a network from scratch is the way to go. On the other hand, uh joining a network is something that you want to consider carefully, but has a lot of advantages. And I want to point out there's networks and there's platforms. I think joining a platform good call. <laughs> is a really good idea early on. There's Anchor, there's Acast. Sometimes the networks and the platforms overlap, like with mm -hmm. Anchor, which is owned by Spotify. Uh, platforms just give you tools and it's a lot easier to pull yourself out of there mm -hmm. uh, if, if you need to. So platforms, I think, are a great idea uh, to try out, especially when you're starting, because they make so many things easier. Networks, on the other hand, are going to take a lot of your choice away. Uh, and sometimes they take your rights away. So you have to be careful about that. Yes. You know, you, you you may be signing over, be, be read things carefully. You may be signing over the intellectual property rights of your content, uh, which you may be comfortable doing, but, you know, go into that w eyes wide open. I, I would want to own my content. Uh, as part of a network uh, at yes, this point. Yes, so yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
and, and but it's tempting to be like, well, I'm just getting started anyway. You know, this is going to get me a, a wider audience. Uh, I think networks, sometimes people think, oh, if I join a network, suddenly uh, the, the money will come pouring in. And that's not true. You still have to have listeners. You still have to be popular. Uh, you still have to have the ad sales. Uh, if you don't have ad sales, even on a highly listened podcast, you're not going to be making money and the network's not going to find your show as valuable. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of things to consider when you join a network. I would join a network if you don't like doing all the things that a network will take off your hands uh, and you aren't worried about creating a business for yourself out of the podcast itself. You want to just have, you want the kind of the halfway point between being employed by a, a big publisher, uh, at, but being a DIYer and doing it all yourself. Mm -hmm. Nice. Well, uh, I would love to um, start with Miss Ashley mm. Victoria Robinson here. Um, and I would love for each of us to give for podcasters out there, out now, what do we think is the most important tip to remember? for making a podcast. And actually I'm putting you under the gun. Ooh. Do you have one or do you do you need more time? So counseling? the uh the <laughs> the hairy fairy answer to that is have fun because the minute you yeah. stop having fun and enjoying the show and it becomes work, it's just like every other job. And it's not to say that those moments won't come because they definitely do. Uh but make sure that you are speaking about something that you are passionate about. It would be foolish for me to do a podcast about video games because I'm a very casual gamer. Mm. I'm very passionate about comics, so it makes more sense for me to talk about comics on Geek History Lesson. Uh, and then the other thing that I'm going to say to you is do not underestimate audio quality. You do not have to be audiophile level good, uh, but a couple simple investments and purchases that you, you can find all these lists. You can find them from Jason and I, you can find them from Tom, you can find them from a cursory Google search. Um, investing in some basic equipment and not just recording it into your phone will take you a long, long way. Those are like my my basics, my basics. Uh, my biggest tip I would give, and this is a little tip that I see a lot of brand new podcasters do even to this day, is I would highly recommend, and this leans into your fun. Yeah. I would highly recommend that the only editing you do on your podcast is for like inserting music bits or taking up things you flub. But if you are editing your podcast for every um or uh or weird pause, you are going to be spending six hours on every episode and it's going to drive you mad. I had a friend who had a comic book podcast three or four years ago. And he started right about the same time we started Geek History Lesson. The podcast no longer exists. And it's because they would record an episode and then he would go back and he would edit every single um or awkward pause or anything. And it would, yeah, it would take him like five or six hours. And But that's how human beings speak. It is, it is. And <laughs> I think even if you listen to somebody big like Joe Rogan or people like that, they do not edit out the ums and uhs. And I actually think that makes the podcast seem more real, makes it seem more human. Now, again, if you flub up a name or you curse and you don't want curse words, that is totally fine editing. But otherwise, I think you should just let the conversation be. Um, and save yourself a lot of editing time, especially yeah. if you're not. And I say this as a person who started as a film editor in, 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 in L.A. Uh, save yourself that insanity. Um, Tom, what would what what big tip would you recommend? Yeah, uh, you know, playing off that, I, I would say uh, if you go live, it focuses you quite a bit. Uh, yeah. so, uh, you know, that, uh, that that's not for everyone, but I'll just throw that out there uh, alongside uh, your recommendation there, Jason. But uh, along with the fun and keeping it fun, I would say also Karen know about your topic. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, the, the, the maxim in, in writing is write what you know. And I, I think you could say podcast what you know. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to be an expert. It doesn't mean you have to know everything, but uh, along with having fun and being passionate, uh, you also should should be experienced in the thing that you're talking about, right? Uh, if you are a big fan of jets, uh, but you've never flown one, don't do a podcast about flying a jet. <laughs> do do a podcast about liking jets, right? Like fo focus your content on on what it is you have to say, uh, because you're going to have people 
correcting you. Sometimes they aren't correct. Yeah. Uh, and, and it feels better when you're like, no, no, I do, I do know what I, what I'm talking about. This comes from a place, uh, of authenticity. Like you were saying, Ashley, you know, you don't want to do a video game podcast because you know, not so much with the video game. Same for well, me. Maybe Tom, we might know. No, Look, if it's a Tetris <laughs> podcast, I'm all over. It. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she, you would murder that podcast. <laughs> Animal Crossing. Sure. I'm in. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, Right before we sign off, I would love to end off uh, inspired by Jeremy Skinner's comment and question. In the chat there. Yeah. Um, if we could all mention a podcast that we are not on that is currently airing that we think is a great example of the stuff that we have ta uh, been talking about, you know, for the last few minutes. Yeah, that is and, an example uh, of a great podcast. Jason, can I throw you under the bus to go? First? Oh, this is very easy for me. <laughs> um, this is a podcast I discovered about a year ago, and I think I got you on to it. Mm -hmm. um, there's a podcast called The Newsworthy. Um, it comes out daily every weekday, and it's hosted by Erica Mandy. It's a 10-minute podcast where she just takes you through all of the pop, not pop culture, but all the news events that have happened um, in the day. It's, it's, it, the sound quality is great. Um, it's very clear. Um, she is a person that worked in news before she left news to make this podcast. And, and she says it all in her title. title. She says, um, this is all the news you need to know, uh, fast fun and friendly. And I think that that is exactly what that podcast is. And I, I would highly recommend if you, if anybody out there is looking for a quick and easy uh, news podcast, uh, I would recommend the newsworthy with Erica Mandy. There you go. Um, I'm going to recommend because I love murder podcasts. I'm going to recommend true crime garage, uh, which is a podcast where they do a case or they do it over a series of episodes. So each week you get between one and three episodes, depending on the length of the case. But it is very highly edited and they do fancy soundboard things like Ooh. inserting police calls and inserting <laughs> news reports. And so it is very much toward like the uh, more prof professional, more polished end of the podcast spectrum, but they never veer off the focus too hard. And I really admire the amount of research they do because I feel like we do a ton of research for Geek History Lesson mm -hmm. that takes up a lot of time. And then when they go through a series, I'm like, dang, they do it so much better than I. So I always look at them as like a research-based show of what we should be striving toward. Tom? <laughs> Uh, okay, so I'm gonna make a lot of my friends mad here, but I'm I'm going to disallow anyone who's ever been on Daily Tech News Show. Yeah. Otherwise, <laughs> I'd be you know continue. I'd just be <laughs> reeling off uh, thirty. So I'm gonna I'm gonna say Reading Glasses with Mallory Mallory O'Mara and Bria Grant. Uh, it is a weekly discussion of the joy of reading. Uh, it's not genre focused, uh, but they do both tend to like, uh, Mallory likes horror and Bria does like sci-fi, uh, but they talk about all kinds of books. They bring authors on to talk about both reading and writing. They're very pro library. Uh, so lots of tips on on how to get eBooks and audiobooks through your local library and all of that. Uh, so check that one out. It's called Reading Glasses. That's awesome. All right, and I think that is it for this panel on podcasting. I want to thank everybody who watched. I want to thank Ashley. I want to thank Mr. Tom Merritt. And Mr. Tom Merritt, please let everybody out there watching now or watching in the far future where they can find you online. And please tell them about your podcast as well. And yeah, sure. And your books, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, well, TomMerritt.com, two R's, two T's, uh, is the place where you can find all of my podcasts and the sci-fi that I write. Uh, that's that's all collected right there. Uh, as you mentioned, Daily Tech News Show, if you want to just 30 minutes a day, keep up on technology news, there's that. If you're like, 30 minutes is too much, we have one called Daily Tech Headlines that's only five minutes, so you, now you have no excuses. Uh, <laughs> and uh, if you want to kind of have a sampling of everything I talk about with some, some special write-ups of articles, links to my writing Patreon, where I do excerpts, uh, freetomnewsletter.com uh, gets you everything in your inbox once a week. Nice. Ashley, please let everybody know where they can find you on social media. Oh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Ashley V. Robinson. The V is very important. I don't want to fight the WNBA player for SEO, please. Uh, you can find Geek History Lesson at geekhistorylesson.com or where all fine podcasts are had. I'm also on the Major Spoilers podcast and I am doing the Mission Log uh, podcast reviews for Lower Deck. So if you're a Trek person, find me there. Jason and I have a comic coming out in October called Jupiter Jet and the Forgotten Radio that we're going to talk about right after this. So just stick around uh, and please pre-order that book from your local comic book shop. 
Yeah. Jason, where can they find you on there? Well, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Jawin. That's J-A-W-I-I-N. It's the first two letters of all three of my names, Jason William Inman. And uh, Ashley is right. We have a Jupiter Jet Spotlight panel at Mainframe Comic Con right after this at uh, 1230 uh, Pacific time. So if just stay in this room and it'll pop up live and you can hear all about our great comic book um, and all those kinds of stuff. Yeah. Well, you know what? Uh, since this panel was so great, I'm just going to say blindly to everybody out there that watched us. Thank you. And make sure to subscribe to all of our podcasts. Just one here. It's like 17 if you subscribe or Tom. But <laughs> they're all 17 great podcasts. Uh, this was a lot of fun. I hope you guys got some tips. Tom, thank you so much for joining us again. Oh, thanks for having me. This is a blast. This was a blast. And uh, thank you, everybody out there for watching. Uh, that is our panel. Goodbye. We're now going to awkwardly wave until it cuts out. <laughs> <laughs> but do stick around. If you guys want more Ashley and Jason, you want to hear about their comic Jupiter Jet, that's happening in like 15 minutes. So don't go anywhere. We're just giving them a chance to use a restroom and get a drink of water because they've been right. talking so much. Thank you again for Tom. You guys can check out all these guys, all their podcasts, and we will be back in just a couple of minutes. So stick around. <laughs>
And we're back as promised. Mainframe Comic Con continues on. We got so many panels, so many halls, all dropping great content, comic book, social media, you name it, it's happening. Please, if you haven't yet, donate over at the mainframecomiccon.com website for the Hero Initiative. This is all for charity. This is all free. The only reason you get to enjoy all these great creators and content is because they're donating their time. So donate a few dollars and support this great charity. Uh, we had a fantastic panel on social media just a second ago, and we're going to bring them back right now. You got Ashley and Jason here again. Hey. Hi. It's like, I haven't seen you guys in forever. It's been ages, man. You're looking great. Glad to see that you're healthy. Yep. I like what you're doing your hair. Right? <laughs> I did, you noticed. I'm so, you guys are awesome. But they're here now to talk about Jupiter Jet, their comic book. They're going to show you some artwork from it. They're going to talk about how writing this indie book has been something really special for them. So you take it away, guys, and I'll try to keep up with you with some artwork here. All right. Thank you so much, John. Uh, yes. Hello, everybody out there. Uh, I am Jason Inman. I'm Ashley Victoria Robinson. And we are the co-creators and the co-writers of Jupiter Jet and now the brand new Jupiter Jet and the Forgotten Radio, which is now hitting comic book stores on October 7th, hitting bookstores on October 20th. So uh, if, uh, you know, adventure science fiction retro girl with a jetpack in the 1930s sounds good to you, I would head over to your comic book shop and I would uh, tell them to pre-order it. Now, Ashley, uh, maybe we should give some bona fides in case everybody's like, well, you're talking about yeah. Jupiter Jet, but I still don't know what that is. Yeah, so if Kim Possible meets Men in Black is uh, not cool enough for you, Jason and I are Ringo Award nominated as a writing duo, we have co-created the Red Shirt Diaries, which is our 31 episode Star Trek parody web series. You can still find it all over the internet. Mm -hmm. Jupiter Jet, our sophomore comic science, The Elements of Dark Energy, Captain Terrific, and so much more. We contributed to DC and IDW's Love is Love. And uh, we love Jetpack Girls. Yes. Um, now, it's funny. So Jupiter Jet first came out in 2017. And that was when volume one. And back in those days, we had talked about, uh, um, you know, hopefully this will be five volumes. Mm -hmm. And now we finally, it took us three years, but we finally now have the second volume of five. Yes, we are committing to it right now of this story. And basically, um, if you want to know about Jupiter Jet, it's following the death of her father, 16-year-old Jacqueline Jackie Johnson alliterative, just like all the Stan Lee characters, inherits a jetpack with a mysterious power source, and together with her younger brother Chuck uh, and their cat, she must protect her home from a threat that may or may not be from Earth. Now, in the second volume, Jackie desperately dreams of flying towards space, but when the mysterious Black Flyer shows up, another figure with a jetpack, who is way better at flying than Jackie, um, she now understands that maybe she shouldn't fly so fast into the solar system because maybe she doesn't know everything. What? Yeah. At 17, he doesn't know um, everything. So <laughs> I'd love to talk now, Ashley, a little bit about where we came up with the idea of Jupiter Jet. How did we develop this idea? Let's just let's give everybody the full nitty gritty. And then also, everybody, stick around towards the end. We have some exclusive art reveals and a big announcement towards the end. Yeah. So Jupiter Jet. Uh, contrary to what I think a lot of people who are following the project might think was not the first thing that Jason and I ever pitched. Jason and I have a pile of rejected pitches mm -hmm. uh, from that time when we started collaborating and started co-writing and working on comics together. Jupiter Jet was just the first thing to go. And fun fact, uh, the reason that there's a three-year gap is because we did science, the elements of dark energy in the middle. And I wrote a nonfiction book. And Jason wrote Super <laughs> Soldiers in that time. And... Uh, science and Jupiter Jet were greenlit within three months of each other. Mm -hmm. uh, but we did Jupiter Jet first because we got the green light on that first. Then we did science and now we're returning to Jupiter Jet. So it's not it's not for lack of content creation. But I had had the, I, the name Jupiter Jet bouncing around in my head for a long time. And when we could still go outside, Jason and I love to do diners. And mm -hmm. so we went to a diner for lunch one day and I said to him, I have an idea for a comic, but it's just a name and it's Jupiter Jet. And I don't recommend that as a way to pitch something to your partner. But what was great about that moment was Jason was like, it's a redheaded girl with a jetpack and a cat and she's got a brother. And it just, it was like 
a strike of lightning. Yeah, like as soon as she said it, I immediately had this idea. And um, it's funny because it like sort of like pinged part of my brain because something I don't like about modern comics, and there's a lot to love in modern comic books. Of course. But I miss the days where you could hand anybody an issue of Batman or Superman or Spider-Man and everyone could read it. And by that I mean is an eight-year-old could read it, uh, your 50-year-old man who hasn't read comic books in 20 years could read it, and your grandma could read it, and everyone would get a different value, a different story from that. And nobody would feel like they were overlooked or talked about. Like the adults would be like, this is still like a pretty depth, emotionally complex story. And then the kids would just be like, Batman punched the guy. And so that was our whole goal with Jupiter Jet was like sort of this, we call it the Pixar model, mm -hmm. where it's like, we want anybody to be able to enjoy this story. We don't want parents to be afraid of handing Jupiter Jet to their kids, but also, if the parents read it, we want them to enjoy it, too. Uh, shout out to Josh, who is a lovely supporter, a longtime friend and supporter of Jupiter Jet. Thank you for shouting out the Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. Very, very kind. Josh is a great supporter, supported us on science as well. Now, let's talk a little bit about the creative team behind uh, Jupiter Jet and yeah. Jupiter Jet and the Forgotten Radio. Uh, we've kept most of the same team. Uh, for Jupiter Jet and the Forgotten Radio, we got to talk about, first off, uh, we got a good old buddy, a good old friend of ours. Uh, guy who's drawn on Spawn, a guy who's drawn on Teen Titans, a guy who's drawn on The Inhumans, a guy who's drawn on Dredge Dread, a good friend of ours, John Boy Myers, famous. He is the guy that uh, drew the cover image for Volume 1 and uh, uh, not the Western art that you are seeing on screen right now. Uh, that's something we're going to talk about later. <laughs> um, but he is um, actually the one who drew the image of um, the main cover of uh, Jupiter Jet, it's where Jackie is doing the striking too. Yeah. And uh, he's a good friend of ours. There yes, we that, go, that's John Boy's sweetheart. He's a good friend of ours, and we it's our hope to have him on all five volumes of Jupiter Jet. So far we've tricked him in for two, hopefully we can trick him in for three more. But let's talk about our main artist uh, here, yes. uh, Ben Matsuya. Ben Matsuya drew volume one, he's also drawing volume two. He's the great Western art that you saw. He was uh, Jupiter Jet fighting with the satellite that you saw. Uh, we got Ben in a really, really interesting way because uh, Ben actually drew a piece of fan art of Jason and sent it along and it looked really great. And then we said, do you have sequential samples? So uh, if you are somebody who really wants to be a comic book artist, I would highly recommend having sequential samples. And what that means is it's just a comic book page. Just show that you can tell a story because a great pinup is a great pinup, and and I love a great pinup. And we have a bunch of them in the back of the book that are some of our prints, which are so incredible. But being able to tell a story through motion, especially for a flying hero, mm -hmm. was important. So uh, we got Ben on board really early to draw those first pages that we originally used to pitch with, and he's been with us ever since. Yes, and we our colorist is Elizabeth Kramer, mm -hmm. uh, and we have great lettering from Taylor Esposito, who's worked on DC Comics, a whole bunch of stuff at Ghost Cliff Studios. Um, but let's talk about here um, how much of um, how did we focus the story for our audience, Ashley? Yeah. And where, what would we look at? What is the difference? Like, why are we, if, if somebody's out there like, well, the Jupiter Jet and the Forgotten Radio sounds interesting, but uh, you haven't convinced me yet. What would you say to this person? Uh, well, I would say the first volume was nominated for a Ringo Award, which is the comic uh, <laughs> comic audience but Ashley, award, so I, it's very popular. I don't <laughs> even know what a Ringo Award is. So <laughs> why would I, like, what does that mean to me? We, with Jupiter Jet, we wanted to write the comics mm -hmm. that we loved as young readers. Jason and I have both been reading comics for almost our entire lives. At this point, basically as long as we've been able to read. And we still, to this day, really enjoy, you mentioned that Pixar model, books and stories that transcend genre and transcend age groups because we love character. And Jackie immediately became an important character to us. Mm -hmm. And so her journey over volume one and into volume two is something that I think everyone who's ever been a teenager could relate to. And everyone has been a teenager at some point in mm -hmm. their lives. And we love a superhero origin story. And that was something that we were so passionate about telling and telling well in the first volume. And now we've had to graduate her into kind of the Nightwing phase of her life, I would say. Into the Nightwing phase of yeah, her life. Yeah, like she's leveled up from just 
her origin story, right? So now she's on to the next big thing. Uh, well, volume two is very much the story of um, you think you know how the world works, but you don't. It's mm -hmm. the idea of Jackie is now at a point in her life. She's now 17. She's a year older. And this 17 year old girl thinks she knows how the universe works. She knows she thinks she knows how to beat the Praetors, the aliens, of course, that uh, have enslaved all the humans on her home planet. But because she, she beat one, she's beaten one. So she's like, I could beat them all. They're all easy. But she's going to quickly realize that it's not that simple. Like most things in life, it's way more complicated than you could ever imagine. I would also um, say that in volume one, our Praetor is very much a villain. And in volume two, uh, the new Praetor is a lot more dynamic and a lot scarier than we saw in volume one. Now, um... It's interesting because I think we were thinking about working on a different project before Jupiter Jet and the Forgotten Radio. Um, but actually, our audience, people at conventions kept asking us, hey, when are we going to see Jupiter Jet 2? And uh, Ashley, let's talk a little bit about that. What made us finally pull the trigger? Yeah, this is something that we talked about a lot if you were here for the podcasting panel is listening to your audience. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a lot of discussion is particularly in comics and in genre about like how much does a creator owe an audience? How much ownership does the uh, uh, audience have over the thing that they're a fan of? And we were so flattered that people kept saying, when are we getting volume two? Mm -hmm. When are we going to see more of Jupiter Jet? What's going on with Chuck? Is the cat, is Puddle still going to be around? We didn't want people to stop asking because as a creator, the most flattering thing that you can get is, I loved this. I want more of it. And since it was something that we had planned in the hopper, we thought we'd had a really good run with the first volume and we didn't want to wait until people stopped asking to continue Jackie's journey. And speaking of people asking, anyone that is watching us live in the chat right now, feel free to ask us any questions. Yeah. And we will be happy to answer them at any time. Um, so let's talk about, okay, we have a story. She's a jetpack girl mm -hmm. and she's 17 mm -hmm. and she wants to fly to space. And she's already beaten her big bad in volume one, yeah. but in volume two, her, her idea is that she wants to travel out into the space, but she doesn't quite know how to do that. And one of the things that I'm very excited about in um, volume two is that we have her travel to other planets. You may not know this about me, but I am a huge Western fan. I love Wild West movies. And that's why we have Jupiter Jet travel to a Wild West panel. This is art that has never been seen anywhere else, but this is about the midpoint of the book. Um, and you got to see that Jackie Johnson, Jupiter Jet, is now wearing a cowboy hat. She's got a duster. She's got a little dungaree. And she may even ride a weird creature that's sort of like a horse, but not quite. Maybe looks a little bit like a dewback from Star Wars. And that is very intentional, folks, because that's my favorite Star Wars animal. I <laughs> love that we get to share the Western art here today because when we started with Jupiter Jet, it was such a visual in my mind. Mm -hmm. And when we came to Jupiter Jet and the Forgotten Radio, Jason said, I want her in a cowboy hat and a duster on a cover or in a splash page. This was a mental image that we really launched into her sophomore story with. And Ben did such a kick butt job rendering it. And what I love about this costume is Jupiter Jet's color scheme, if you're familiar with her, is a lot of purples and it's a lot of greens. And that's because her name was inspired by Sailor Jupiter because I love Sailor Moon and Sailor Jupiter is my favorite senshi. And you get to see her color scheme carried over into this Western atmosphere uh, in Elizabeth's colors in this art. Yes. Uh, now, um, it's interesting, too, because one of the things we should talk about is that Jupiter Jet is very much a sort of retro steampunk version. Mm -hmm. Volume one definitely was. Volume two is very much, it still has the steampunk, it still has the retro, but it's very much the style of a Western. Mm -hmm. um, many Westerns, if you go back and watch the the genre and the format, and again, I do, I, I've read so many Western books. I'm from Kansas. You've, I think it's I think it's part of the thing. I've what? You've all seen The Mandalorian, so you know what we're talking about. Yeah, <laughs> this is very much a lone hero having to face against an antagonist that she doesn't know if she's going to beat. And the reason why in Jupiter Jet and the Forgotten Radio, we know that she becomes a hero is because she steps up to the line. She comes up to the draw. Literally. There's not 
she doesn't really have a draw on this. Well, maybe she does. But uh, the final climax is not about a draw. But you get symbolically, she comes up to the draw. She's ready to pull her gun. She's ready to pull her ray gun and face up to the facts. And again, we're going to, our plan is to move Jupiter Jet in this way that each new volume will sort of touch on a different genre while keeping the sort of retro steampunk adventure of uh, the first one. Uh, we have a great question here from Jace Malam in the comments. He says, can you talk about the ending of volume one on such a cliffhanger without knowing how successful it would be or if you would do <laughs> a volume two? How much did you contemplate that versus giving a more final in all right so spoiler alert for a reveal that's two years old now <laughs> yeah it says matter. i've already said she'd go into yeah, different yeah, planets. yeah so at the end of um <laughs> volume one volume one like jason said very steampunk very like rocketeer yep. uh, aesthetics inspired in the end we learn that she is called jupiter jet because she's not on earth she's on europa which is a moon of jupiter mm -hmm. and so we really took the sci-fi elements and ran with them in volume two, even though obviously there's a lot of Westerns as well. There was never a question from the very first time I ever talked about Jupiter Jet with Jason, he pitched, I pitched that the idea. ending yeah. that we reveal that she's on she's Jupiter. On, she's on, she's, she's, she's on Europa. Europa. That she yep. would break through a mm -hmm. force field and we would see Jupiter. And it's my it's one of my all time favorite pieces of art from the whole series so far is a, a double page spread from volume one of her seeing the expanse of space for the first time. Uh, there was never a question that that was going to be the ending and we were going to end with that. And I think it's because Jason and I really like stories that are a closed loop, that they end when they were always intended to end. But we love when a doorway is left open. And I do think that that ending, it, it wraps up everything that we were doing narratively in the first volume. But it gives the hint that maybe there could be something more someday. I, I always love writing comic books on the television model where it's the idea of have an ending, but also leave something on the table for season two. Mm -hmm. And that was what that reveal was supposed to be. Um, it's funny because I don't really see it as, as a cliffhanger. Um, and it's interesting that we've seen most of the readers have seen that ending as a cliffhanger. But for me, I've always seen it as just like, this is showing you how big the world of Jupiter Jet can be. Um, this is how wide and expansive it can be. Um, and we touch on a lot of how expansive that world is mm. in volume two if you're looking for it so if you're a kickstarter backer by the way you have the full uh digital <laughs> volume two that you can look at yep. there's a lot of things in there that for volume three volume four volume five will show you just how just how crazy our little YA book is going to get. <laughs> well, because we could say, I would say this, um, volume two does not have a huge like cliffhanger ending. Um, it's a but, very personal, emotional yeah, ending this but it, time. But it does have a pretty big surprise in issue four that is pretty much like, which should make people be like, what? Like, what? where is this going? And so, yeah, it's the same thing. But I'll even say this. We already know the ending of Jupiter Jet volume five. Mm -hmm. And even that ending is still like, well, there could be more. Yeah. If you want there to be, there could be more. Um, but it does give a conclusion of an ending. I also want to say thank you to Highbrow in the chat who simply says Jupiter Jet is awesome. Thank you. That makes my heart sing. Yeah, it's really good. <laughs> um, all right. So everybody, uh, don't forget, um, we love to, any questions if you're curious about Jupiter Jet, please throw them our way. Or creating um, your own comic. Ashley, I want to yeah. ask you this question. All right. Um, because you're now my panel guest. <laughs> Jupiter Jet and the Forgotten Radio. Yes. You've written it all. Yes. You've read it all. Yes. You've seen all the final artwork. Yes. What is something that you're pretty excited for people to see in this book or you're excited that, you know, future readers could discover in this book? I am really excited for readers to see how much Jackie has grown. I know that's a very vague mm -hmm. concept, uh, but Jackie as a teenage female means a lot to me. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, fairly recently a, a young teenage girl. And I think that we really work hard to make sure that her emotional journey is true as much as her heroic journey is true to the sort of Joseph Conrad idea of a hero's journey. So I really want people to see how much Jupiter Jet has leveled up and how much Jackie has leveled up. And I will say the other theme I'm excited for is Jackie is going to get a gift at one point 
uh, that the iconography of that is very important to me, mm -hmm. even though it was your, you wrote that scene and you chose mm -hmm. what that was going to look like. I'm so excited for people to see that and to wonder about what it's going to mean. What for you are you most excited for people to see besides the the lizard? Well, the lizard, uh, just I'm just saying, I've been dreaming about getting Jupiter Jet to cowboy ride a giant lizard for two years now. So I'm so happy that people have seen it. And that's so brilliant. Uh, yeah, that's right. He's We're showing so up on cute. screen. I love him so uh, much. By the way, uh, <laughs> the lizard's name is Dewey. Yep. <laughs> and uh, that is an inside joke for only Ashley and I. But if we're ever on a mainframe Comic-Con 2.0 or 3.0 or 5.0, I hope this thing, mainframe Comic-Con, goes on for, for years. Uh, maybe we'll reveal the origin of that name. Maybe. Uh, anyways, um, so I'm excited for, we haven't talked about, and we have no pictures of, of this person That's to okay. show right now, but it's fine. Jupiter Jet's sidekick is her younger brother, Chuck, mm -hmm. who's now 11. Well, he wants to be her sidekick. He wants to be her sidekick, but she does. She thinks it's because of the events of Volume One. She thinks it's too unsafe for him to do anything. But of course, since he is an eleven-year-old boy, he's going to push forward, and he sort of develops his own superhero identity, which was also something mm. that we had as part of our original pitch. Was his name, what he was going to look like? We yep. have like OG art from Ben from twenty sixteen mm -hmm. of what what happens basically yes. in this volume. <laughs> uh, so you're gonna see, you're gonna see a lot of how Chuck, her younger brother is more involved in the Jupiter. Ju Chuck really her younger brother. There's the A story is all about Jackie and her adventures and going to the Western planet and fighting the black flyer and figuring out how space works. But the B plot is really about her brother Chuck and how he sort of grows up a little bit yeah and how he becomes he actually earns his title as her psychic which i'm very excited about because in volume one we really really wanted to get him in there as the sidekick but we didn't have room so we pushed it to volume two and a uh, fun fact about it is that uh the last page of jupiter jet and the forgotten radio slight spoilers is actually about chuck and it's an homage back to volume one yes now um we're, we're low-key building a whole team for bigger, crazier, more cosmic adventures. And if people read this volume very carefully, they can definitely see all the key players and how they're going to slot in moving forward. Now, one of the things we do want to talk about is, of course, is you can pre-order Jupiter Jet and the Forgotten Radio from your local comic book store uh, using the diamond code AUG201057. Just tell them Jupiter Jet and the Forgotten Radio. It's published by Action Lab Entertainment. They'll get it October 7th. It's also available for pre-order on Amazon and Booklist and IndieBook and Walmart, all those places. But we have a special announcement. We are going to be doing a Jupiter Jet and the Forgotten Radio pre-order giveaway. Uh, basically, you can see all the amazing prizes on screen right now. But if you cannot see them, that's they're all the exclusive art prints that you cannot get anywhere else. Uh, Nicholas Scott art, Tim Seeley art, a uh, Jupiter Jet magnet, a Jupiter Jet trading card pack, and a signed John Boy Myers print. Plus, you have the chance to get a character in volume three named after you. Now, how does this work? Ashley, do you want to go into this detail? Yeah, it's super, super easy. So all you have to do is send a receipt or a proof of order to jupiterjetcomic.com. Com, just a little screenshot, just a little photograph. You mean jupiterjetcomic at gmail.com? Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, yep. <laughs> jupiterjetcomic at gmail.com. Yes. That's what I definitely mean. Mm -hmm. Take two, send your receipt of proof of purchase to jupiterjetcomic at gmail.com. Just send it there. That's all you have to do. The first place prize is going to be the character named after you, everything that you saw in the image. The second place prize is the big yellow print an 11 by 17 ben matsuya yellow print and then third place will be another uh not 10 by 7 john boy art print uh everybody basically if you pre-order jupiter jet and you can pre-order it from anywhere your local comic anywhere. shop whatever you send us a copy of your suite or a screenshot to jupiterjetcomic at gmail.com we'll be randomly entering you into this contest now i think this is pretty awesome because I would be going a little crazy or I'd be very excited to have the chance to get a character. We will name the character exactly after you in volume three. What is that character going to be? We don't know because we're still writing volume three. Yes, we love including cameos. We love including Easter eggs like that. And because 
uh, amazing people like you and like Jace and his daughter, who was our first ever Jupiter Jack cosplayer. Mm -hmm. We love bringing you as the community that is building this comic with us into Jupiter Jet's world. So we really wanted to highlight everyone who's supporting us with volume two. And you have until September 15th, you have a whole mm -hmm. ass month to enter and you there and enter soon. And there will also be other ways to increase your number of entries into the contest. You can find out more about that at my newsletter, which mm -hmm. you can find at jasoninman.com. It's at the JAMA newsletter. We're gonna be giving you some other stuff next week about how you can enter that. But uh, all it takes is a pre-order. And if you've already pre-ordered already, you can send that along too. Yeah, That'll work. Uh, we have no, if you pre-ordered like months ago, I don't know how that's possible, but in case you're a weird time traveler and you pre-ordered months ago, you can enter this. But I think it's pretty exciting. You get all this exclusive Jupiter Jet art just for pre-ordering an awesome comic book story that you should be ordering anyway at your local comic book shop. There you uh, go. Now, Ashley, real quick, one last thing. Um, if somebody has never heard about Jupiter Jet, yeah, Jupiter Jet and the Forgotten Radio, and they're like, eh, I, I'm on the fence here. What would you say to them? What would you convince them to pre-order and check out Jupiter Jet and the Forgotten Radio in stores October 7th. I would tell them that this is Kim Possible meets The Rocketeer. This is young people actualizing the, their self-worth. This is a kick-butt female hero. And it's a really important story about the importance of family mm -hmm. coming together, set against a cosmic backdrop. You will laugh, you will cry, and this is the internet, so we put a cat in there for you. Pre-order mm -hmm. Jupiter Jet and the Forgotten Radio. Jason? Oh, <laughs> um, I would think, look, this is a comic that wears its heart on the sleeve. This is a comic book that's not about this is the cool, dark character, or this is the, the brother of XYZ that you've never heard about before. This is a simple comic book about growing up, about heart, and about jetpacks. This is a true adventure. Um, and I say that because this is the type of adventure comic and the type of adventure movie that I really would want to see. And I feel it is sort of a forgotten art now. And I, and I hope that if you like Indiana Jones, Rock Tear, you're going to really dig this comic book, man. You're yeah. really going to like this comic book. It's a lot of uh, that with sci-fi mixed in and it's perfect for all ages. Um, so don't forget you can pre-order Jupiter Jet and the Forgotten Radio comes out October 7th. Uh, I'm Jason Inman. I'm Ashley Victoria Robinson. You can find me on Twitter at Jawin, J-A-W-I-I-N, and also on Instagram at that same type. Or you can pre-order uh, or order Volume 1 of Jupiter Jet at JasonInman.com. Ashley, where can they find you? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Ashley V. Robinson. The V is very important. You can find Jupiter Jet on Twitter at Jupiter Jet Comic where we're sharing all kinds of cute updates. Yes, yeah, so you can find that on Twitter, all kinds of arts. Don't forget to or enter that contest and pre-order. We hope you enjoy this panel. And also, if you enjoyed the previous panel, uh, don't forget to check out our podcast, Geek History Lesson. You can find it everywhere you listen to podcasts. It's pretty funny. That's it, guys. Thank you so much. We have, oh, really quick, we have a comment in here. Brian Roma says, love volume one, hits all the right genre beats, like Sky Captain and the Rocketeer. That's great. And then Jay Piera, also in the comments here, said, all in for a cosmic -y cosmic western. Love you, it. You're gonna be you get get buckle up. Bring your spurs. Yeah. Is that you in panels? Bring your spurs. Sure. All right. Well, thank you guys all for watching. We hope you check out Jupiter Jet and the Forgotten Radio hitting stores October 7th. I know I keep saying it, but that's how you sell comic books, my friends. Pre-orders are important. Yes. Um, and that is in that is it for our panel. And here is the lovely John. You guys are awesome. Thank you for doing two, not one, but two back-to-back -back panels. You guys are great and definitely support indie arts and indie comic makers because you guys are where it's at. So thank you so much and thank good you, luck with your, with your new comic, man. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you for having us again, Mainframe Comic Con and everybody that watched. Yes, and for supporting Mainframe Comic Con and the Hero Initiative. So important. Definitely. So we are going to continue on with indie comics. We got more coming for you here. I want to remind you all, of course, going to mainframecomiccon.com and donating a little something for the Hero Initiative that supports the artists and writers that have given us so much uh, joy and, and so much entertainment. We've got more of them coming for you right now, including two guys that I feel like I was just hanging out with a little bit ago. The two bros comics, Justin and Nick. How you guys doing? What's Good, up, man. John. How are you, John? I feel like I saw you guys like five minutes ago. What's going on? <laughs> it you guys are everywhere. 
noticed, they're all across the mainframe Comic Con helping us out, bringing really cool independent artists and writers to to share with you their visions and their products. So I'm gonna I'm gonna get out of here and hang out backstage because you got somebody else to hang with us. That's right, yes, sir. All right, guys. So we're super excited about the next guest. Uh, this gentleman has done a lot of fantastic, fantastic books. Yep. And it seems like everything he touches turns to uh, uh, TV show gold, maybe. Yeah. So uh, without further ado, we'll bring on Zach Kaplan. Hello. Hey, guys. How, how are you doing? doing? How are you doing? Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes, sir. Okay, good. Sweet. Good. Can you hear us? Yeah. Yeah. Great, man. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. How are you guys? Doing well, doing well, man. It is nice to meet you, big fan. Nice of to work. meet you guys. Are you guys actual brothers? Yes. We are. <laughs> uh, Gordon right. this morning asked us the same question. It's quite, it's kind of funny. So yeah, yeah. Um, we are brothers. Comics are what kind of keeps us connected. So uh, the work you guys do um, means a lot to us. Yeah. Thank so, you. So perfect, Zach. So we want to jump right into it, man. Talk to you a little bit yeah. about kind of um, your career and then some of your new current projects you have going on. Um, so just, you know, knowing a little bit about your background, you know, coming from that screenwriting to comic books. I mean, that's, that's pretty, that's a pretty cool thing. Yeah. I mean, I, um, I, it didn't occur to me a lot when I first wanted to be a writer and a creator that people were writing comics. Like when I was growing up no. writing, com reading comics, it, it just didn't click until later. So I, I was, I think like most young people where I wanted to tell stories. So I immediately gravitated towards film and TV. And I, I put my heart and soul in learning much about that craft as I could. Um, but then it was right around, I always say like 2001, 2002, like the, the vertigo, like, um, preacher and, uh, queen and yep. country and why the last man and like, Warren Ellis and, and just all this great uh, creator owned indie stuff, original stuff that yep. started hitting that I was like, Oh wow, this, that was what really got me excited to, to write a comic one day and took a very long time to uh, try to make it happen. I've been pitching different ideas here and there yeah. for years. And, uh, and I finally got the chance to do eclipse and, uh, and well, I was going to say, I mean, you, you came on pretty strong with eclipse. Thank you. Well, I, I, I kind of, you know, um, there's like an old adage of like, how do you break through? And um, I don't know what the, the saying is, but you kind of just suddenly find a crack in the wall. And then yeah. the moment you squeeze through, you look back and the crack is gone. And so everyone's like, how did you get over there? And you're like, I, I can't really explain it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just happened to uh, pitch Matt Hawkins at Top Cow, this idea mm -hmm. for Eclipse. And uh, he really dug it. And he said, let's do four issues. And uh and it, it 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 blew up and did very well, and so we we took that sixteen issues, and that led to uh, Port of Earth, and and uh, yeah, it was quite a ride. So, so how did your approach to writing comic books, um, along with your screenwriting, how did that? I'm, I'm sure that's a little bit different for most people, but how how did that affect you coming from that to tackling comic books? Yeah, I think that. I just focused on what I knew, which was how to tell a good character story. I'm yeah. a big fan of world building, as you can see from all my comics. So oh, yeah. I really like to spend a lot of time thinking about the world and then how to introduce that world over the, over the, I don't like to just be like, Hey, here's the whole world. I like to, you know, let you experience the world through the journey of the character. And, you know, I yeah. just classic stuff that I had learned, um, you know, in film school and learned along the way, you know, a character, uh, you know, needs to have some sort of like existential dilemma between what they want and what they yep. need and, and the tug and, you know, making sure there's a constant hope and fear and just basic stuff of, of, of good storytelling. And I think what it, what I kept aspiring to learn on, on the job with the clips and Port of Earth and all of them was um, how to use the space of a comic. I mean, that was yep. the, you know, the pacing of the page and what, you know, cliffhangers at the end of the page and, knowing that this is a scene between two people but does it need two panels or seven panels and and what do each of those choices say about the moment in terms of the tension or the drama and how can i make the character the the readers feel something the characters feeling by all that so that was really i think a, a learning curve for me because i didn't you don't no. think about it the same way once you're doing it i don't know all the listeners out there you're reading comics but then when you actually sit down and try to write it or create a comic 
you it, it just change you just look at it <laughs> differently and and so um kind of i'd been thinking like oh yeah I, I i can't wait to make a comic and then you sit there and you realize all the the choice and the the nuance that goes into each of these little decisions so um well, was, and i think everything you just described as far as the way you approach and, and tell your stories I could see all of that in a book that I, I, I want to hit on here in a little bit, but yeah. the future, that yeah. issue number one, every bit of what you just said, you could see there, the cliffhanger, the immediate world building, that connection to the characters. Thank After you. that issue number one, you're hooked. Okay. In your, in your approach to that, I mean, absolutely perfect. And that's one reason we love indie comics so much. And we, we try to really highlight that on our channel um, is because you get to be a part of this world building experience where Marvel DC has already had 60, 70, 80 years plus of that, right? So yeah. it's a new emotion. It's a new feeling. And I think um, as a, uh, uh, you know, a huge fan of comics, these indie comics, I think that's what makes them so great, right? Yeah, well, I'll tell you another thing that's exciting when I, as a reader of indie comics, is that you don't know where they're going. Yeah. You know, when, you, when you are thinking, if, if I'm reading uh, a caped guy or something, I mean, yeah. they're there are a few superhero books that DC and Marvel are doing that are playing around with our expectations and surprising us. And there's, oh, for some, sure. there's some great stuff out there, but there is something really exciting about picking up something uh, that is indie and you just don't know if this character is mm -hmm. going to die in issue two or what is this really about? Or you think this is one thing and then it just switches. You go, wow, I'm following the bad guy here. You just never know yeah. uh, what it is. So I really appreciate that. Um, that kind of complexity. That's something I like to explore in comics. Uh, um, I, I don't like to um, have everything being too black and white. I like to, I like complexity. <laughs> More and like I love that. And I think yeah. most people do. So I think that's absolutely a wonderful thing. Um, but going back to, to clips. So I know last I saw it was being developed by Kirkman. Is that still taking place? So, you know, without going into too much detail, I'll just say that uh, Hollywood... <laughs> uh hollywood is like go 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 super exciting yep. like when they want to pick something up yeah and and then it just takes its time and yeah. so uh these processes are is extremely slow because you're really not just going right out to get uh a network and go you have yeah. to find the right writers and the right takes and um it, it, it it's a very long process so i've learned a tremendous amount about the the process of seeing yeah. a comic uh, intellectual property be adapted and, and the ins and outs. And uh, so, you know, Eclipse is still on its way, but in, in terms of um, its journey uh, of all of the projects that I have in development, Port of Earth yeah. is, is the furthest along. And okay. I would, if, if anything was to be announced as, um, I mean, this is also, by the way, you know, full disclosure to all fans out there. When you see that something has been optioned or picked up, it's super exciting that it's in development. But yep. then it is in this nebulous world of <laughs> development where you have to get all the rest. So yep. until they say it's a show, it's not a show. It's in yeah. development. So yeah. of all of them, I um, I'm hopeful. You know, of all of them, but I I think Port of Earth is the one that um, has been um, moving the fastest, and and I. I'm, I'm most optimistic about that one. Is that one, and that one's through Amazon, correct? That one is at Amazon. Yeah, that's gonna be nice because what they've been doing with a lot of uh, sci-fi stuff is gonna be incredible. And that's what a lot of your books are too, right? You you love the sci-fi genre from what it looks like, I, right? Yeah, I love sci-fi. So what sci are, what are you I'm, I'm laughing by the way because um, I don't know how this is my first time doing this whole kind of spotlight and this hangout thing, but I know okay. Jace Milan all too well. He's a, a dear uh, friend of mine, a fellow pod. Uh, he's a podcaster and. Uh, there he is. He's uh, saying, Zach, I'm, I enjoy messing with people's emotions and expectations. I think what I like, you know, just to say something, Jace, the, the reason that it seems that I, I'm like that is because I like to set up a scenario or a scene in a, in a story where both outcomes seem possible. So, yeah. you know, will she do this? Will she do that? Both seem very possible. And that way, when one happens, I always knew all along. But when I get to that, I go, I need to make sure that the other outcome seems possible. That way you, the, the reader will feel it. It's a natural progression. But, um, and that emotional attachment to the, to those stories at that point, I mean, that's critical to tell a great story. And yeah. again, that's why you indie, indie comic writers, I think just phenomenal work. Um, but so I got sidetracked. We were, what were, you were asking me about uh, uh, the sci-fi. So, oh, yeah. 
So what, I mean, all of your books kind of revolve around that kind of, why do you pull from, pull into the sci-fi genre so much? What is your influence from? It's a good question. Uh, <laughs> I like, you know, it's interesting because when I was young, I really grew up on like Spielbergian 80s stuff, okay. you know, and, but, and those all have imaginative worlds. And so I, hmm. I, I fell in love with those imaginative worlds, but I think in, in my adolescence, I really fell in love with stories that kind of looked at the individual's place in mm -hmm. the world, like Fight Club, yeah. uh, American Beauty. And, and these were stories that were like, you're trying to figure out your place and wonder if, wait, you're kind of taking a step back and saying, everything I thought I knew is not what I know. And I just really liked this idea of thinking about our world and thinking about our place in it. And mm -hmm. um, I think all of my stories not only are sci-fi, but deal with a character against the institution of of the world. And, and okay. uh, you know, Clementine in Join the Future is against mm -hmm. the institution of these oh, yeah. future and of these big cities. And she's just one girl. And how can one girl, first off, have to learn about, you know, everything she thought about this small town, it, her eyes are completely open and then facing her choice. So I, I just really like those kinds of stories and, and, and stories that make you think I like sci-fi yeah. that makes you think. Um, so how was it going from uh, writing uh, the, the sci-fi stuff like you enjoy like that uh, and, and doing the, the run on Nightwing? The run on Nightwing was, was, you know, that was my first, chance into dc and the thing i learned <laughs> at dc is dc is is this massive machine right yep. and there's so many moving parts and so getting brought on to co-script uh with another writer on something that was already created it wasn't really a chance for me to plot anything and i was just there to try to to participate in the process and um everybody at DC, you know, is working very hard and putting their hearts out there to make comics, but the, the machine in and of itself is moving so fast yep. uh, in terms of that monthly scheduling right. and the fact that all of these books are interconnected, right? So you have Nightwing connected to Batman. And so in Batman, you know, uh, Nightwing gets shot in the head and then suddenly in Nightwing, the, that story has to adapt to that. Yep. So it's all moving so fast you know, it, it reminded me of like what I've learned and heard about as being a staff writer at the very bottom of a TV show where you're, you're, yeah. you're there to support the higher ups vision and help them as much as possible. Um, and, and just you're writing, but, and you're looking at a moment and saying, okay, how can I write this character's dialogue to feel authentic and, and realistic to this moment? It was very interesting. It was actually a very interesting uh, assignment to write Nightwing. Yeah right after he had lost his uh memory because i'm like yeah. you know uh he's such a um dick is such an optimistic and hopeful guy <laughs> yep. and i really like that about dick and so to think what well, in this he's clearly lost that and he kind yeah. of is frustrated that he's lost that and so to try to think about that tone and capture that tone was really an interesting um assignment so um, yeah, and they're still carrying on that that storyline with you know his memory loss and all that. Now it's definitely been interesting for sure. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, I learned I learned that that's a different. It's a very different kind of process than 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 what I get to do in um, in plotting sure. and creating my own world. Yeah, absolutely. So Jace had another comment here. So Zach on Flash or Green Lantern would be what I would love to see for him. I, um, I Green, I would love to play in the Green Lantern universe because it's sci-fi and it's 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 interesting yeah. and thought-provoking. Yeah, that would be. Um, I love I love seeing some of the things like uh, Tom King has done, like in terms of mm -hmm. uh, Adam Strange or yep. uh, um, you know Mr. Miracle of taking contained yep. stories where you can really explore something a little more um, more nuanced and and, and deeper. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, one day. <laughs> All right. So one of the other books we haven't mentioned much about yet, because I want to save Join the Future for just yeah. I, I want that to be because that, that yeah. deserves a long segment Thank there. You. But Lost City. So t talk to me a little about that one. So that one's from Aftershock. Um, That's, yeah. Yeah. And I know that one's been picked up by Universal as well. But talk to me a little about that one as well. 
Well, the premise for those of you listening who aren't familiar with that book is it's a, a group of uh, young adults uh, t- here today in modern times, and they find out that there's a lost city under Manhattan, and they, mm-hmm. they go looking for it. And the, the, the heroine of the story is a 17-year-old girl. She's um, lost her mother a long time ago, mm-hmm. and then uh, her father is kind of um, a little bit of a crazed uh, archaeologist, mm-hmm. scientist of sorts. Yeah. He's on the expedition to, uh, but she doesn't know it to look for this lost city, and then he goes missing, and so she has to find him. She puts her her group of friends together. I mean, I fell in love with those eighty Spielbergian adventure yeah. stories and things like Stranger Things. I love, but Stranger Things is is nostalgic, mm-hmm. and I always wanted to explore doing something like that that was modern yeah. and that kind of captured a more modern feel. And I uh, love New York, and I love underground. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know what you call it. I actually even for the research of that book went um, spelunking. Uh, there was a guy who takes you underground in New York City. So wow. he this was highly illegal. And it was also after 9-11. So he warned me that like, you know, you better be careful. <laughs> <laughs> I went out in trouble for saying that. It, I, I, this is all uh, not real if I am getting in trouble. But yeah, it's you, all, um, you have to what, jump the tracks. And then you go into the tunnels of, of uh, the subway tunnels of New York. And it's just fascinating because first off, it's silent, which is really yeah. different than New York. And, and just there are these em- abandoned tunnels that go on for miles and miles and they connect to all sorts of history. I just thought it was a really fascinating world. And, and so that was the inspiration to kind of explore. explore That's that. awesome, though. Yeah. But again, that was all allegedly, right? It was all allegedly, right. Yeah. So right. unfortunately, though, you didn't find any Ninja Turtles? I did not find it. I found mole people. There are mole people, people who live off the grid. They um, wire, so the, they will wire um, electrical cables to the lamppost to get their power. And then they'll be down there with their tents and their uh, really? little portable televisions and uh, mini fridges. And they'll be living off the grid under underground. Yeah. I, you know, my, my you one disappointing thing with Lost and Explorers was I almost had too much uh, <laughs> world that I want, and yeah. I had to cram it all into this five issue mini. And I really uh, wish I had had more room to explore some of that stuff, but because it's so, just fascinating. And, and that's got to be kind of a hard scenario too, right? Because you do ultimately have control of your entire world. So how do you, at a high level, I guess, kind of decide what it is you're going to put into this world, or do you try to always leave a little bit for you know a, a second arc, or kind of it's, walk me through that for a minute? It's tricky. This is kind of, um, you learn this as you go, how yeah. much food to put on the table, you know? And I think in the beginning, you're an excited chef. So you're like, ta-da! <laughs> and then you're like, they're like, what the, I can't eat all this. This is ridiculous, you know? And then you you learn how much to put on the table. And I actually think it's better to put less yeah. because then you get to have more space to explore the characterization yeah. and the feelings and the emotions of what's going on. And readers actually, I think it, when you first start comics, you think that readers have a short attention span yep. and, and you're kind of told you have to keep at it and, and keep, keep them, you know, um, constantly action and entertaining. Yep. And, and that's actually not what I've found over the past three or four years. I think that readers are really quite willing to take, quiet moments with the characters or explore worlds or have mm-hmm. suspense. They, they really are willing to go with you if you take them wherever, wherever you want. And so I think taking out an excess of story and leaving more space for that stuff can be good. And, and so in terms of what you put in there, you just have kind of have to figure out what the story is ultimately about. The tricky thing with Lost City Explorers was, was actually about the exploration of two worlds, both the underground New York world and the lost city. Yeah. And what it turned out to be is I was actually more interested in exploring the underground world and the lost city was merely the final destination rather than yeah. that world to explore. But, um, but yeah, um, it's tricky. It's, you know, it, it takes time for creators to learn the right amount to put in. Absolutely. Absolutely, I can imagine. So, all right, well, let's let's talk about Join the Future. Because sure. This is a book I'm pretty excited about. Um, through Aftershock, correct? Yes. Um, I think he's excited about it too. He kind I of love it up a little bit. Um, yeah, yeah I'm excited. excited. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an ongoing currently. I believe the uh, next issue comes out 
this week, next week, something like that. Issue, I think, right? uh, issue four just came out last Wednesday, and then issue five comes out uh, after Labor Day, September 9th. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So a few weeks from now. So I'm telling you, whenever you were, again, like I said at the very beginning, talking about everything that you try to put into a comic, that first issue alone, I mean, from the, that first few pages of showing off the city, I'm like, man, this is not what I expected, but it's a really cool world. And then all of a sudden we go into just outside of the city, but you're in a whole totally different environment and world. And I thought the way just in that first issue alone, because I don't want to spoil too much for everybody, you know, but that was, that was incredible. Right. I mean, we yeah. can spoil a little bit. We can spoil Go ahead. The first pages. I mean, the, the, the premise of join the future, if you're not familiar and you're listening is that uh, in the future, uh, major cities have kind of fallen into a rat race for who can get bigger and bigger. And yep. uh, what has happened is, uh, they have been gobbling up small towns and mm -hmm. rural towns all over the American countryside. So what we're seeing is the inevitable death and decline of small town America. And um, it focuses on one of these small towns who has but a, a couple hundred yeah. residents left. And uh, this is the classic Western setup of civilization is coming through and uh, our country, Western town, ranchers, don't want to sell to the railroad, don't want to sell to yep. the modernization. They want to maintain their old way of life. But we're doing it in this futuristic landscape, uh, and they don't want to move to the city and sell, yep. and they're being pressured to do so, and then mayhem unfolds. And it follows this young uh, teenage girl, and yep. um, she's very headstrong and very well-powered, and uh, all she's known is small-town living, and she's been told to – to, to not compromise her ideals and um, and she finds herself in between these two worlds. Um, and yeah, it was a tremendous amount to establish very early on in the first 10 pages. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I really liked this idea of creating almost a, a promo video. It was, I was inspired by the, um, when you sit down in the airplane and you yeah. get the, uh, the Delta or whatever they say, Hello, yeah. thank you very much for coming on to Southwest Airlines. We'd like to tell you about how wonderful your experience is going to be. And so uh, that is a join that you get that from this future city. Um, yeah, it almost feels robotic and cold, but in, in like what you expect from like a future, any future movie you've ever seen where they depict, it, it does, it feels very robotic and very cold, not very, but not, not in a bad way. And so you definitely got that in the first few. And then you yeah. drop us, boom, right into the middle of, of the woods no electronics, no anything. I know there's one particular scene with the, uh, it was like an iPod. Yeah, with the uh, brother. And we, yeah, and your dad would kill you if he saw you had this. And I was like, man, I mean, that's two pretty stark differences in worlds right there that you yeah. set the tone of very, very quickly. Yeah, that's right. And um, it doesn't take much. You know, what's interesting is you don't need the city to say anything nefarious. Mm -hmm. It's it's so perfect, and yet you get that in this one world, the emphasis is not on connection. It is on yep. convenience. And then you come to this other world where you see them connecting yep. and having quiet personal experiences, and it, there's a kind of a, a community uh, gathering and party, yep. and they're all singing and happy and the stark difference from the other experiences that you saw people in the city where they're all yeah. watching they're all observers and not interactors and it, it's yeah. just enough that you 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 can see the dichotomy and and it's not to say that one is bad than the other and I, i've kind of followed fans and reviewers who yeah. kind of like the city they're like oh, this sounds great why would you ever not want to live in the city and it's like <laughs> you can but yeah. it's to say that there are different kinds of experience and i actually think that it's very hard to have both convenience and connection in life. You have, yep. to, and and we try to balance that. Yep. But I think the obsession with convenience and technology can sometimes leave us disconnected. Now it's ironic that this comes in the middle of a pandemic when we all feel completely disconnected from each yep. other and isolated. And um, so it, it brings up a whole lot more, I think, when people are reading it. But um, absolutely. Yeah. So what was your inspirations for it? I mean, obviously, obviously, right now we do live in a time, just like you said, where we're so much on technology, convenience, things like that. Um, there aren't many places left, you know, unless you go to a really small town where you're going to have that kind of living still happening, right? That's that, that kind of livelihood. And even then, you're still going to have high levels of technology. Everybody's going to have the Internet, things like that. Yeah. I mean, so 
is it kind of your interpretation of kind of what's going on now and kind of just or kind of talk me through your inspirations of it. Yeah, two couple of things. One, I actually grew up in a small town um, mm-hmm. in the middle of my uh, childhood in in Iowa and okay. uh, Quad Cities, Iowa. I was there for six years and um, cornfields and all. And so I oh, remember yeah. having a very idealistic kind of childhood where I play with the neighborhood kids yeah. and it's all. And now uh, I live in Los Angeles. I have uh, two very young kids and thinking about their experience. Yep. And I think that combined with I like to read a lot about future trends and I kept seeing yeah. over the years the decline of of the small town and 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 yeah. how and completely an apolitical um not talking about politics at all just yeah. the nature of what small towns in California small towns in yeah. every state just dwindling and changing in yeah. in kind of an irrevocable it's not it's not I don't think it is going to swing back but who knows but yeah. I thought this current decline that we're seeing was just interesting what if it never stops declining what well, is it possible that in the future we only live in big cities and what would happen to yeah. those few people who don't want that life and that was the where it all started and see and to me this almost feels like the lead up to i don't know if you've ever seen like i think it's called immortal engines or something like that with yes. all these big massive cities and then you have you know, these underground pe- mole people, <laughs> yes. you know, it, it feels like this would almost be the lead up to something that extreme, right? Where you have big, massive cities, everybody's there. It's a big rat race. And then you have the the resistance or the people living in these small towns kind of, you know, does that make sense? It kind of, Absolutely. that is the same kind of feel as what I'm getting. Well, whether it's Mortal Engines or I think Hunger Games, both of these yeah. kind of sci-fi premises explore the small community versus the big community. Yeah. So, um, yeah, absolutely. It taps into the same stuff I enjoy enjoying the future. So, yeah, I absolutely love it, man. So, so anything else you want to add about join the future? Um, Hmm. That's a good question. Um, you know, I think it's, um, it's a Western, you know, yeah. and I think that that's something that I'd always really wanted to try to do. And so I lot, I watched a lot of Westerns and I tried to infuse a lot of Western, attitude and feel into uh join the future and one of the really interesting existential dilemmas that the the heroine has to deal with in join the future is something bad happens to her community and she's out for revenge and payback and she quickly finds herself both she wants to defend her ideals but uh she doesn't want to use modern technology to do it so she's stuck with a a six shooter revolver to go up against um, the lawmen and the enemies from the city who are armed to the teeth with shields and yeah. ion cannons and all sorts of stuff. And so it's, it, how do you do that? How do you fight yeah. bullies and um, those who have so much more than you? What are you supposed to do? And it felt, yeah. and yet through the lens of a Western. So I really uh, enjoyed that aspect of it. Sure. And I think that, um, that's one of the things I'm most uh, excited for fans who are hearing about it to uh, to check out because I think that that dilemma is very uh, is very uh, modern and cool. Yeah. So yeah, I, I and even though it's through the eyes of you know a young teenage girl or through the lens, so to speak, you know, and she's the main character, I still feel like you know even as a, you know an adult male, I can still kind of relate and understand her viewpoints and things like that. And I think your ability to do that with a character. Uh, kind of speaks volumes about what you're doing with these books. So, Thank you. Um, but real quick, so I did want to hit one more comment. Oh, yeah, Jace is, J- Jace is calling me out here, Jace. Yeah, uh, another great thing about Join the Future is the team of uh, creators on there. Uh, Peter Kowalski and Brad Simpson are one of the best art teams out right now, hands mm-hmm. down. Uh, if anyone likes what they see in Join the Future, go look at Bloodborne. Yeah, uh, they're just and then Brad Simpson is um, coloring things like Black Stars Above and Coffin Bound. He's he's one of the best colors out there. And then Hassan Otsman Elhow is a letterer that's come out of nowhere in the past yeah. couple of years. And he's on everything. And he just brings life to the letters. You don't realize it, but suddenly there'll be like a a, a sound effect and he finds a way to interweave <laughs> it into the into yeah. the, the art. So I am very lucky to have such a great team and they've really brought the whole thing to life. And um, so it, it is, I mean, many people, I've, many people have said it's one of the, one of the most beautiful books out there. And yeah. it really is some of the splash pages oh, yeah. are 
unbelievable. Um, so just you just Google join the future art yep. because some of these double page splashes that, that the guys do. I mean, I, I'm fortunate. I get to be like sci-fi <laughs> city buildings and yeah. people, and I get to just say, here's all the, the stuff you guys have to draw, and then they they pull it off. So it's those are definitely great. the makings for the for some of the better splash pages that you can do in comics for sure. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. So, so guys at home, if you're watching, uh, go to your local comic shop. You can still pick these up, uh, you know, through Diamond. They can order it. You can order them on Aftershock. So definitely go pick these up. And also, and, pick say, up and I'd say, too, I mean, we're, issue five comes out next uh, yeah. month. And if you want to jump on board, go for it. But also the trade will be out in about, uh, uh, let's see, what, uh, probably November. And so it's, if, if, you're, if you're not, if you don't want to uh, jump in on the last <laughs> issue of the arc, Order, yeah. pre-order the trade, you know, get on, uh, pre-order the trade. Absolutely. So definitely go pick that up. Uh, and then there's, you know, a couple of his other books he's done, Eclipse, Port of Earth, Lost City Explorers. So check all of those out. And of course, uh, join the future. Um, so Zach, we do appreciate you coming on, talking hey, with Thanks so much, here. guys. Uh, tell everybody at home where they can find you on social media, things like that. I'm online, Zach Caps, Z A C K K A P S. I'm uh, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, you can find me at all those spots. So, yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, sir. We do appreciate your time. Hey, thank you, guys. And uh, join Good. the future is something special, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Who's older over there? Who's the older one? <laughs> He's much shorter, though. Don't, don't let me really? you. <laughs> oh, right, guys. Thank Thanks you. to everyone uh, watching, and uh, you guys keep. Keep hanging out here for the mainframe Comic Con all day long and all weekend. So thanks again, Jack. We appreciate it, man. Thank you, guys. All right, John. We'll turn it back over to you, friend.
Hello. Hi. Can you hear me, Adam? Hello. I can hear you. How are you doing? Oh, good. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Jamal, you good? He's frozen. Uh oh, he is frozen. Hello. Hi. Yes. I'm frozen. You can't see me. You can't hear me. What? I can hear well, you're you. You're moving a little slow. Frozen. frozen. Yeah. Uh oh. Okay. Um, we're gonna since we're having a little bit of technical difficulties, I'm gonna hop off and hop right back in, and hopefully that will solve the problem. Hold on. Okay. It's just me and you. Hi, Wendy. <laughs> Hi, Adam. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've known Tyler for a little while now. A little bit. <laughs> yeah. He was just in here. He's he's playing tech support. This is um, his studio, actually. That oh, really? In. Yeah. My, my study is a little bit too uh, findable by the kids. So nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, I, my, my office area is very open. So I get cats and dogs and kids running through here too. <laughs> I see. Yeah. Hopefully Gamal is okay. Yeah. So how can we see? Oh, so is that yeah. a comment? Is that Adam? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Oh, hi, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how comments pop up. I see. I guess okay, so. Wow. Yeah. That's very fancy. <laughs> I think every publisher probably has a spinner rack, huh? It's kind of like a rite of passage almost. Yeah. Our one is unfortunately not vintage. We got a reproduction. But oh, apparently okay. the vintage ones have a little bit of an issue because they bend the books. So, um, yeah. yeah. The new ones don't actually bend them, though? No, I think they worked out that kink before remanufacturing them. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> what are you working on right now? Can you say? Um, in terms of comics or yeah. in general? Um, or, so, or I guess whatever it is right now. <laughs> right. Uh, well, I'm working on a novel. So I'm at, at the end stages of, of a literary fiction novel. Um, but in with my comics hat on, I'm uh, just wrapping up um, an anthology called Embodied. It's um, an intersectional feminist uh, graphic poetry anthology. So it's a hybrid genre that um, uh, Tyler and I have kind of created together with a view towards marrying the best of poetry with the best of sequential art. You know, oh, like we have yeah. many, many uh, decades, if not centuries actually, of illustrated poetry, but we've never had like sequential, sequential art drawn poetry. So this is something that we're trying out and I'm excited about it. Nice, yeah, that sounds excellent. Welcome back, Kamal. Hello again. Sorry about that. This is much better. Yes. yes. Well, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Um, I, hopefully you guys were talking about exciting things while I was indisposed. Um, do you want to keep going or shall I pick up from the top? Well, we're probably a little behind now. So if we want to get through the itinerary, we'll just uh, okay. keep going. I would like to hear what you're working on, Adam, but I'm sure you're going to get a chance to tell us all. So. Uh, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's actually working on an anthology uh, called Jenny Reagan. Isn't that right? Well, Adam? well, the uh, the Jenny Reagan is not an anthology. It's actually uh, just a limited series uh, oh, that I'm working good. on with Mario Candelaria. He's the writer. I'm the artist. And uh, um, yeah, it's uh, being colored by Leslie Atlansky. Um, so we're talking to publishers right now. It's going it's going well, I think. So um, you'll hear more about that. Um, I don't know if it's at the end of the year or next year, but we'll, we'll see. So, awesome. yeah. Okay. Um, so <laughs> let's pick up where we were supposed to pick up from. Um, I'm just going to give a little bit of a framework for what we're going to be talking about before we dive into the actual conversation. By the way, the guy who keeps jumping in and out of the panel 
is me. I'm Gamal Hennessy. I am a comic book attorney. I am an author. And I've actually, the reason why we're doing this panel is because I just finished writing a book that's going to be released very soon called The Business of Independent Comic Book Publishing. We're currently running a Kickstarter for that campaign. Um, the link for it will be available in the chat as we're going through the conversation. Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to define what independent comic book publishing is and how it's different from other types of comic book publishing. Then I'm going to highlight the three major stages in independent comic book publishing, being pre-production, production, and post-production. Then uh, we're going to have a discussion about one aspect of each stage before we open up the call for questions um, from the audience. Does that make sense, folks? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. So just to define what independent comic book publishing is, we're defining it as the development, production, and commercial distribution of narrative sequential art without the support or assistance from any larger corporate owner or a third party publisher. What this means is that the independent publisher is responsible for all aspects of production and retains ownership and control over the entire book. Now, this differs from freelance comic book publishing, which is the development, production, and distribution of comics on behalf of a third-party publisher. And it's also slightly different from creator-owned comic book publishing, which is publishing in cooperation with a third-party publisher. Now, all these three different types of publishing lead to the same result which is you get comics that you can read, but the legal and business relationships in each process are quite different. So if we're focusing strictly on independent comic book publishing, you have to look at three different stages. There's pre-production, which is developing the business model and collecting the resources to support that model. So you bring in everything you need to actually publish your book before you start working on the actual pages. Production is using all those resources to create your book in any format that's on time and on budget. Now, post-production is just a process of releasing that book for public consumption in exchange for some so form of revenue. Now, there are several steps in each of the major stages and dozens of choices that you have to make within each stage, and each one will have an impact on the overall business success of your book. Now, there's a lot of different things that we can talk about when we're talking about independent publishing because it's such a involved process, but I'd like to focus on three specific aspects just to give people a flavor of the type of thing, the type of thought processes that go into developing an independent book. So, um, Wendy, I would like to start with you to actually find out how you go about deciding what books to publish knowing that you only have limited time, limited money, and limited resources compared to all the potential comics you can make? Yeah, I mean, that's an excellent question. And I think that it's um, even more important now post, well, in many a race of pandemic, right? Because mm -hmm. I think that uh, the way in which small businesses like my own um, have had to pivot and have had to be really like crystal clear about our strategy and plan going forward has made um, this aspect more clear um, in terms of choice of projects because um, our budget has been tightened, mm -hmm. our, uh, the, the time that we have has been tightened. And so I think um, an awareness of the market, an awareness of what um, people want to read right now is very, very important because that too has changed um, post pandemic, right? And an acknowledgement of that, um, I think it's very important in terms of like filling the demand, right? It's it's a business, it's supply and demand. You can talk as much as you like about, you know, the love of the medium. I think we all love it. Otherwise we wouldn't have been in the business of making graphic novels for this long. For me, it's been 15 years, um, but beyond that, you are selling a product, right? And you are trying to cater to an audience. So you need to think very carefully, I think, about what does that audience want right now? What niche are you filling? And how specifically 
are you the right person to, to tell the story? Or how specifically is the project that you have in your hand, the, your, your perspective project, going to fill that demand? Okay, no, that makes, that makes perfect sense. And it actually segues very um, well into Adam. I know when you did The Good Fight, you actually did it for a very specific um, event, a very specific series of events. So could you actually talk about how, like the, the general social climate actually played into the idea of what book you were going to ultimately make. Yeah, so I I have a history of just being an artist on uh, various anthologies, comic book anthologies that have happened. And mm -hmm. um, during the um, Charlottesville, Virginia um, mess that happened with the, the white nationalists and the incidents, of violence that happened. Um, I, I was just angry and I put out a tweet and I was like, does any, if anybody wants to put together an anthology uh, against this, I'm available. And, and um, it, by the next day, I knew that I was the one that was actually putting it together by all the responses I was getting. So um, it was, it was an interesting moment for me. Um, I, I wasn't seeking to fill that you know, voice that needed to happen socially. Um, but uh, apparently it was my idea at the moment. So the call happened and and then we put together a great um, group of creators to, to make the good fight happen. So um, sometimes it doesn't even happen necessarily on purpose. It's a very specific event that happens and you um, respond to it in an appropriate way and kind of falls into place. And then you have to push for it to make sure it you can follow through and it happens. So um, that was a one in a lifetime kind of book, I think. I don't think I'll ever uh, have the foresight to see something going on socially where we need to talk like this is a thing we need to talk about. Um, it just kind of happened, but I, I stuck with it and was like, this is something that we need to talk about, it needs to keep going and we need to raise money for charity. So. Um, uh, yeah, that's kind of my answer for that. Um, okay, yeah, no, that's that's actually very interesting because it sounds like there's two. We have two very different approaches to deciding what material to publish. I mean, Wendy, you seem to be coming at it from a very like pragmatic, long-term business sort of approach, and Adam, for want of a better concept, it seems like yours was a very like emotional response to the moment that you were living in. So it, there wasn't Absolutely. like a, a the kind of business analysis that Wendy was talking about when you're making your book, but you still had that focus to actually get the book out there. So I think those, because we have such a, a big dichotomy there, it's actually very interesting that you both could actually make the books that you were seeking to make. One of the things I wanted to touch on, which is something that Wendy brought up, is trying to make the books that people need to read right now. But the comic book production process takes a significant amount of time. So the decision that you make about what book to put out in the middle of a pandemic, August of 2020, um, depending on your production cycle, how is that going to impact your decision when you know the book may not come out for six months, eight months, a year? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that certainly has to be factored into your strategy. Right. Um, a question popped up from a viewer um, asking what sorts of books people seem to be wanting now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I saw your question before. Thank you for that. Um, you know, I, I think that one has to keep one's fingers on the pulse of the market and there mm -hmm. are ways to follow that. And there are certain trends that are coming up. So, for example, books that speak to the historical moment are mm -hmm. trending right now. YA um, and middle grade books are also trending right now. And let me not be like, uh, uh, let me not be overly insistent on the sort of production of culture or like mm -hmm. a business end of my strategy. I mean, our brand identity, Wave Blue World, is certainly very specific and it's always been very political, very progressive. Um, you know, we don't do comic, but uh, we, we don't do superhero comics. We, mm -hmm. we do books that are socially relevant. So that is first and foremost part of our brand identity. And that is like the first layer um, of 
consideration when it comes to choosing material. But then mm -hmm. after that, there there is this other consideration of, you know, what is the market doing right now and what is going to have legs and what do people need? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I just wanted to say too that with the uh, with the good fight, even though it was uh, an anti racism book in reaction to something that happened in 2017, we got it out in 2018 and it's about two two years old. We knew that the book was going to, you know, obviously be around because it's a book and they don't just evaporate. But like, so we we did then take the focus on all right, how can we make this a timeless commentary? Because unfortunately it's a problem that we all know is going to be around because it's always been around and um, mm -hmm. you know, it's the fight against it. So um, how can we make it not be about this moment, but an overall arcing uh, commentary on everything going on in society. And I think we did that appropriately. And, and a lot of people will read it now and think it's brand new. Like we just made it, but um, just on how you handle each story or the story of your book, you know, if it's about a topic that is going, that is ongoing, it can always seem relevant and new I for agree reading it for the first time. Yeah. yeah, I completely agree and completely identify with that actually, because Tyler and I wrote American Terrorist 10 years ago now, which we oh, are wow. reissuing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, amazing. <laughs> We're reissuing um, this fall, right around the election. And um, yes, we did do a fresh edit, but for the most part, the issues that that book grapples with are still perhaps even doubly relevant today, sadly. Mm -hmm. enough, you know, so I think you're absolutely right that, you know, if, if you write it with enough specificity, with enough verisimilitude, then it's going to remain relevant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So do you too feel that because you actually approach your subject matter in a very specific way, do you feel that that kind of approach is less relevant for the kind of books that, for want of a better word, are not necessarily timeless? They are of a particular moment, they are of a particular genre, and they, if it's a monthly comic that's about an ongoing story that may have been ongoing for like 40, 50 years, it's, do you feel that the approach that you two are taking in terms of choosing your material isn't as relevant to that kind of business model based on the content? Yeah, it really, it depends on the content that you're making. So like a sci-fi uh, genre type book, you know, it can just be about the story and mm -hmm. how uh, the reader relates to a character. And as long as you get that relation between the character or characters and the reader really solid, um, humans are always going to feel a certain way about characters when they read them. So as long as like that part is really set up nicely, um, that can give it that, those, those uh, legs for the future, make it feel timeless and whatnot. You know, you can read old comics now and, you know, maybe some of the techniques that they use in the, either the writing or the art might feel old fashioned, but you can mm -hmm. still relate to some of the characters. Um, and that's what makes them, them last. Um, right. so it depends if you're talking about social things, I think you have to like broaden and have a little bit of foresight of what we're like dealing with and talking about. And we can almost kind of guess now, like where things are going to go socially anymore, because all of these problems are so loud and prevalent in our daily lives. Um, so, uh, I, I think if you just pay attention to the world around you, you, the specific, the word you used, uh, will help you um you know keep it going yeah i mean i think that speaks to you know what what makes a work classic right like mm -hmm. shakespeare was highly specific highly of his time why do we still read him right because like a good narrative has multiple layers and the layer of historical specificity is only one of multiple mm -hmm. layers that you have to put into your story if you want it to be good and if you want it to to evoke an emotional response, right? Like that is the goal. And that emotional response, that hook, that identification between the reader and your characters and the story, you know, that that's what you're going for. And you need to have 
but you need to be thinking on several layers of, of story and content in order to make that happen. And to um, answer Adam's uh, question, um, giving something um, that they're ready for, but not uh, might not know that they want or need yet. I think that's kind of always what we want as storytellers is to give you that next thing that maybe you haven't necessarily read before or seen before. Um, but, but it's always like, it's kind of a crapshoot. Like, <laughs> uh, at least for me, like, I'm just always telling the story that I want to tell, you know, and I, and I, and I try to convey that emotional connection between uh, us and the reader. Um, and hopefully that is enough to, to lure them in. But sometimes you can write something or draw something really good and it, it doesn't, it just doesn't get out there. And that's kind of what the, the business uh, aspect of it is and, and publishing and how you promote things and all of that. There's, I'm sure there's like, you know, thousands of incredible comics that no one really has read. But I feel like the ones that make it through always kind of exhibit this um, extraordinary dance or like a tango between the familiar and the strange, right? The original and the recognizable. Um, so that, that kind of speaks to what you're saying, Adam, I think. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, let's shift gears a little bit because once you actually understand what story you're going to make, and unless you're actually gonna do the entire production process on your own, you kind of have to figure out the, the actual team that you're going to use for each individual project. So Adam, I know you had a very unique situation on like finding your team and figuring out the compensation and figuring out the contracts and managing a lot of remote people. So why don't we start at the beginning? How did you actually determine who was going to be a part of something like The Good Fight? Well, we had, we had such a huge response uh, with people, with creatives volunteering to uh, uh, contribute to the book that we ended up doing several, well, like three, I guess, uh, calls for uh, submissions for the book. So at first it was like, I, I had you know a few hundred people and I was like, well, that's enough to make the book. But then it was mm -hmm. like, we were getting the reading the stories that were coming in and whatnot, and we realized, okay, we really need to do this right and pinpoint all the the aspects of this topic, uh, you know, in a well rounded way. Because when you're submitting to an anthology, you have no idea what other people are writing about and sending in. And um, so we had a time where it was just like completely open submissions, write what you want, and then it was, and then we had a time where like, all right, well, we had. Uh, we have these these holes that we want to fill uh, with subtopics. So let's reach out to some people and see if they're willing to do that because we know they would be good at that type of story. Um, and then we also had um, another time where there was just certain creatives that we just wanted on there. And we, we asked if they would want to be a, a part of this and, um, uh, you know, and then we helped like steer them in the direction to fill those final few spots so we could just have a really nice uh, rounded book. So for our book, since it was the whole goal of it was to um, talk about the subject of racism uh, and to also uh, uh, raise money for charity, uh, mm -hmm. it was kind of nice in the, in the aspect that nobody was looking for money you know, I was flat out about everything. Like, you're not getting paid. I'm not getting paid. Like, nobody's getting paid. <laughs> you know, whatever we make, we're gonna we're gonna donate it, and that's been really nice. So, we didn't have to worry too much about negotiating with you know 150 people. That sounds like a nightmare. I don't know how a wave blue world does that, but uh, <laughs> um, you know, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there's something you can uh, talk about that, but. Uh, you know, it was, I, I gave everybody, like, you will always have the rights to your story, you know, but don't, you know, expect anything monetarily, you know, from us. I gave everybody copies of the books, you know, so that was kind of the compensation was they could, you know, keep them or sell them or however they wanted, you know, for that. But it worked out really well for this particular project. Um, and I know from a business aspect, that's something that has to be handled differently if you're putting out a product that you're selling for profit uh, mm -hmm. to keep um, 
you know, obviously like the, the lead editor couldn't, or the publishing company can't just like keep all the money and not pay their people. So, but that's definitely a question for, for Wendy, <laughs> yeah. how that works. <laughs> we're, going, we're going to switch over to that right now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I can't really, I can't really speak too much to how Tyler has done it for the vast majority of the anthologies he's put together. Um, I've just put together my first anthology. Um, most of the stuff that Tyler has done before has been through Kickstarter, right? So, so that's a pretty self-explanatory funding model, right? And that makes sense as to how all the participants can get paid. So um, embodied the uh, intersectional feminist um, graphic poetry anthology that I'm just wrapping up now, that's our first anthology that we're not kickstarting. And while it is a charity book, uh, some of the proceeds, a percentage of the proceeds are going to a women's health organization, an international women's health organization. And it's going to be released in May, which is International Women's Health Month um, next, uh, next year. Um, we, we've had to figure out a different kind of business model. So in terms of compensating the writers, the writers are all poets. And um, I have a background as a poet. I have two poetry collections out. So that's kind of um, my uh, professional milieu, I guess, to, to a degree. I have a lot of contacts in that area. I've been a poetry editor for many years. So, you know, I didn't open um, submissions. I solicited specific people because I wanted this book to be highly diverse. We actually have a majority women of color. It's also open to um, trans, non-binary, um, all femme identities. Um, so, you know, I, I wanted to be very careful about making sure that we have, you know, uh, every demographic represented. Um, so I solicited these poets. But poets make no money. Like poets really just do it for the love. So um, the poetry that I was soliciting for the most part uh, has already been out, you know, mm -hmm. either in um, a literary journal or in a poetry collection. So th it wasn't too much of an issue around like asking someone to produce new material, for example. Okay. Uh, so there's that aspect. And also, you know, we're offering them a bunch of free books <laughs> as compensation, which, um, which is frankly more than most poets get. Like most poets will publish a piece in a literary journal for nothing um, or for one copy or, or something like that. So, you know, that was great to be able to have like half of the artists, the, the, the literary work in the book, um, not have to be monetarily compensated upfront. Um, and as for the artists um, and, and the rest of the people on board, yeah, we're paying them. And we're just really, really hoping that uh, this this book has got legs. You know, we're we're banking on it. Okay. Now, did you solicit the artists as well, or did you get submissions from the artists? Uh, yes, we solicited them as well because you know they are all, uh, you know, of of the same sort of diverse identities that mm -hmm. we want to be representing in this book. Yeah, and it was hard. Believe me. I mean, it's hard to get. There, there's not a lot of women artists out there and they have really busy schedules. And we were also, you know, uh, doing a lot of this right as the pandemic struck. So people were scrambling and, you know, as I'm sure you've experienced too, Adam, I mean, you know, having to, to deal with um, so many people on a book, it's like herding cats, you know? Yeah, and I always said it was like making a movie. Like just, there's just people everywhere. <laughs> Absolutely. And people yeah. have different communication styles and people have, you know, it's, it, it's difficult. You know, I think that you need to be really explicit um, uh, and upfront about your expectations and their expectations. And, you know, you need to give like a buffer in terms of uh, deadlines and stuff like that. I mean, I hate lying to people. I don't even like to lie to my kids, you know, but I, I think for, to some degree, it's like you, you have to allow for, um, you know, a certain, a certain gap. And then you also have to always have a, a plan B, right? Like if this person is gonna drop out, do I have a backup? 
And, you know, for us, because we wanted this book to be all women, all trans, all non-binary, et cetera, you know, that pool was really limited. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, fortunately we were able to get folks from, from abroad to, to fill in when we had other folks dropping out. Okay. Yeah. Now, was the same process similar when you were working on American Terrorist in terms of the artwork, in terms of the act, the lettering and things like that? No, much less so, right? Because we were only working with Andy McDonald, you know, that's one person, it's not like 50 people. <laughs> um, and, you know, it was a much more steady paycheck, right? Like it's a whole, a, a whole graphic novel, 200 page graphic novel. So um, it, it was less difficult. Okay. Okay. Now, Adam, I know that you had all your people who actually worked on The Good Fight had contracts because I wrote all the mm. contracts. Yeah. Um, but for anthologies like this, because you've been a part of a lot of anthologies, is the was the contract process similar? Like, did everyone in all the anthologies have like a detailed contract laying out what they were and were not going to get and when things had to happen and everything like that? Uh, no, honestly, um, it is very mixed on what I receive from either individuals that are putting these things together or companies. Um, and it's frustrating, <laughs> you know, um, now I am a contract person. So like, even if it's, I'm, I'm actually working on this project that's unannounced uh, with a really good friend of mine and it's just Ooh. me and him. And I'm like, okay, so we're gonna put this contract together and it's just gonna be between you and me, but this will lay out all of our ex expectations as to do who gets paid what and this and that, because I value you as a friend and I don't want to get in that argument later, uh, especially if we actually start making some decent money with this, like we're not gonna have that argument. You know, like I want us to both write down what we want, settle on it before we get going. And, you know, I. I heard this once and I don't know if it was from you, Gamal, I'm sorry, but somebody once told me that contracts save friends, friendships. Oh. Um, and no, I that think wasn't me, but it's, you yeah. should use it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a good one. And, it, and that's what I tell all my friends now that I work with and co in comic books, you work with a lot of your friends, you become friends with a lot of creators and, and then you end up working together and, but really you kind of start off as friends. So like, I always just say contracts save friendships. So let's maintain our friendship and have a contract between us for this project. And um, um, I, th I think it really comes in handy because it prevents any arguing. Like it's already down. You already know what you're getting out of it. You already know what you're putting into it. You know, mm -hmm. it's there for everyone to see. And um, yeah, so I, I'm a big backer of contracts now <laughs> for sure. Well, that's good. You make me very proud. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Wendy, the, like the contract process, I mean, I know the, the poets don't aren't necessarily getting paid, but the artists are. So how do you actually manage the contract ma the contract process in those kind of scenarios relative to something like American terrorist? Right. I mean, they're similar in the sense that in both cases, you know, we we own the IP. Mm -hmm. So, and, and it's a page rate. So they're freelancers, which you know, cause you write our contracts. So. Yes, I write your contracts too. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So, now, so in general, for the most part, we try to keep it as clean as possible in that, in that same vein as what Adam was saying. I mean, contracts are definitely a great way of making expectations explicit from the get go and to maintain, you know, positive and appropriate boundaries, right? Nobody gets upset, nobody feels cheated. Everybody knows um, what's happening from start to finish. Okay, now I know, and you probably, both of you are probably well aware, is that in, in the comic book publishing, page rates, there is no standard for page rates in the industry. So how is it that when you're either, I mean, Adam, in your case, you've, you've been on both sides of it, how do you, and so for both of you, how do you go about establishing what a page rate is for a particular artist or writer that you happen to be working with? And what factors go into that final number? Usually it's a, for me, it's a conversation. So I'm, I'm 
more often than not the artist on a project um, mm -hmm. in, instead of the organizer. Um, so for me, it's a it's, you get the pre discussion with the person putting it together, and um, you know I want to get a sense of what it is that they're putting together. So I need to know like how much work I'm putting into this. Um, also, um, is this, you know, clearing my schedule for a year, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, um, uh, am I doing the, the layouts, the, the pencils, the inks, uh, tones, um, do they expect me to color it? Cause I don't color. So I need to make sure that they know I don't color, you know, um, I don't do lettering. Um, you know, you got to bang all that out first so they know how to make the contract um, mm -hmm. and then be really explicit with like, I definitely want a contract because I've actually had to like pull teeth with some publishers before where they're just kind of loosey goosey on the contract apparently. But I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> I need that contract. You know, um, even though we have a good working relationship and I trust you and everything. So as far as page rate goes, I just need to know what I'm doing um, and how much time it's going to take me. And I need to let them know how much time it's going to take me to do it. Um, so they can properly uh, set that up. But it it just depends. If it's something that's fast for me, like if I do an anthology uh, and it's a paid anthology, um, usually my page rate is pretty low because I can, you know, do like a short story in a week you know, but if we're talking about issues or a graphic novel, that's a lot more time. So the page rate for me goes up, even though it's more like consistent work. Um, but it's just, if it's more time, it's just more money. That's how I look at it. Makes sense. Um, Wendy, before you answer, I think there's a question specifically for you. Curious what AWBW's agreement is for when a work is re-released i.e. just the initial page rate back when or a new cut when it comes out again. It, it is, I mean, it is the the initial rate because I mean, the initial rate is, is already paid and it's done, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, and how do you go about establishing what that, those initial page rates are for your particular artists? Right, well, I mean, like Adam was saying, it's it's a conversation, it's a negotiation, it's knowing it's knowing what their standard page rate is and um, balancing that with what our budget is for the book and seeing if we can swing it. It's, it's, really, it's a very simple equation. Uh, there's another side to independent um, negotiations too. Uh, so, uh, you know, Mario Candelaria and I, uh, we are putting together Jenny Reagan, like we mm -hmm. mentioned earlier. And that was like, so a lot of times artists will get a page rate, but in this case, he and I are really friendly. And uh, um, we said, okay, we're gonna split, you know, the profits between us, you know? So instead of me getting a page rate, you know, we're splitting the pot profits from the comic when it does come out. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it does require more work from me upfront without getting paid. But if it's something that I feel good about, and I do feel good about this one, then you know that's something I'm more willing to do, and hope for the good stuff to come through in the end. You know, um, and then that goes on. Our agreement goes on forever and always. So like, if we make a movie, you know, I don't, I don't but if we make a movie, you know, I get ha half and he gets half. You know, of what we would make. You know, so we're just um, there's different ways of negotiating too. It's not always just about like the money for the page, but like you know. IP ownership and things like that. Okay. Uh, what steps, there's a question, what steps should self-publishers take to promote their work? Well, we're actually gonna get to that in the third question, third major question. So we're gonna hold on to that. Um, right, and just before we get to that, there's one other aspect of the, just the team management that I wanted to touch on, which is Comic books are different than other types of collaborative art in that um, they are geographically dispersed. Like people making the same theatrical production kind of have to be in the same city and work in the same playhouse. Same thing with a movie, same thing if you're like a band or anything else. But comics is different because like you said, Wendy, your artists, your writers could be all around the world. So how is it you actually deal with that management challenge when you're talking about people who have 
different time zones, different schedules, different styles, different, they're just all over the world. How do you actually like manage that in the project management piece of building a comic? Periodic check-ins, lots of emails that start with just checking in. <laughs> um, <laughs> come on. <laughs> you didn't ghost uh, me, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, exactly, exactly. I mean, yes, that's happened. It's happened to me more with artists and it's happened to me with men, I can tell you that. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> just saying. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's. Um, I, I I think that it boils down again to clear expectations, and um, you know, it can be uh, it, not necessarily in the contract per se, but it can be laid out in the beginning discussion as to like, okay, on this date I would like to see the layouts, and then on this date I would like to see some process um, work. You know, so so it's not just like. I'm soliciting you for a project and then, you know, three months later, I expect the, the final product, you know, there's like mm. conversation, um, expected conversation in between. Okay. Okay. And is that, do you actually also build in, I think you mentioned it before, buffers in the production schedule itself to yeah. actually deal with the fact that some people, even if they're not ghosting you, even if just life gets in the way or you know, the world happens to be hit by a pandemic or something, you build something into the production schedule, maybe not to take into account a pandemic, but take into account a certain amount of extra time. So you're not running up because comics is in large part an industrial process where one thing happens after the other, builds in time between those steps. Because I also, I also like to, and I guess this like stems back to having been you know, a professor for a lot of years, you know, this, I like to reward <laughs> good behavior. I like to reward when people actually come to me and say, actually, I need some more time. You know, like mm -hmm. that's fine. I like that communication and I build into the schedule some leeway for being able to give someone more time if they need it. What I don't like is if they don't communicate to me at all and then we get up to the deadline and I haven't heard anything from them and then they're being avoidant because they, they know that they've like crossed that line you know? Well, yeah, it makes it makes a lot of sense. Now, Adam, I know you were dealing with a lot of people who all yeah. had busy schedules and were all working for free and yeah. were all around the world. So how, from a management, just a product management and a schedule management standpoint, how did you actually deal with that? Especially since you said you are an artist most of the time, not the one who's actually publishing the book. Yeah, so for, for The Good Fight, um, I had Michael Perlman helping me with um, production management. So what okay. we would do is we'd be like, okay, here's our actual deadline for say, you know, pencils. Mm -hmm. And, um, but then, you know, here's where we're gonna tell everybody it is, you know, just to give us that buffer. Mm -hmm. um, I'm giving this secret because I'm never doing this again. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but you know, and and we also we also uh, I think we were really good about um, keeping the excitement there, because even though we were talking about racism, we were excited that we were doing something about it. And mm -hmm. if we if we could keep that excitement level up, everybody that signed on was excited. If we could keep them that excited as the moment when they signed up throughout the production process, then. Um, you know, it, and it worked, it worked out really well. I only had one person um, just not get back to me out of 150. So um, uh, yeah, and, and the way we did that was uh, we kind of slowly announced who was joining. So like, we'd be like, okay, we got Greg Rucka, you know, we got Mark Wade, like, but so it wasn't just like all at once. It was like, we gave him a little bit, a little bit. So people were just, you know, the the team was just like getting more and more excited the bigger this thing grew. Um, yeah. I don't know if we did that intentionally, I don't even remember now, but it worked, whatever, <laughs> the way okay. we did it. Um, so yeah, we just kept them excited. and Everybody was pretty uh, communicative with us. Okay. Well, that should actually is a good way to lead us into our last um, topic before we open it up for questions. How, once the book is well into production and you have your street date and you have your solicitation, how do you go about maximizing 
the interest for the general public in the books that you're coming out with so that you can then maximize the sale so that you could either a like in your case adam get the money that you want to collect for charity or b like in your case wendy is charity and you know trying to maintain a profitable business model so how do you go about engaging the public to kind of in raise interest to raise sales in the book um, Wendy, why don't you start okay go ahead <laughs> i'm sorry was that me yes yeah. okay yes um well you know i think it's very important to get each of the participants in a project to be really excited about it and to uh to advertise it on their own social media mm -hmm. first and foremost i think it's helpful when you have um participants who are coming from different camps or who are geographically diverse because then they can kind of hit their demographics mm -hmm. um we also make book trailers so I think that, that that can be helpful because it's another medium in which to introduce the work. And you know, for the most part, people enjoy watching, watching something as opposed to reading something. Mm -hmm. um, we try to hit all the social media platforms. So you know, we don't just stick to Instagram and we don't just stick to Twitter. So you know, we try to do, do a bit of a, um, a scatter blast, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. and we certainly try to do as many interviews as possible um, around the release of books, in and around the release of books. And, um, you know, in this past year, since we signed with Diamond Distribution, we also have a book publicist. So um, in, in that Jesse Post, and he's great. And in the book trade, you apparently need a nine months leeway so, so that, you know, your publicist can get the whole machine going. Mm -hmm. and get the reviews and uh, get all the trade papers and, and, and all of that going. So it's, it's, a, it's a really different window into how the business can work on just a slightly different sliver of it. You know, mm -hmm. because when we were just selling direct, when we were just doing Kickstarters, it, of course, the, uh, the time between um, having it in the can and having it released was much shorter. But, you know, what? now it's like, we have a year mm -hmm. because of all of this extra machinery. It's it's uh, pretty illuminating. Yeah, it's a, it's actually sounds very similar to um, film and television releases because mm -hmm. a film might be in a can for like a year, and then I mean, well, the first marketing starts when they actually announce a film is greenlit in a lot of cases. Then they'll announce like pre-production. They'll announce pr principal production, and then even when it's in the can, that's when you'll hear the interviews starting. That's when you'll see like the first of several trailers and the posters and everything else. So it seems like you're right in comics and in those, that kind of visual media, there's a lot more, there's a lot more builds up than people might expect. Adam, did you have the same kind of experience when you were working on Good Fight? Yeah, I had a lot of fun uh, getting people excited. <laughs> um, uh, you know, it was like with, with an anthology, you obviously have all these different art styles, you know, so just like, um, just like with like releasing names in a timely way, like on uh, Kickstarter, you know, you also release these images of the art that's being produced for the book too. And and just doing that was, I don't know, it, I felt like people were having just as much fun looking at it as I was when I was getting it in my email box. Um, so um, I think my general, my app, my genuine uh, enthusiasm for the project uh, showed is what happened and through mm. the kickstarter and people really fed off that and got got excited for the project as well so yeah we did um you know i'm of course firing off on all of the social media and uh we did some interviews like with sci-fi and i don't even know how that happened now but you know it was pretty amazing and uh you know i felt pretty good about everything um and just excited about the project um and uh, a lot of people shared it at the time. Um, they were really excited for it too. So yeah, it's a, it's a whole nother game from creation to putting it out there. Um, mm -hmm. But I think if you feel really good about it, it comes a lot easier too, you know? Well, then it sounds like a lot of it comes full circle. I mean, when you're thinking about what kind of project you're going to put out into the world, you have to think about, is this something that really I'm going to get excited about? So then when it's time to actually release it, that excitement actually translates into 
how you're actually presenting it to the world. But if you're just putting out something to fill up shelf space and you don't really care about it, it's going to come out. Yeah. And people are not going to like respond in the same way. Um, it looks like we only have 10 minutes, so we should open up the floor for questions. There is one question that I see that I will um, take immediately. Uh, I have a question about starting your own comic book company. I looked all over and I can't find the business structure of one. So what would the structure look like? That almost sounds like a plant that my publicist put in because it's a direct it's a way for me to directly plug my new book, um, the business of independent comic book publishing. Because in the book, one of the things that we talk about in the pre-production process is what type of company you want to set up and how that company is going to impact the way your business runs. So whether you set up a corporation or a limited liability company or a partnership or you don't set up anything. Each one of those will have tax implications. They will have control implications. They will have liability implications. When you're talking about what kind of company you want to make and what kind of books you want to put out, whether you're putting out original books, whether you're putting out Kickstarters, whether you're like licensing pre-existing intellectual property and then putting that into comic book format, if you're going to make graphic novels or you're going to make um, single issues or you're going to make web comics, all of those are decisions that you make in the pre-production process that actually flow directly into how the books will be produced, how the books will actually be released and how you actually go about um, making money. So there's a lot of different elements that go into those decisions and all of those decisions and all of those elements are actually broken down in the book. So thank you for the question because it was a very good way for me to plug things and seem genuine. Um, the next question is, how do you handle merchandise, t-shirts, pins, et cetera? Um, Adam, I'm gonna let you start with that because I know when I ordered, when I um, backed the Kickstarter, I got some nice swag out of it. So how did you actually yeah. go about doing that? So um, uh, I'm actually putting a, a Kickstarter together now for uh, an unannounced project. So I'm gonna talk about uh, how I'm doing it right now, as opposed mm -hmm. to before, because I didn't know what I was doing yet. Um, <laughs> but now I have a little bit better of an idea. So um, we're building this Kickstarter from the ground up and we have an idea as to what kind of swag we want to put out there, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's buttons, t-shirts, things like that, things that we think that will fit the project and that people will actually want. Um, mm -hmm. So one of the things we've just built right into the budget is how can we buy that? And then, so we're going to, um, there's lots of online vendors for any type of thing you could ever make uh, with, you know, a custom image on there. Um, and we're finding out the cost of those things and what it would look like to uh, buy enough of them and bake it into, you know, our Kickstarter and then send them out. So we are just looking at it right now as, what kinds of things do we want? We've got them priced uh, and we have, it's also good to know, not just with the swag, but with your book on Kickstarter. Uh, mm -hmm. If you sell 200 copies of the book, how much does 200 copies cost versus how much does 600 or a thousand copies uh, cost mm -hmm. for printing a book? Because the price of each unit goes down as you go up in units. Um, so you need to know all of those things because you you have no idea really like how many backers you're going to get for your book or for your buttons or for your t-shirts or whatever it is. So um, it's a lot of math, uh, but it's basic math. So I think anybody can do it. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's how that's how we're handling it right now. Okay. And Wendy, I know from a wave blue world, I have a tote bag and I think I have something else. So how did you go out? Oh, see t-shirts, t-shirts, natural plug. <laughs> there you go. Um, how did you go about with the, how did the economics of that work? And is it, do, do, for your company, is it primarily branding for the publishing company itself or for each individual project? Is there um, merchandise or things that go along with that? Well, so far we've only done branding for the company itself. And okay. um, generally um, stuff like t-shirts and buttons and stickers, that's stuff for retailers. You know, we're, we're doing more mm -hmm. and more retailer outreach and retailers love to to have these little extras. We also mm -hmm. do tend to 
sell a bit of that stuff at conventions, but now conventions are no longer a thing. So they're going to be, you know, they're going to be sent to retailers for the most part. I love this idea, Adam, of doing individual swag for individual books. I think I might steal that, dude. Is that cool? Oh, please do. Yeah, I didn't. I don't think I came up with it, so it's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he definitely did not come up with it. Tiny, tiny note, like. CF Adam Ferris. <laughs> I get a cut uh, right up a contract, Kamal. Thanks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sure I, I'm sure we could work something out. That's yeah. fine. Um, there's another question. How are you doing retailer outreach? Are you going to trade shows, for example? Yeah, not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Phone calls. I think it's an I think it's a nice break. Honestly, mm -hmm. like uh, I know it, it hurts a lot of people and stuff, but I think if we can ever get this pandemic licked and we get back to business and we can go to shows again, it's going to be huge. Like once that finally happens, the, mm -hmm. the consumer is going to be so hungry for it. They're going to mm -hmm. buy so much stuff. They're going to want everything they can while they can get it because you never know when this will happen again. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that day. It's just going to be fun for everybody you know i think we were reaching a point with show with conventions that uh you know it was a little oversaturated uh you know every state had like a dozen every year you know mm -hmm. and it was getting to a point to where i would go to a major show in detroit not motor city and it, there'd be like nobody there but there's a lot of huge creators and stuff people just got you know the, there's other things that come up so yeah, I yeah, think I mean, it's going to be good when it comes back. It became exhausting. There were just too many per season. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the good thing is, because I'm in New York, you said there was 12 in every state. There was usually 12 in New York, so I didn't have to go very far. I'll just go <laughs> to that 12, and i like, okay, I'm done. It's fine. Wow. New York's a uh, special place, though. <laughs> mm, special, like, special ed? What do you mean, special place? No, it's, I love New York, so I'm not going to talk anything bad about it. <laughs> Well, I appreciate that. Um, yeah. I think that was the last question that we had. So, um, Wendy, Adam, thank you very much. I appreciate you. your insight and your thank participation. You. Um, for everybody that was listening, I hope you enjoyed it and got something from it. Up, oh, there's another question. Oh. Wait, what about all the people that are on point? Pleasure to scale back with less than um, Wendy, I think I'll let you take this one because it seems like it is a more of a long-term publisher economic question. Publishers scaling back with less employees and capital to spend on exhibitor space. Exhibitor space meaning like in stores, perhaps? Probably or at the shows. At the shows, when the shows come back, I think. I see, I see. Well, I mean, that just, that speaks to the very first point that we spoke about that um, around how do we hone in on the projects that we believe most in and how are you going to crystallize that focus and create um, you know, a, a roster of books per year that's really, really on brand, each one that you really believe in and that's gonna have legs. I mean, that just means like a separation of the wheat from the chaff even more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that makes perfect sense. All right, I think we're, we're done here, folks. Uh, everybody else, enjoy the rest of the con. Um, Adam and Wendy, um, I will call you as clients in a week or two, and everything will be fine. Thanks a lot, <laughs> folks. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Hello, hello, I guess I guess we're live. Hello. <laughs> uh, hello, everybody out there watching Mainframe Comic Con. I am Jason Inman. I'm Ashley Victoria Robinson. And, uh, you know, we got thrown into the deep end, but we're here to talk to a Mr. Cullen Bunn. I hope Mr. Cullen Bunn, there he is. Hello. Hey, how are you? How are you doing, sir? I love the hat. Oh, thank you. Uh, no, I'm doing well. I'm, I'm doing doing great. How about you? It's been a while. It has been quite a long time. I think, Cullen, you and I met on a DC Comics panel in San Diego Comic-Con 
a very, very long time ago, 2015, it 2016. Was a, it was a DC villain panel. <laughs> and I, I remember. remember this because Cullen Bunn said that he would play Starro and did an incredible star to impersonation. It's my favorite thing of all time. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I'm still waiting for that call because I still think I'd be the great, a great Starro actor. I agree. <laughs> Hashtag Cullen Bunn for Star. <laughs> right. <laughs> Oh, man. Uh, so we have like a lot to talk about with you, Colin. This is a spotlight on you. But I want before we get into this uh, too deeply, I want to talk to you. How have you been lately in the current situation, in the current pandemic? Uh, I mean, everybody I find that you talk to now has waves of ups and downs with creativity and writing. How has it been for you, sir? Yeah, it's uh, it's been tough. Uh, it's uh, the last few months, just like for everybody, have been uh, have been very difficult. And uh, you know, from a creative from a creative standpoint, it's been really tough for me as well because uh, uh, you know a lot of projects were pencils down for a while, and uh, I was still working on some things that weren't. But uh, I just uh, I had a real difficult time. Uh, actually doing the work because I was uh, even for those projects because I just didn't know that any of it mattered, <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, you know I'm getting I'm getting out of that I'm I'm starting to uh, to I'm starting to get pencils back up on some of these projects, but uh, you know I'm starting to force myself even when I don't feel like it uh, I'm starting to force myself to do the work so I'm getting caught up and and getting back uh, into the swing of things um, yeah. Well, I think that's like that's a pretty good attitude to have, and that's. I also want to talk about. I was going to bring this up towards the end, but I'm going to bring this up now because you're still running uh, the bungalow, the podcast that you do with your lovely wife, Cindy. Um, it. I, I didn't. I didn't notice any mics down on that. I, you guys are still releasing episodes here and there. We are. We had a few. We had a few weeks where we just didn't feel like doing that either. But yeah, for the most part, we're uh, we're still moving moving ahead on it. Uh, uh, in fact, I just made a note to myself a little bit ago. We got to record a new episode uh, in the next couple of days. So nice. How does your wife Cindy feel about being podcast famous? Oh yeah, she. I'm sure that's. I, I'm sure she feels that uh, it's gone to her head. She's just. Uh, <laughs> she's so full of herself now. She's got a writer now. You have to have seltzer <laughs> for her before she'll show up. That's right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, we uh, we are very pro working with your special person. So. <laughs> well, you know, you know, it's fun. It's a it's a good way for us to. You know, she's not really a, a huge comic book uh, fan, and and honestly, I don't know that we're into a lot of the same things. So this is a good way for us to, you know, to spend some time and talk about some stuff. And, uh, you know, she can make fun of me a little bit, which is fun, <laughs> for, fun for everyone. Um, so I would be remiss to have a Cullen Bunn panel without taking you back to the far past uh -oh. of Wild West. Because I will never have you on a panel and not talk about the Six Gun, one of my favorite comic books of all time. Um, now... I know you're like working on Shadowlands right now, which is sort of, um, you know, connected, but right. not like typical Spiritually sequel. connected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, is there, looking back at Six Gun and that it's still in print, you can still find it. Uh, every once in a while, we get an announcement of a pilot coming here and there. Right. Um, what, as a creator, looking back at that sort of, I'm going to say monumentous series, what sticks out to you? Like what, what happy positive memory or story beat or moment from that entire series creation still sticks with you? Man, that's a, that's a tough one. So, so the six gun was such uh, for, for Brian hurt and for myself and for Bill Crabtree, it was lightning in a bottle for us. I mean, I, I am the most critical person about my work that there can possibly be. I mean, most of the time I hate everything I do. Mm -hmm. uh, the Six Guns book, I'm not going to be modest about it. Every issue is a winner in that series. I think every <laughs> issue is good. Uh, I think Brian Hurt and I have both said this, uh, maybe publicly, but definitely to each other. It's a masterclass in storytelling. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's just, a, I mean, it's a book that we were all very proud of. Every issue uh, we were, I mean, it was full-blown collaboration. Every issue we were all talking. We wanted to tell the best story we could. And... And we wanted to put everything into it. So just from a uh, from from that perspective, it was just a book that we you know, it was such a fun book to work on because we really we were all really engaged with the material. Um, and 
it is a book that when we put the first six issues out, we didn't know how much of a series we'd get. We mm-hmm. had a plan for 50 issues. Um, and to me, it's it's a it's an amazing world where a creator owned series like that can get can go the run that it wants to. You know, we were able to do everything we wanted to do with that series. It's a small miracle if any independent series can make it past 20 issues now. They well, make it past really, six, yeah. six, to um, be honest. Yeah, but yeah. It, when they make the uh, six gun omnibus someday, um, I really right. hope they take that quote where it's like every page is a master class of comics. <laughs> yeah. Dash Look, right on bun. The cover. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think you can. Bl- I guess you could blurb your own book, you but can, it's probably my friend. <laughs> You can blurb whoever you want on your own book. It doesn't matter. That's true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ashley, uh, I know you wanted to ask Colin some questions about uh, the lovely Harrow County. Uh, yes, because I love anything with witches <laughs> and you put witches in that. Uh, but I'll ask you something a little more uh, uh, combining of all your works first. Everything that you do definitely has a very heavy horror influence. Everything from Helheim, which I also really love, mm-hmm. to Six Gun to Harrow County. What is it like for you melding horror with these other genres? Like Westerns specifically have very specific tropes that you have to hit or it's not a Western. Right. (laughs) Well, you know, uh, I think when I look back at the, at the horror material that I really liked, like when I was first reading stories and, uh, you know, reading horror stories, I love anything that, that fuses genres in general. So, I mean, I just, I, the very first thing I ever sold to, for publication was a short story uh, that was, that was a, a, a horror Western story. Now it never got published. The magazine that bought it folded before they published the story. Oh, we know what your next Kickstarter is going to be. Right. Um, <laughs> but that was, it, it, it's probably for the best. It wasn't a great story. <laughs> Think about it. it very, you it should put it on your Patreon long. soon. It yeah. was very early on, but I just like uh, I like the idea of embracing the tropes, as you said, of those different genres like gangster or, mm-hmm. you know, fantasy or, or superhero or Western. And then throwing uh, some horror into the mix and seeing how that turns everything on its ear is uh, it's just a lot of fun for me. What and, is, oh, and if it's ahead. not fun, you shouldn't be doing it. Yeah. That absolutely yeah. that. Fair. Uh, one of the things that I love so much about Harrow County is the confrontation between Emmy and Cammy at various points. I'm trying not to spoil too much of it because it is one of your newer works. But was there ever any thought about their relationship maybe being one person's internal or was it always going to be two people facing off against each other? Um, to some degree, it was always going to be two people. It was always going to be the evil twin. Kind yeah, of yeah. But, Spoilers, uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, that's all right. I mean, it's just that happens in the first arc. So, I mean, you know, she shows up pretty early in the series. But uh, but there was always some discussion uh, that it kind of represents that internal struggle because mm-hmm. uh, because Emmy, our lead, is very conflicted about uh, who she is, who she's going to become. Uh, but but yeah, from a pulpy standpoint, I always wanted it to be the evil, the evil twin that was actually a physical manifestation. I also can't get over all of the haints that populate the county because they're so creepy cute. And like Priscilla just got a plushie, which I thought was very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, uh, and a lot of that goes to Tyler Crook. I mean, he loves designing uh, monsters. And I think the only thing he likes more than creepy monsters is cute monsters <laughs> and uh and and priscilla you know she she ends up playing a, a big role in the series and she has an even bigger role in uh tales of harrow county yeah. uh, which is the the new mini the sort of the series of mini series we're doing um she was always intended just to be a sort of a one-shot thing she was going to appear in a couple of issues and be done but we but i liked her so much after i saw tyler's designs i i couldn't let her go Nice. You've mentioned uh, your artistic collaborators a lot and what they like to draw. As a writer, do you try to take in mind, oh, they like to draw this or, oh, they don't like to draw that when you're thinking about who's going to populate your worlds? I'm sorry no, to run over the comment it, that was brought up. We'll get to it. We'll get to it. <laughs> if, I, if I thought too much about that, Six Gun wouldn't have had a single horse in it the entire time. <laughs> Ryan Hurt <laughs> hates drawing horses. So, I mean, he just hates them. Uh, so... Uh, I mean, I do, I consider it, you know, I, t- I take it into consideration, especially if the, if the artist and I are working very closely early on, mm-hmm. we'll talk about the things they might want to draw or see in the book. And, um, but, uh, 
but no, I mean, I can't not, you know, if it's part of the story, it's got to be in the story. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why Brian draws horses and chains, two things he can't stand drawing. And the six gun was loaded with both. It loaded with a lot of chains and six yeah. gun. Well, Brian's not here, so I'm going to say, Brian, that's your fault. <laughs> so just signing on to a Western. Uh, we do have a great comment here. An Englishman in San Diego says, three of my favorite people in comics. Oh, thank you. Uh, looking forward to getting Cullen on my podcast on the road. Is there any genre you've tackled that you that you haven't tackled that you'd like to? Uh, you know, I've been very fortunate that uh, that I've kind of gotten to do a lot of the things I want to do. I mean, I, I've been able to to address my bucket list in in many ways. Mm -hmm. I think I'd I'd like to do some more science fiction, uh, especially science fiction fused with horror. I'm doing some. I, I've got a book with Oni right now called Rogue Planet. And that I think is just the tip of the iceberg for the kind of thing I'd like to do in, mm -hmm. in that, you know, in those genres. Well, the other thing I like, Colin, about your career is that you don't wait on anybody to tell you what to do. And your Patreon is very active. Um, you're very active on Kickstarter. And you are doing this comic book that is free forever. It, it's called Deepest Catacombs. Um, right. it's, it's on your Patreon as well. And it's sort of like D and D can you, well, you can explain it way better than I can, but I think this well, is fascinating. So when I was a kid, I, uh, I, Dungeons and Dragons was a big part of my childhood. I loved the game and D and D had these ads that would run in comics and they were one page comic strips mm -hmm. and they had a certain group of characters who were going from, you know, from month to month, they'd be in, you know, different adventures. And I love those comic strips so much. In some cases, I loved it as much as the comic that they appeared in. And those have stuck with me for for uh, for years. And uh, I was looking looking at them the other day, looking at some of them. I found them online or it's been a few months now. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be fun to tell sort of an epic fantasy story to introduce new characters and everything, but to tell them in one page ads for a game that never existed? So uh, I came up with this concept, Deepest Catacombs, the role-playing game, and every every page of this bigger story is drawn by a different artist. Mm -hmm. uh, it tells a continuing story, but it's all presented as these ads for a role-playing game, which introduced some interesting challenges in writing. Uh, but it's you know it's been a lot of fun, and uh, and yeah, it's the first wave of those is going to be about twenty-five pages. And, uh, and artists are working on all 25 right now. Someone's wow. working on a page. So, uh, and yeah, I'm posting them for free on my Patreon. So anyone can read them. Uh, and then uh, as a fun aside, I'm creating gaming material that will go to patrons only. So if you see a spell, a uh, wizard casts a spell in one of the, uh, the episodes, that spell will be detailed for rope for gamers. They can put that spell in their uh, Dungeons and Dragons campaign. That is so cool. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. And uh, the first two have gone up. The first two chapters have gone up. And it's just it's great to work with these uh, these artists. Some are, are artists that I have just met in doing this project. They, they're kind of just getting established. Others are artists I've worked with many, many times. Nice. Uh, now, is there any idea or any plan right now to collect these maybe together somewhere down the line, maybe a Kickstarter or? Yeah, maybe. Uh, I mean, it, that's always that kind of stuff's always in the back of my mind. But right now. Uh, as much as I was saying earlier that I've had trouble getting motivated to write, that was something fun that isn't making me any money. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but that was the stuff I was like, oh, I can work on this. I, I'm excited to work on this. That's so crazy. You should take like all the ideas of these characters in these games, and you guys should literally record a podcast D and D game of your yeah. characters. That'd be fantastic. I've thought, of, I've thought about that too. It's one, of, you know, with every every project I work on, I can't help but think you know all these different things to do with it and i probably get a little carried away with it mm -hmm. it's th that way with writing but it's also that way with you know these side projects and additional material and crunchy bits mm -hmm. crunchy bits crunchy bit. <laughs> i like that description yeah. a lot <laughs> yeah i usually hear it called chuffa like <laughs> yeah. yeah that's so funny um so cullen i want to ask you um i saw a tweet very recently um, or somewhere I may not have been on Twitter, but Marvel uh, Comics tweeted out talking about your Magneto run. And they asked you to like answer on your Magneto run. And that got to me to think because you are one of these writers. You've worked on so many DC characters and so many Marvel characters. I mean, you, uh, you did multiple runs on the X-Men, I believe. Am I correct on this? 
Yeah. So yeah, I, I did Magneto and then mm-hmm. they ended that series and that became, and then I was, uh, I took over uncanny X-Men and then mm-hmm. when that ended, I took over X-Men blue. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. A few. And X-Men blue was a great read. Everybody out there. If you've not read this anymore, I really, really liked it a lot. Um, is there anything from your Marvel and DC, your big two work that stands out to you that you like just really enjoyed? Is it Magneto or is it Sinestro or um, like what stands out to you that you're like really proud of from that time? Yeah. So uh, I was working on Sinestro and Magneto at the same time. And that <laughs> was really, to, to me, that was probably my high, the high point of my career. I mean, I love for Marvel and DC. I loved working on those characters uh, I've made it no secret that uh, I would still be writing Sinestro and Magneto today if that had been, you know, the way comics shake out. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I was very proud of both of those books. Uh, I, you know, I created a lot of characters, especially at Marvel that I, I really have fond memories of and I'm, I'm happy with. And I was just I just did a recording uh, with Marvel about Fearless Defenders, which mm-hmm. is a, another book that I have real fond memories of because that book uh, meant something to a lot of people. I mean, it's still a book that I get a lot of people coming up to me at conventions and things like that. They really, uh, it, it meant something to them. So that book, uh, while I don't think it's necessarily as strong of a book as Magneto, uh, is a book that uh, I have a lot of fond uh, connections to. That's but also yeah. a, a book that uh, really popped off when the Marvel Netflix uh, series yeah. came yeah. off. Uh, Fearless Defenders was one that I know we were recommending to a lot of people. So that's yeah. so nice to hear. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, there's from a from a strictly fan perspective, perspective, writing Uncanny X Men meant uh, a great deal to me because uh, as a as a young collector, my dad was never into comics, but one of the things he loved to do was collect comics with me. He loved to go to conventions. He loved to barter with dealers and. And we collected Uncanny X Men together, and we built a we built a run of the series from issue one to whatever was current at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and regretfully, I sold those comics to pay for college. Um, and uh, and so, but writing Uncanny X Men, I, I w- my dad did not live long enough to see me write it, but I know he would have been proud of the the fact that I was writing that book. That's awesome. Colin, that story's a that's a screenplay right there. <laughs> or that's that's your autobiographical comic right there. You right. and your dad, and then your ascension to Uncanny X-Men. That's amazing. Right. I'm 12 um, issues away from recollecting the run. Are you really? Uh, yes. Oh wow. So I don't have my dad's money to help me or my dad's <laughs> ability to my dad was a salesman. He was a door-to-door salesman. He was, you know, dyed in the wool sales so he could negotiate uh really well. I don't have that uh, ability. That, that ability. <laughs> well, any retailers watching or watching in future uh, hit Colin up with some good deals on Uncanny X Men. <laughs> right. right. Uh, we've talked a bit about your influences and what's brought you great joy in comics. And then we've hinted at the Patreon and some of the other stuff that you do, but you are someone who really gives a lot back to your community. And you're so kind to, I see people on Twitter and Jason and I have asked you for advice in the past. Like, how do you do this? So is there any standard advice that if anyone listening wants to be the next Cullen Bunn campaigning to play Starro that you'd like to pass on? (laughs) Well, first of all, I don't want anyone taking over my role as Starro. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah. You know, it's, it's a, it's interesting to me because uh, I struggled to break in in comics. It, it was very difficult for me, and it took me a long time. And you guys, uh, you touched on it a little bit ago when you said I don't. You don't wait around uh, for someone to approve what you want to do, and and that's it. You, if you want to do comics, don't wait for permission. I mean, do your own thing. Do comics, and that's really you know. I was sending out pitch after pitch of you know, Ghost Rider and Spider-Man and Etrigan and the Demon. I was sending out numerous pitches and getting nowhere. And what finally got me some traction in comics was I did my own thing. I did mm-hmm. The Damned. I did The Tooth. I did The Six Gun. And those books, which were 1,000% me on the page as far as the writing, um, those got the attention of editors and publishers who then started offering me the the opportunity to work on other projects. And I love 
you know, I love all these characters that I grew up reading. I love Marvel characters. I love DC characters. But make no mistake, and you guys know this, there's no comparison when it comes to creating your own story that is you. Yeah. And and that's the stuff that will that's how you that's how you break in. So that's just it. If you you've got a story you want to tell, don't wait for some publisher to tell you, okay, I will publish it. Start telling it. You know, mm -hmm. there are plenty of options. Now more than ever, there are plenty of options for you to create your own, you know, to create your own story. I'd love to ask you too now to to uh, pick between your children. Who's your favorite original bun character? Oh, come on. <laughs> is it the horse? The horse. Yeah, which horse is it? Which, which horse? Which snake is it? I mean, if you were going to. All right. So I can tell you. I can tell you. I was just, if you're going to tell me to pick between books, it's tough to pick between favorite okay. books. Uh, but Bill John O'Henry from The Six Gun is one of my favorite characters. Yes. That's my is, favorite character from The Six Gun. Which is why. Which is why I am so terribly, terribly cruel to him in the comic. Uh, I am most, I'm most awful to uh, to all of my uh, all my favorite characters. I remember it, too, like from the beginning. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Bill, John, Bill John's a sweetheart, and and I love him. And I remember when when uh, NBC was shooting <laughs> shooting the pilot for the series uh, way back when. Uh, Michael Gross was playing Bill John, and uh, oh wow! And he, he of all the people who were cast, his costume was perfect. I mean, he looked like Bill John. Uh, and I remember I was such a fan of the movie Phantasm Two, which he played in, <laughs> that I didn't want to mention it to him because I wasn't sure if he had fond memories of a Phantasm Two or not. And I was sitting in a saloon on the set. And there were all these extras dressed as cowboys and saloon girls and everything. They were walking around. And Bill John and I were sitting at a table together. And Brian, knowing that I was nervous about asking this, goes up and says, hey, one of Cullen's favorite movies is Phantasm 2. And then he walked off. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and Bill John clapped me on the shoulder. I was like, ha! And we talked about Phantasm for a little while. And that was a, that's a great memory for me. It's talking Phantasm 2 with Bill John O'Henry. Oh, wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, so I want to ask you, you are working on a series that's going to come out next month. Uh, a little bit of a license work. Cyberpunk 2077 Trauma Team number one hits from Dark Horse next month. Um, yeah. So I want to ask you, what's it like? Because Cyberpunk 2077 is pretty high profile video game. Uh, do you know all the secrets of cybernetic Keanu that no one else knows? <laughs> and what, what's it what's it like working on a a I'm going to say a I'm going to say a high profile licensed book? You know, it's a it's it it has been an interesting project um, because uh, I've I've gotten some secrets on Cyberpunk 2077, mm -hmm. and I remember playing. They Cyberpunk. haven't given you the game yet. <laughs> no, no, I tried. <laughs> I tried to get a beta, but that didn't fly. Um, and I remember playing the cyberpunk role-playing game way back when, uh, when it was 2020 or whatever, <laughs> it was, you know, time is, time has passed on now. Um, but there were a lot, it, it's interesting because, uh, I pitched several different ideas for that series, things that I thought would be, uh, interesting introductions to the cyberpunk world. Mm -hmm. And trauma team wasn't my first pick. I wasn't, I liked that idea, but I didn't think that was the, the, the one that they would gravitate to. I thought that was when they brush over and go for one of the more, uh, you know, the higher octane. Ideas. One with horses and chains in it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they, they picked trauma team, which uh, was interesting because they really wanted to showcase a different, uh, different take on the characters and the world and, and really focus on some of the emotional beats and, uh, and, uh, it's it's been a fun project. It's just that uh, you know there are times I write things into it and they'll come back and say, "Well, that doesn't fit into the mythology of the world. And you're gonna have to take it out, you know, or something like that." Like I had a guy with a chainsaw, chainsaw arms, or something. You know, <laughs> that, oh, they, make, they, make pull that back. They, they said that doesn't fly in in our mythology. So, oh, interesting. Uh, That's so really cool. Has, I like that because that was that like get your chainsaw guy. Sorry to interrupt you. I apologize. No, um, right. it, it like it just reminds. It's that sort of like perfect 
Cullen Bun. Like, like if I were to say, if somebody were to say, what is C Cullen Bun's flavor? I'd be like, yeah, probably a guy with chainsaw arms. <laughs> yeah. So like that's like the perfect mix of cyberpunk and Cullen Bun. Every, <laughs> everything I do, I'd put chainsaw arms in it. And, and it's, it's <laughs> fun because my son and I were walking around the neighborhood the other day and he's excited about cyberpunk 2077. And I said, well, you know, I'm writing the comic tie in. And he wasn't impressed. <laughs> but, uh, it's like, whatever, dad. I got to describe trauma team to him. And he thought trauma team sounds really cool because they are, you know, it's yeah. what if EMTs were heavily armed and will shoot you if you get in their way. It's a, uh, you know, it's interesting. So Colin blink once if Keanu is in your comic and blink twice. If that's a violation of your NDA. <laughs> <laughs> It's interesting that you brought up mythology, though, and that getting notes that you were violating the sort of in-universe mythology, because I do think of you as somebody who plays very heavily with mythology, like Helheim being the most obvious example. But mm -hmm. one of the things that I really responded to in Harrow County is the different types of witchcraft practices that the different characters use, because I love witches. And I thought I think that's so smart. So I think that's very interesting that you were told you were violating mythology. <laughs> well, you know, it, it worked, and it, I expected a lot more, honestly, because I just kind of took it and ran. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. and I took what I knew from, you know, the materials they sent me. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was a lot of stuff that they didn't, uh, they, they that I thought was going to get a uh, red flag dropped, but uh, they let me go ahead on with it. Um, and I'm always, you know, I, I always want to try to expand the worlds, whether mm -hmm. they're my stories or others, I want to do something I, if I can to expand those worlds. And I'm always a little surprised when, uh, you know, when I get when the licensors let me do that. You know, <laughs> like Star Wars, I thought Star Wars is going to be a nightmare to work mm -hmm. on the, the two books I did in the Star Wars universe um, because I, it's just such a big, high profile thing. But they were Lucasfilm was awesome to work with, and not you know when I throw these weird ideas out and they say yes and and they give me other ideas to expand on it, which is you know that's the nature of collaboration. That's that was uh, just an awesome way to work. Well, I want to throw out to everybody that's watching us live right now. This is going to be your last chance to get any questions for Colin in before we wrap up. So shoot them in now. We will answer them. Uh, Colin, I noticed on your Twitter recently. Uh -oh. You shared a picture <laughs> of something called Tales of, and we couldn't see the rest of it. I don't know what that was. I don't know so what that could I'm gonna have been. I'm going to a little bit and ask you for some hints there. What is, what is, what do we got coming? Can you give us anything here? Uh, I can tell you, I did this on a live stream the other night and I haven't taken it down yet. There is a hint to what that Tales of is dun, dun, on the dun, shelf dun. behind me. So, uh, that's a lot and of stuff in those shelves. Right? Far away. <laughs> but there is. Oh, you blow it up? That's not. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> That's cheating. Um, so, I bet uh, someone has, has freeze framed it. Someone yep. has that. It's a striped pillow, I know. <laughs> yeah, it's a striped pillow, yeah. Uh, so and, uh, I, I don't think the Tales of will be that big of, of a surprise for anybody. It's not okay. a, it, it, it's a, it's a, it, it's not a shocker. So. Tales of Starro. Yeah, Tales of Starro. So, <laughs> Starro. Uh, an Englishman in San Diego says, how much do you map out mythology of the books you write ahead of putting pen to paper, or do you discover the world as you write? Uh, that's a great question. And usually it's a little, uh, I'll, I'll have some ideas, but I like to leave enough wiggle room to surprise myself. Uh, so for instance, when we talk about Harrow County and all these different witches and all these different powers and this family, um, that was not planned when I first started writing the book. They came, they came to, to be over the course of, of writing the story. Uh, with the sixth gun, I knew where the story would end at issue 50, but we didn't, you know, and we had milestones along the way that, that kind of informed the mythology, but we still left enough of it, uh, that we could have some surprises. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. For X Men Blue, for something like X Men Blue, um, or your Uncanny X Men run, um, did you ever did you keep everything close to your vest? Where you're like, okay, I'm only going to plan this six issues at a time because, I mean, modern big two comics are always like, well, who knows when the plug is going to get pulled? When's the next event? Yeah, <laughs> I I wish I had that uh, filter where I could just plan six issues, but I had I probably had. I probably had 50 or 60 issues of Magneto in mind before I knew that the world was going to end as part of Secret Wars. Yeah. 
Um, I had, you know, I had tons of stuff planned. Um, and even X Men Blue, I knew I had a, a certain amount of time, and I overplanned. I had so much more material to get to. I had pitches uh, for what that series would become when it ended, and I had dreams that we would continue it on. But you know, that's not the way comics works. You know, sadly, no, not in the in the modern world. No. Well, so but I, right, always, right. I, I always <laughs> overplan, and I'm oh, yeah. always disappointed. If I, I like. Don't. I like hearing you say that you over plan though, even if you're not planning all the details, because I think that's something that as a creator starting out, you get an idea and you get it on a tear and you're like, this is going to be great. And then, you know, you get like maybe 15 pages and you're like, I got nothing. Right. <laughs> so it is, it's enlightening for me to hear that you're like, I totally knew where I was going to go and I had 50 issues planned and someday you'll get to write them. Yeah. So if you see an issue of X-Men blue that has what appears to be three or four storylines, <laughs> coming together. That's because I realized, oh, I don't have enough time to tell all these, <laughs> these stories and mash them together. Uh, Mitch Gerwitz has an excellent question here. Anything coming up for Aftershock, which I believe um, Aftershock published your uh, Knights Templar series, correct? They did. That was uh, a great yeah. book. I really enjoyed that. Well, thank you. Um, yes, uh, there are several new projects with Aftershock that just haven't been announced yet. Some, some new format stuff, some new collection stuff. Uh, and some new series. So uh, right. it, uh, there's a lot of cool stuff coming from Aftershock. An uh, Englishman in San Diego asks, what's the most positive aspect of working for the big two that you encountered? Nice uh, question. I'm going to add, that is a great question. Uh, um, we need an answer besides the paycheck, Cullen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, besides not having to fund your own book. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, there are a couple of things. One, you know, I liked working with a lot of the, these different editors. I think it's a good experience working with different. Uh, it's fun working on creator own stuff, but it stretches different muscles to work with comics that are taking stories that are taking place within a bigger universe where other you know, there are other moving pieces. And I think that's a good skill to have. I think it's a good, you know, it, it, it helps develop a, some interesting uh, approaches to problem solving. Um, and really, it exposes me to a lot of other, to the fan base. It, it opens the fan base up. Now, yes, I wish that, that people kind of looked at creator-owned comics the same way they look at the value of, you know, working on a X men book or something like that. We're back, Cullen. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, well, but yeah, magic it, forced us out of the studio. <laughs> yeah, it was you were look you were that was a cheat. You were trying to see if there were any more hints on my shelf. That's right. We were zooming in. We were zooming we in. We were hoping oh. that Keanu was going to be hiding back there somewhere. No. <laughs> I keep him locked in a different room. <laughs> you, you look. You know when locks up Keanu Reeves, he appears and disappears when he wants well, to. He is magnificent. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever you just need a dose of positivity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you're breathtaking. Oh, thank you, Keanu. <laughs> all right, I got to get over to Japan. You know, you're yeah, like, all right. <laughs> um, well, Cullen, um, I think we have, I think we are out of, basically out of time here. Um, right. Is there anything you would like the fans, people watching this panel to check out? Any new books that you can talk about that is not the Tales of Project? Um, and again, please promote the heck out of your podcast, The Bungalow, because I yeah. love I love you and Cindy on it. No, it's you know, it, it, I there are lots of new projects. If I were to pan the camera over here, you'd see a wall of projects that I'm working on. But we're I waiting. Can't talk about any of them. <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> um, so uh, the best way to keep track of what's coming out and where I'll make most of my announcements, you know, Twitter is at Cullen Bun. It's a great place to to follow me. My website, KellenBun.com. Listen to the bungalow. You can search it, and you'll see it on my website and everything. So I, I'm usually I announce new projects there a lot. Um, and yeah, that's that's where the best place to interact with me for sure. Nice, uh, everyone out there. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Jawin J A W I I N. And Ashley and I, if you like our panel, uh, we co-host a podcast called Geek History Lesson. You can find everywhere that podcasts can be put in your ear holes. Uh, Ashley, where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Ashley B. Robinson, uh, often sharing really cute pictures from Harrow County. That's right. <laughs> uh, Cullen, uh, this was a blast. Uh, thank you so much for uh, giving us a spotlight on well, your thanks for Thanks for talking with me, guys. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, and everybody out there, thank you so much for watching. And thank you to Mainframe Comic Con Live. And uh, keep watching, man. There's lots of cool stuff coming up on this stream. And we don't know when we'll disappear or reappear. But bye bye. Magic. Take care.
Hey, everybody. Welcome back. I hope you're enjoying Mainframe Comic Con. We're in the final hour of uh, day one, and I hope you've enjoyed some of the incredible, entertaining panels we've had, and this one will be no exception. John Sutras here from the Word Balloon Podcast, and uh, really happy uh, to do this uh, panel a look at Insider Out, a tremendous and Insider Out, Art, excuse me. Boy, I'll tell you, it's, uh, you can tell it's the end of the day. Uh, a great anthology uh, featuring comics, puzzles, games, recipes, a, a true uh, full house experience. And uh, joining us to talk about this, two of the great editors that uh, put this incredible anthology together. Uh, here's Chris Simon. Chris, it's a pleasure to meet you. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. And uh, our returning champion. Uh, she's got the Woo! book. Yes, she did. It's uh, John. Shel, everybody. Good to see you, Shell. I Shel. forgot my name. I've only been on. I, I've only been on your Word Balloon podcast twice, and I was a special guest at John Con. And you forget my name. No, no. You're 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 a co-host at this point, Shell. You know, I have to start sending you money. Don't kid yourself. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. <laughs> Just send Absolutely. The checks in the mail. Absolutely. So uh, we're we're talking about Insider Out, and uh, Shell, you got the props uh, ready for us, which is fantastic. I do. Oh yes, I do. Product placement shots just for you, John. <laughs> it looks great. And uh, really, this, again, it's such a tre tremendous book because uh, you've all uh, curated this incredible collection of great uh, cartoonists, great writers, and uh, they really went to town. And and it's appropriate that uh, this was put together. I mean, Shell, was the inspiration because of COVID? I mean, was it because of that? Yeah, I, I'm not going to lie. It was mostly because of COVID. And a couple months back, I realized we were going to go through the same general malaise and vitriol that we all experienced when we survived the outcome of the 2016 presidential election. And so I looked around on Twitter and social media and I saw people just grumbling and shouting and I just knew we had to come together once again and where else but put all of our amazing energy and emotions into a comic book and especially an anthology. And so, yeah, I reached out to Jen King, who was our retailer liaison, and seven other editors, including Chris Simon, who were fearless enough to take me up on the offer. It was basically, I came up with the idea of an art house. And within this house, there were eight rooms and each editor was asked to edit her own room. And that meant that there were very few rules just go out bring in the goods find the most amazing writers and artists and colorists and letterers and have at it and bring us the best in comics prose single illustration games and of course cats lots of cats absolutely yes so chris which room were you in charge of i'm in charge of the kitchen so ah. Yeah, which I volunteered for. I know there was uh, some editors who kind of had to pick what was left, but when Shelly reached out, I immediately snatched up Kitchen so that I could share all of my awesome recipes and gather in all the people I knew who loved to cook and do crafts in the kitchen and stuff and, and make it something really special. I was super excited uh, to well, do that. Better, better Chris. Better Chris than me in the kitchen because I'm a disaster. <laughs> really? John, what about you, John? Can, I'm can a killer you know? in there. You know, I, I come from restaurant people. I'm a Greek guy. So mm -hmm. uh, that was kind of part of the deal. You had to learn how to cook. And uh, dad had us in the kitchen at uh, at 12 years old. So, uh, no, I'm all right, actually. But it's great, uh, Chris. I actually have pages ready. I'll uh, I'll uh, share the screen here in just yeah. a second and uh, share some of the great art that we've got uh, from the kitchen specifically. Let me see. There it is. And so I'm going to share. There we go. So I don't know if you, Alec, if you want to isolate me, if you haven't already. And we've got uh, recipes for egg pasta mm -hmm. and how to make a quiche. Outstanding. That's great. And that's uh, Takio. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, she's great. She's She did several pages in there. Um, and those are her, her characters that are actually based on her band. She has a real life band. And so oh, that's great. Cute. Yeah, super cute. And uh, Kitchen Witch, that's awesome. And that Janet Lee, is that Janet Lee who uh, did that great book with, um, with uh, oh damn it, Jim McCann, right? Isn't that Janet Lee or no? I don't know. Is that the same one, Shelly? You know, yeah, I was going to say, it may be a different Janet Lee. I'm not sure. <laughs> I have no, I, I'm not sure this is Janet K. Lee. And this story, which is amazing, is by Gilly. Gilly. Yeah. 
And of course you can see we have cats all over the place. In yes. fact, you can yeah. even do your own counting game because there are so many cats <laughs> on every, each and every page. John, you're great. flipping through quickly. What, I'm we, sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, that's okay. We, we want, we're hoping to go through um, and just point out some of the really cool features do you want me to start at the top again, uh, Shell? Let's start at the top. Okay, the beautiful cover, of course. So, yeah, let me talk to you a little bit about the cover. So, we have this tremendous logo by Sophie Dodgson, who you may or may not know has been taking the comic industry by storm. She is the colorist on Bitter Root, which is a book that just won the Best Continuing Series Eisner this year. And Sophie is such an integral team member Sanford Green brought her into Bitter Root. And as soon as uh, I put my eyes on her glorious pages, I knew we had to pull her away and get her very involved in insider art. So not only is she the editor of The Craft Room, which is a lot of fun, she designed the logo and she also designed and put together the cover. So what you're seeing is this beautiful montage of choice panels from didn't she also do the website she did our website right she did she also did yeah. our website and john before we go any further i do want to hold up the book because while we have this available on gumroad it's i want people to understand that insider art was a labor of love everyone who contributed and there were 142 people they donated wow. their time and all proceeds from insider art available digitally on gumroad will support female and non-binary comic book retailers. So when you go to Gumroad, it's going to say suggested donation of $10, pay whatever you'd like, and this is what you get. It's hard to like understand the scope, which yeah. is why I actually put together just a few copies like you see here. But mm -hmm. it was it was necessary. We wanted a product shop because it's very easy to miscalculate what you're getting for your money when you're buying something digitally. And this is just chock full of the goods. Agreed. Absolutely. And again, uh, focusing on uh, various uh, rooms inside the, the Insider Out house. And uh, here, I'm going to go back to scrolling now. And uh, let's see here. This first story is by yes. Sarah Gordon, Idle Hands. Yes, it is, in fact. And this room, the bedroom, which we, we should stress right now, it's an all ages compendium. So this is a bedroom of fun and games. Nothing fishy, John. Don't even don't even go there. I won't this go is there. An all ages compendium. So Chrissy <laughs> Williams, who is not only a terrific editor, but she's also a poet. She not only edited this section and curated it beautifully with so many of rising star and superb British artists, I might add. Um, one of the things that I love about the book is that the outreach was tremendous. I mean, this is really a cross section of the best of the artists and writers across the globe. So I was saying to people, if you want to impress your boss and you're a comic book assistant editor or associate editor, this is it. This is how you do it in one fell swoop, $10. I mean, that's the price of like a cappuccino. Come on, sure. be real. <laughs> and you're helping support an overlooked demographic. As, as you guys know, when COVID hit, we saw a lot of people doing kind things to raise money for others. And that's great. But I didn't see anything that was specifically devoted to female and non-binary comic book retailers. So I knew we had to come together and do it. And you know, the people, I want to take this moment to thank all 142 people who were behind the scenes, who gave us their time and delivered in under three months, which is almost impossible. Yeah. Right? You, you give this to a corporate suit and it would take them two years. And I, and I would know. Yeah. Suit. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of suit, where's your hat? Yeah, I know, buddy. I'm like, I, I am, I'm, I'm like the end. I'm like yeah. the juggler that's spinning plates uh, on Ed Sullivan. Seriously, it was a well, crazy day. So I'm, I'm sorry. Have, I'm going to have to take a point off your rating already. I, I understand. I John, understand. It's 97 degrees in Los Angeles right now, now, and I'm prepared 
I've got my pin, and you forgot your hat. I, buddy, I and and my insider art pin. I, I know I suck. Yeah. I'm I'm always in. If there's an added, if there's a doghouse in the insider out house, I would be in it, and the you cats are. would be yelling at me. And you are, and you are, and we might not let you out, but we better continue because we know we're going to have to take 45 minutes here. Okay. <laughs> what we're looking at, um, if you scroll back just for a minute, I wanted to point out this amazing prose story by yeah. Angela Cleland and artist Stephanie Hans, who you all might know from Kieran Gillen's book, Die, where Stephanie is also the co-creator. Amazing comic book. What we wanted to do with Insider Art was create a compendium that pretty much had everything. I mean, of course it has comics, but it also has some other features that you're not used to seeing in comic books, graphic novels, or even comics magazines. So as we scroll through, I think we'll point those things out because I think you're going to really love it, John. I absolutely. I already have loved it. Absolutely. And uh, now we're in the basement, just like uh, the B-52s. I was going to say, all right, you just got yourself back up to a, a, a one point rating. You're out of the doghouse for the next minute. I know what I'm talking to. Absolutely. Right? Exactly. Um, this is a tr tremendous piece of artwork. Basically, the basement was co-edited by our two ingenue editors, Elizabeth Bree and Megan Brown. And I worked with both of these talented women when I was at IDW uh, working on Black Crown. And they were quick to jump in and they said, hey, we've got a day job, but we can do it together. And so we said, have at it. And they brought in such cool people to work in their chapter and their section. So this is a piece of art by Kayla Klein. And the best thing of all is this is just the chapter heading of the piece. So you've got a cat, a bit trepidatious, <laughs> walking down the stairs. Yep. The exit out of this chapter, which we don't see here, but I'm but you're gonna have to trust me on it. Okay. It's the cat racing back up the stairs because the cat is scared shitless. So. Well, sure. Look at all this creepy stuff under the stairs. <laughs> I used to my aunt and uncle had a basement like this. I totally understand this. Now, did you hide down there or were you relegated down there? Both. I, I uh <laughs> it was great, it was great for hide and seek, but also uh I, as a small kid, he used to scare the hell out of me if the lights were out. Because, yeah, God only knew what kind of creatures much uh, like depicted here were uh, roaming around this basement. So I understand. I get it. Poor cat. Jesus. Hey, actually, <laughs> while we're scrolling through, let me just say that Elizabeth and Megan are the editors who work on the Glow comic for IDW. Awesome. They actually invited their writers, who I'm sure you know as the great actresses from the show. And they actually wrote a story um, that was called Glow in the Dark. <laughs> which was apt, of course. So Amy Garcia and AJ Mendez did a terrific job. So their story's in here too. But what we have here is a story actually that's by Sam Maggs, Sweeney Boo, and Haley Rose Lyon about Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> you I'm right, have, I see. right, you can't have a compendium that's meant for all ages to support female and non-binary comic book retailers. Without a D and D salute, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's no, that's gorgeous, man. Absolutely hilarious. So very cool. And then uh, now another story, uh, chop till you drop. And you know, I can relate to this because uh, I, although I'm due for another haircut, uh, my bangs were growing past my nose, and I had to do this exact move, as we see in the first panel in uh, Chop Till You Drop. Well, this is actually part of the bathroom section, and. Mm -hmm. Again, I can't tell a lie. I have a terrible poker face, but when Nicole Booth signed on to work with us, she she was an editor of Marvel many years ago, and she was excited to get back in the editing game. She came in at the tail end, so we say she drew the last straw because most of us really wanted to avoid the bathroom for all the obvious reasons. <laughs> and there was this running joke among editors that if left in the wrong hands, as in someone who is neither female nor non-binary, this section would be off our <laughs> jokes. And John, I dare you to deny that. I, I'm <laughs> waving to the camera. Absolutely, Shell. I, you're right. That would have been my first reflex. Absolutely. But Nicole, actually, <laughs> she, she told me that she was a little disappointed at first, but she certainly turned it around. 
And I think this is one of the best sections. She turned it into a place to go for relaxation and rejuvenation. So what you're seeing here is something that Chris, you were saying everybody has been faced with this at some point. Absolutely. Right? Everybody's had to cut their hair in the bathroom during this quarantine. So this yes. is very relatable. <laughs> and even and guys. It's, it's yep. by MJ Kremer, who's a great writer, and Lindsay J. Bryan, who is a terrific illustrator. She also illustrates greeting cards. Um, and I just want to say, give her a shout out because she did such a great job on this story and has just been like so many of the other young, talented women who donated their time and then also help us promote. I think the promoting part is critical to continuing to raise money. When we started this project, we knew we wanted to do a digital compendium because at the time we weren't even sure if printers were gonna be up and running. Absolutely. In the summer. So we were pretty sure we wanted to do it digitally but we wanted to make the whole project a three prong initiative. So in addition to the Gumroad digital anthology, we had an eBay auction, which is still ongoing through Jen King's Facebook comic book shopping network. And I want to shout out to them as well. And to all the wonderful people who donated some, just not only things from like the, their own archives. I mean, I did a little excavation of my garage and found a few Sandman statues that didn't need to live in Los Angeles anymore. So we had people donate all kinds of things. And I had some signed art prints from the Hay Amateur Project. So major shout out to Jen and all the people that helped us. We raised a few thousand dollars just from that eBay auction. And of course we have a spoon flower print that's going to be going up on their site very, very soon. The hell's a spoon flower print? Help me out, buddy. There you go. Oh, can we get a close-up of that, uh, Alec? We can. We Lovely. Shall. Fantastic. Yeah. There's like Here. several. Here's the cool thing about... Oh, and uh, and Chris has one, too. Let's, uh, let's zoom she in does. on Chris. Mm -hmm. Outstanding. That's so great. Chris was actually making some coasters. Chris, is that, one your, is that a large coaster for your it's extra a, large cocktail? It is. It is for a large mug. Okay. Fair enough. There we go. Tea. There we go. <laughs> One of the great things about insider art, and, and this is tricky, and again, bad poker face, I only speak truths and half truths to you, John, but <laughs> at the start of this project, I knew there would be people who were not pencils down. There were a lot of people scrambling for work. There were a lot of artists and writers who were way too busy. So I came up with this approach called Just One Cat. Now, as a Cure fan, you're going to tell me that was a cross between Just One Kiss and The Love Cats. I wouldn't have gotten right. that. I, I must okay. confess. Negative two points for John. As I say, I'm back. I'm back. Kelly. <laughs> and basically, I, I, would, I would say to people, we'd love for you to donate. Please pitch us a story. If you don't have time, how about sending us Just One Cat? And so we would, we would have people who were incredibly generous, and they would just draw a cat on a four by four piece of, of board. And not only do we run the cats within the book, but we also got to auction many of them off on Jen's Facebook comic shopping network site. And Amazing. I'm, I'm looking around because Chris and I actually almost got into a tussle over one cat in particular. <laughs> mine, mine jumped to the floor. So Chris, is yours handy? It is. Oh, let's zoom in on uh, Chris for a second. You see so, that? Beautiful. A wonderful British artist named Jade Perkin not only worked on a, a four-page story for Chris, I think. Yeah. Yes. About pickling. Wow. Yeah. So, so, John, you know, when you want to impress your relatives and prove to them that you can still cook, <laughs> we've got a pickling recipe for you. But I Jade, like it. Jane mm -hmm. was also kind enough to, to send us not one, but two cats, which was a really good thing because that particular cat, everyone knew it was my favorite, but Chris didn't care. And she made it clear to everybody in the group she was going to bid on that cat anyway. <laughs> so then I came back and I said, Chris, this cat is going to be on my introduction. So this cat needs to come home, needs to be a part of my house. <laughs> And then Chris replied, I don't care. Too bad for you. I'm bidding on the cat. But sure enough, there were two. So we both won. Oh, very nice. Okay, that's good. Yeah. 
good solution. <laughs> there was no blood loss between us. Seriously. Shell, you need a podcast, buddy. I swear to God, you 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 kill me every time you're on. No, that's what that's what you're for. I it's my well, it's good. Then we'll make this a monthly ritual. There you go. We we did we pretty much did June, July, and August, Shell. So yeah, there you go. We did. We had a lot of fun with China Clugston Flores too. And we've got an illustration of uh, her uh, garage band history that uh, we'll, we'll get to. But tell us about this uh, beautiful seaside thing that doesn't seem to be inside the house. I'm confused. Well, it may not be inside the house per se, but it's a magical realist piece that's inspired by the bathroom. Again, Nicole Boos, five stars. She actually <laughs> takes the trophy. This is a piece that I love to pieces. It's um, about the writer, Stephanie Nina. I'm going to say this correctly, Stephanie. If I mispronounce it, I apologize. Pizzerillos. She's a wonderful writer she's a prose writer she's been doing comics for the past few years and she actually submitted this piece about her grandmother's bathroom and how whenever she went to her grandmother's bathroom there were so many trinkets and so many things that inspired her time at the beach and one of the other things not that it, i want this to be all about me but i was designing quite a few of the prose stories and this piece really caught my eye and I really felt it was worthy of a very New Yorker-esque layout. So it was sure. very, very um, clean and bold and graphic. And I think so beautifully rendered by Ashley Riblet, who is a wonderful painter. So this is just another one of the features that you'll find in the bathroom section. And talk about chill at the beach, John. <laughs> when was the last time you chilled at the beach? I'm wait Honestly, Shell, I'm waiting for them to reopen because... I would love to swim and I, I, I don't trust my, my gym to go back to the gym because Illinois keeps uh, surging back up after flattening for a week or so. So yeah. I want them to reopen the beaches and not only am I ready uh, with my bathing suit, but also I, I purchased a wetsuit. So uh, yes. So imagine a portly, uh, a portly, why am I blanking on his name? Or a portly Keanu Reeves in point blank, as opposed to a <laughs> hey. slick surfing looking guy. But uh, yeah, only man. If, only if you wear the hat. We need. We need. Oh, I got the. Oh, I got the cowl. We need, Absolutely. We need the scuba mask, the hat, and the insider art pin. <laughs> or you're back in the doghouse. Oh, you're back in the doghouse anyway. <laughs> I know. No, I'm stuck there. I understand. I totally understand. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, then, Chris, we got uh, we got again these uh, wonderful recipes for. Uh, yeah. Egg pasta and quiche. That's great. What other recipe? And we said pickling, obviously. Yeah, there's pickling in there. There's also, uh, there's how to do a coffee press. There, oh, great. Yeah, there, there's a ton of recipes in there that are really cool. And this one is how to make bread, actually, in case that wasn't clear. Um, while great. meditating. It's like a meditational thing. So That's great. I yeah. uh, Chris got in the... Go ahead, Michelle. Go ahead, Sean. No, I just wanted to say Chris got in a lot of trouble with her dad. <laughs> Chris, Chris revealed the secret family recipe for apple cider pie. It's my fault, oh, no. but she's still going to have to take the blame. Wow. Excellent. I didn't really get in trouble. It was more of a, a mock anger. <laughs> That's not what your dad told me. <laughs> oh, my God. You, uh, when there, you go home, when you when you go home to your high school bedroom, it is going to be now like a fisherman's workshop. Oh, I'm afraid that ship has sailed. It's already an awful. <laughs> I, <mean. laughs> I, I was uh, neglecting uh, comments here, everybody. Um, comments, oh, no. Mrs. Plain, gotta love Shelly Bond. Next time, we need a cat's in clash coat clothing. Absolutely. I like that. I like your style, commenter. Comics. Mix Miss explained. Miss explained, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> the Englishman in San Diego, insider art, one of the best things to come out this entire blank situation and such a talented lineup. Completely agree. Uh, Shell, as always, you, you, and then Chris, you as well, you guys curated an incredible lineup of, uh, of people to, uh, to contribute to this book. And some of my favorite people in comics are represented in insider art. So, and Shelly, but you know. And it will. <laughs> the UK powerhouse that is Lucy Sullivan and Carter's. Oh, you're freezing a little bit, Shell. Always follows me. 
What's up? You were freezing a little bit. I don't know your reception. We weren't getting uh, every word. Oh, but are you, you're, you're giving praise to uh, the oh. Englishman in San Diego, Andy? Yes, I'm giving praise to, to Leonard, who is the Englishman in San Diego, and Leonard from Broken Frontier, who wears a hat like nobody's business for you when you decide to wear a hat. <laughs> I got to get ahead. Like, and uh, like just... came in and they really, they, they, they recommended such terrific people from the small press arena in the UK, which is bustling and booming, I might add. That's awesome. Don't sleep on that, John. Don't no. sleep on that. Go to Bro no. Broken Frontier. You got to check out the, today was small press day. You have to see the tremendous coming out of there. Um, young and old. It's not just like, you know, the kids out of art school. Across sure. The but I'm seeing like, People really level up at 50. Sounds good. That's great. Six That's good to hear. <laughs> yeah, you're really, uh, Shell, you may want to leave and come back as far as re signing on okay. because uh, you're freezing a lot. Okay. So, yeah, if you all would. Right. And um, no worries. Of course. Hey, look, I mean, please. It's all good. Yeah. Well, you know, Chris and I, Chris and I will hold court until then. We can so, handle it. So, how do you bond with uh, with Shell Beyond Comics, uh, Chris? What what common interest to you? Uh, oh, with this is actually how I met Shelly. And you know, we'd met previously before, but you know, we didn't keep in touch or anything. Um, and this project, we actually we actually bonded on it. No pun intended. <laughs> so we're working on some other stuff um, aside from insider art. And so, yeah, uh, we, we work really well together. Yeah, we've it, been having a good time. It's really, honestly, and as I've gotten to know Shell over the last couple of years and talking to other creators about her and stuff, I, I was just talking, again, not to name drop, but Ed Brubaker and I did an interview earlier this week. And um, he's like, you know, Shelly is the one that had noticed my uh, Low Life book, his indie, indie comic back in the day. And yeah, uh, and yeah so, you know, really, uh, Sh Shelly was the one that got Ed into Vertigo and kind of helped uh, start his uh, mainstream career. I is just spectacular. She she's something else. I mean, I'll tell you. Like I admired her before I met her, and I was absolutely thrilled when I finally did get a chance. And she seems so surprised, you know. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, you've done all this amazing stuff. And she was like, what, really? Like it's just <laughs> that's just who she is, you know. But um, yeah, she's responsible for such a, a ton of people coming up in the industry. You know, it's it's just been fantastic. And I've been working with her on another project. And um, she just manages to snag out these people, you know, which I would normally just kind of pass by, but, you know, she sees something in them and, and you know, and then she grooms them and she helps them to become better. You know, she's a, a great mentor. I've been learning so much from her. So I'm not surprised. And, you know, uh, Black Crown, her imprint at IDW was really an ambitious thing. And I'm sorry that it didn't get more time because, uh, yeah. God, when she, when she put um, people like... Um, and I, I think it was uh, Gabriel Hernandez and um, and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Teeny Howard on uh, you know Assassinistas. I thought it was a terrific book that cracked me up. And and really, again, going going back to her Vertigo days as well. All those I, earlier, I was uh, doing a panel with Axel Alonso, and uh, I'm friends with Will Dennis. All the great Vertigo editors, honestly, and certainly Karen Berger and Joan Hilty come to mind as well. Mm -hmm. uh, great tastemakers. Yeah, and that's that's a that's a serious trait in Shell that I really uh, appreciate. And yes, yeah, she's just got that eye. And it, you know, forever, DC is very corporate with their editors and mm -hmm. they don't want editors to like reveal stories. So they, they, they really kind of keep them at arm's length from the press. And it used to drive me crazy. And Will is like the first one that I really bonded with. And I'm like, there's gonna be a day when you're not working for Vertigo. And when that day comes, I expect a lot of stories. And he laughed about it. And, and Shelly was the same thing, here she's back. <laughs> so all we were saying, Shell, were vicious things about you. Of course you were. <laughs> Of course, I expect no less from Chris. <laughs> <laughs> no, truly, Shell. I was saying that uh, you're you and 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 again, you continue to do it. And Chris was not giving us details, but teasing that there's an upcoming project that the two of you are working on. But really, I was talking to Axel earlier today on a panel, and a uh, Brubaker uh, earlier this week, and um, you know, uh, he reminded me that uh, you're the one that saw Low Life and. Uh, said this guy should be at Vertigo. 
I'm Atta a girl. comics yeah, reader. Did, right? What can I say? You 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 know, you can't stop me from reading comics. You just can't. You can try. Not what were you what, what when when uh, when you when you were on John Con a couple of weeks ago when you were talking about being was it a campfire girl? Is that what you were? What? When you were talking about being a camp and uh come on. Oh 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 <laughs> you're gonna take me back there? You're gonna take me back to camp when I was the littlest camper. You're John, the littlest camper, absolutely. I John, love that. You, That's you, fantastic. You go back there. <laughs> no. have, John, I'm gonna have to ask you once again why you haven't delivered with Brian Ferry. I <laughs> and you're gonna have to tell Chris this story. It, it would you be can my set and, yourself up for it. And the mainframe Comic Con audience, absolutely. Please. Um for years, Chris, I worked for 10 years at a rock station in Chicago, and it was the alternative rock station. And uh, also, also at the sports station in town. <laughs> one night, I was producing a sports show, and there was a knock it's at the back. Actually, not that funny, Chris. I'm not sure. Is there someone behind John making a face? It's not that it, it, you're. It, it's it's not that funny, but it's an important story. Sorry, go on, John. Oh, no worries. All good. I, I want to make sure there wasn't an intruder or anything in my house. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it was one night I was producing a sports show, and there was a knock at our back door during a commercial, so I could answer the door, and I opened the door. And lo and behold, the Cary Grant of rock and roll from from Roxy Music, Brian Ferry, is at the door. Oh, and yeah. just, just imagining it for the fourth time. <laughs> Joe loves that story. So yeah. I love that story. You know, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Really love- Allie. <laughs> I, I only love that story because every time John is live with another guest, I'll write in a question and I'll say, John, did you give Brian Ferry my digits yet? <laughs> If he'll only. say no. If he only. Won't, he won't even lie about it. He just says, no, I did nope. not. Chips that pass in the night. What can I say? I'm sorry. It was like, <laughs> as I always make the comparison, Chris, it was like living in a monkey's episode because really like Elvis Costello would come in studio and play a song and Lyle Lovett and uh, Robbie Robertson of the band and uh, all these all these incredible people. And maybe that's our cue to, uh, I mean, we should, uh, do you want to go in order, Rochelle? Should we continue sure. in there? Let's so we've it. got Imagination here by Miriam Bloom. Right. Now, this is the attic section. Ooh. Creepy attic. Now, Mariah Huner McCourt was supposed to be here today and unfortunately couldn't make it, but she did a great job curating the attic. As you can see, there's some really spooky stuff. Um, and not only were there a number of great short stories, one of the coolest things Mariah did, which we didn't represent here, but if you, if you pick up insider art, mm-hmm. you will love this. She did a progression of color where she started her section in black and white and she slowly added hues so that by the time we get to the section you're looking at, it's in full color, which mm-hmm. I thought was a terrific way to show a crescendo because it was also halfway through the book. Ooh. And we don't like books that sag in the middle, John. So she, she came up with this great idea and I think it really helps elevate just the attention span because this is the kind of book that you can enjoy in one sitting or you can enjoy over a summer going back to camp. You know, I always, when I, when I was the littlest camper in 1974 at Camp Pymere, I discovered David Bowie. Chris, this is another story that John Kahn fans and also <laughs> Word Balloon fans know well, but that's where I discovered David Bowie. 1974, the camp counselors were putting their makeup on and Rebel Rebel was on the radio. So mm-hmm. that explains everything. That's the story, John. He's he's silently laughing. It's his favorite story about me. Truly. Forget the Sandman, forget Fables, forget Brew Baker. It's Camp Pymere, the little And Rebel Rebel, yeah. Tap dancing on the stage. So, <laughs> <She's> anyway, <right. laughs> I'm not going back there anymore, John. That was it. Until you deliver with Brian Ferry, there's no more. All right, I'll do my best. I, you know, Jesus. But this, uh, but this attic section is great. You know, and like like I said, this is the kind of book that you can read in dribs and drabs. There are two page stories. There are eight page stories. There's something for everyone. And this prose story by Jody Hauser is terrific. Yes. Takes you right into her head and her past with her grandfather and her attic. And I want to give a shout out to Megan Hutchison who is one of my favorite people in comics. She's my goth sister. And she did this great cat 
which I just want to say thanks again, Megan, you rock. And her cat also actually, I think was the top seller in the auction. I have no idea who ended up buying it, but there was a bidding war and yeah. I think it went for like almost a grand. Wow. Is, I could be lying about that. I'm going to just say, I think it went for like something like that, but I think it too. I recall seeing it. Yeah. It's a, it's a beautiful piece of art. Thank you to the person who actually won the eBay auction. Thank you, Megan, for donating and for being such a badass artist. You're here. And mm -hmm. Megan and I, sisters, LA sisters, come back home. It's really hot and sweaty here, and you would be very uncomfortable like the rest of us. <laughs> so now where are we? Mexican papel. We are in the craft room. Ah. The great Sophie Dodgson was able to somehow convince, I think maybe 25 people. Some of these are one pagers. She really had a huge turnout of people. Give us the goods. Um, on the left of your screen, you have an artist who I think is gonna take over comics. She is such a powerhouse. Her name is Anna Pachalski. She goes by A.D. Pachalski. Not only is she an inventive storyteller, she is an exquisite painter. And she actually has a website where you can find Russian dolls that she paints. Oh, wow. So she had a collection of Alice in Wonderland uh, dolls. And she also had a beautiful set of different rabbits, which I actually purchased for my stepmother-in-law. So when I tell you we have talented artists, many are cartoonists. Some are zine makers and cartoonists. Some are fine artists or painters. As you see here, we have Lauren Hole who teaches you how to make your own eight page zine. Yes. Which I am so happy zines are back. I mean, I loved zines back in the seventies. Chris is, is a bit younger than us, but John, did you make your own zines in the seventies? I did not make my own zines, but I certainly admired them. And uh, much like you, I mean, I am glad they're back. And one of the great shows in Chicago that unfortunately, of course, uh, isn't happening this year is cake in uh, that always happens in June. And that's yeah. a terrific zine show and a great, uh, breaking through artist show. So I do love going there and I just kind of quietly slip through the aisles and uh, check out the new people and what they're doing. It's great. I think we need to do a John Con zine next year. <laughs> Chris, what do you think? Do you think yeah, we can get I'm people in. together? Yeah. Well, this is great because you do. You take, a, you take one piece of paper and you show how to fold it and the right uh, pages, uh, the right page count and everything to be able to make this and, and, you know, have your story make sense and everything. So that's great. Oh no, listen, 270 pages. You are gonna be a pro at so many things, John, after you make it through this collection. Even, you know, scrolling up next, this this is one of my favorite pieces. It's by Georgie Berriman. And not only does Georgie have an inventive style here, I just, I love their cartooning. I love the fact that you can just print this out and, and color, it'll be okay. <laughs> Let's face it, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, like we didn't know what the hell was going on and where we'd be yeah. in three months. But yeah. John, the, there's some good news on the horizon and I'll let Chris, in, in, in case she already spilled the news, we're really working hard to try to make Insider Art a print edition. That's yeah. excellent. Mm -hmm. This is a, even before the pandemic, this to me feels like a rainy day book. Oh, yeah. And really, you know, when, when kids are stuck in the house and there's so many great crafts and, and really fun things to do with, yeah. with the kid. So I think that's, yeah, I, I hope, I hope so. I mean, it's, it's great. It looks fantastic on your tablet, but I, but it would be great. And obviously teasing us with the spiral edition that you were holding up earlier, Shell, I think that's a great idea. And like you said, rainy day activities also when, ki when, when kids are sick, to have a chapter you can go through. I mean, it makes being yeah. sick and staying at home that much easier, right? Or you can take it to camp, John. And again, yes, indeed. Camp you would dog. know. You would know. I would know. Take your tap <laughs> shoes and your insider art to camp and you're set for the summer, even if they pick on you. And sometimes they do. Oh, Michelle, you are, are no, I don't believe that. Honestly, uh, your stature. Uh, the memoir. You know, read, you're, you'll you're, read the memoir. You'll see. You're flinty, pal. You are like. I wouldn't mess with you. You'd scare the hell out of me. 
<laughs> so I was asking Chris how she bonded with you. And truly in our conversations, as you well know, but the audience doesn't, that uh, we both worked at our college radio stations. And uh, yeah, I, so I'm like, yeah, we would have been friends. Shelly and I would have been friends as much as we pick on each other. Maybe not. Exactly. Actually, I would not be cool enough to hang with Shelly. I don't know the hat. You blew it today with the dress code. So. I understand. But our but our mutual love for Paul Weller, come on. Yeah, but you know where I, with Paul Weller, I I go, I go to ninety seven. I don't follow you into the into the twenty first century with Paul Weller. But that's a, that's going to be a lightning round for another time. Indeed. Or so, or so you keep promising me. It would be a shell. That'll be our September conversation. I have I no hope, doubt. Chris, so here, absolutely. Chris and I, I understand. Chris has to understand that John keeps threatening to do a lightning round of Paul Weller starting with the jam and the style council and the Paul Weller experience, his solo work. John, well, I think, I know that's your, that is your challenge, Shell. I come back with, I would be more comfortable doing one hit wonders of, of the new wave of the generation. But, so. but why be comfortable, John? <laughs> why be comfortable? Because I don't want to say, I don't know. I, I, don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, because I, I know a good share of, of, of jam and, and style council you. songs in particular. You are an encyclopedia of knowledge about comics, film, movies, television, garage rock. Indeed. And that's why I, I stop at this one, because this is where you, China, and I really bonded. And I do. I, am, I, I, was, a D, I was a music DJ for several years of my radio career before switching to talk and sports. And uh, and I'm a massive oldies fan, and the history of garage bo- uh, rock, going back to the beginnings of rock and roll, and and especially again, I worked at an oldies station, so I would play question mark in the Mysterians or the Swinging Medallions or uh, the Knickerbockers, one of those Beatles knockoff bands that did a song called Lies. You know, you know it if you heard it on an oldies station. But that's kind of what this uh, great poster is, which is uh, a great timeline, and uh, look at the. The history of garage rock, absolutely. And and another massive shout out to China Cludston Flores, who is also a powerhouse cartoonist. And I know her Blue Monday work is going to be reissued again soon. She is just yep. one of the best. And it's been a blast working with her. She not only generously donated her time to putting this print together. I mean, John, do you have it on your wall yet? We, we may No, I have to get it framed. I mean, you know, COVID and all, but I, but it is uh, it's, sitting it's, waiting for a frame. It's huge. It's, huge. it's, it's, it's gorgeous. It, as, as John's dementia kicks in, he'll have this and he'll hold on. <laughs> I can continue to win those lightning rounds on Jeopardy. But China not only did this wonderful two page spread, she also did a terrific cat, which I'm going to hold up because the cat really was our house cat. He's mm-hmm. a classic tuxedo cat, and I decided yeah, I'll get to out of this. And, yeah, there we go. Thank you. Cat on the title page. Bring a little. Like there that. she is. Okay. There we go. Can yep. we see? Is that yep. good? Yep. So basically, China's cat led the pack, mm-hmm. and lots of the other artists would sneak in shots of the house cat into their stories, which is why we have a challenge to anyone who's willing to count the cats. We <laughs> want to know how many there are. There are differing numbers. So it, it would be a lot of fun if people went to our website at insiderart.net. Let us know what they think and how many cats they've counted. You'll die when you check out this poster and see all the different bands that are mentioned. And then I love this part at the bottom as well. If you want your own garage band, you're going to need musicians, <laughs> oh, yeah. buzz box, your bandmate's garage, of course, an amplifier, natty hairdo, and fat <laughs> hair. <laughs> and then, John, if I'm not mistaken, you had asked me at the in the conversation we had with China, you had asked if I could make you a pair of those boots that says that say Fab on. If them. you if you would, I'd be I would be I would be I'm thrilled still, to wear them, and I'm I would show you. Still working on them. All right, there you go. I'm a, li- I'm a little busy this summer. I've had to wash my hair a few times, but as soon as they're ready, I might even put taps on the bottom of them so you can tap dance in them. Outstanding. Fantastic. Have you ever heard? I, it was the movie Kinky Boots, but did you ever hear that song that Patrick McNee kind of speaks? And I think it was made during the the old Avengers 60s uh, TV show about the spies, not the uh, superheroes. You would, you would think, but the answer is negative. Really? 
Shocking. Sorry. Well, Philip was cracking me up. You're a fine husband when we, you were you were ratting about on his on his music choices. But what you call folk music, it's like that's oh. not music. Come we, on. You, hey, we can't go there. We can't bring Philip into this right now. It's just not fair. <laughs> Philip's awesome. He was cracking me up during John Cut. It was great. Funny, right for a shy guy, he's really funny. <laughs> Absolutely. Good Actually, Lord. Chris, if you, you want to talk a little bit about the garage section. Yeah, please, Chris. I mean, it's your section, Shelly. I, I know, but I've been doing. I've been talking too much, and I want. I want to hear <laughs> what you sorry, Chris, the yeah. garage section. We're all the way at the end. Actually, no. the The garage section is is pretty special because um, you actually have a professional skateboarder, right? That that did some well, story. Yes. It, in addition to a professional, two professional skateboarders. Ooh. There's also there we we have real musicians who contributed as well. Yes, but I'll talk about the professional skateboarders first. We have Cindy Whitehead, who mm -hmm. some of you may know as just a powerhouse social disruptor. One of the few women who was inducted into the Skateboarding Hall of Fame, and she had her introduction by Joan Jett, which I still think is the coolest thing in the world. Yeah. But she was like a, a major skateboarder and one of the first female skateboarders to have a spread in like a skateboarding magazine. I can't remember if it's Thrasher, but one of the really popular magazines back in the 70s. Chris, you were too young, but John and I were like trying really hard to skateboard in our neighborhoods. And I had like, you know, one of those big wooden boards with like the tiny silver wheels that like you know they would wouldn't even go over the cracks you would just fall off oh yeah and, and then the plastic penny boards i tried i tried but cindy is the real deal she wrote a story for uh, another skateboarder to illustrate and this is so cool a young a young girl who is 12 i should say a young woman who's 12 um, named lola the illustrator is not only one of the skateboarders for Cindy's collective called Girl Is Not A Four Letter Word. She's also one of the artists, a graffiti artist for the Bushwick Collective. Wow. So when you look at her art and I tell you she's 12, you can't believe your eyes. She is really, I mean, like, I think the next Keith Haring of New York, she is just so good and so smart and so cool and professional. I mean, Everybody on this book delivered in a timely fashion, but Lola, she blew everyone away. She not only did her story in record time, and it was, I think, four pages. It was a long one. Is it in, is it in the collection of pages you gave me, Shell, or no? It, it's not in the, no. the PDF I gave you, but I'm yeah. going to actually pull up a, yeah. a, okay. a, a bit of it because it's oh, just, it's go just so good. You have to see it. Yeah, we really want to see it now that you've talked about it. Absolutely. Yeah. Here it is. How's that? Wow. Good Lord. She's a, right? she's a great artist. She's a great artist. I mean. Fantastic. You know, and, and to be that good at, at 12, you can just only imagine how she's going to be at 16. Exactly. She's, curious, she's <laughs> curious about it. And she's a doll. She's a terrific person. So I, I it's the second time I've worked with her. And I just I can't wait to work with her again and to kind of follow her career path. Shell, as you know, the, the people like Jim Shooter that started at like 13 and writing right. great comic books and, and uh, yeah. Jerry Conway was really young when he started. So it's about time we had a woman that, uh, right? that, that started when she, absolutely. So that's great. I look forward to uh, the evolution of her work. That's wonderful. Yeah, she's she's terrific. Wow. Definitely keep an eye on her. Um, Outstanding. The other, the other team I wanted to mention is we have the bass player of the band The Wedding Present who is not only a terrific writer, but she teaches yoga. Talk about multifaceted. Her name is Terry DeCastro, and she did this wonderful page um, on how to write industrial music um, and record it in your garage. And it's a wonderful one-pager uh, illustrated by Carrie McNinch, who she brought in, whose work I didn't know, but it's terrific. So um, one of the best things about this book is seeing what everyone else brought in because I always play favorites and it gave me the opportunity to work with some of my other favorites in comics. I'm going to show you this game board. Yes. So I that, love the game board. Yes. Right? So I reached out to Vita Ayala, who is also one of my favorite writers in comics today. And she's just 
a terrific person. They're just a terrific person. And yes. they pitched me a game board. And I thought, that's amazing. We didn't have something like that. And to make it legit, you can go to our website, you can download the board and also the pieces. Now the board was drawn by Sally Canarino, who is also a wonderful artist who's based in New Jersey. She's also a part Philly girl. We have a lot in common. She lived in Philadelphia like I did for a while. Yeah. And the colorist on this is Gab Contreras, who contributed quite a few coloring yeah. um, pages in the book. So thank you to Gab for not just doing one project, but doing multiple projects. That really meant a lot. Were you on a show uh, on John Con when, when Vita was on? Cause she I was, was not. I was going to say, I didn't think the two of you were on at the same, pardon me, the, that all of you were on at the, at the same time, but uh, they're great. And uh, yeah. I look forward to a conversation with them uh, uh, in, a, in a few weeks or so, but uh, no terrific stories uh, was blowing me away. So uh, yeah, I'm really, I'm glad she was part of John Con. And uh, I, I didn't, I didn't put two and two together that they did the, uh, the game. That's terrific. Yeah, they're they're major gamer. Both Sally and Vita. I'm not sure about Gab, but I know that the the two of them were are serious tabletop gamers. So, yeah, I felt like that was the final element we needed to have a real yeah. balanced compendium. Agreed. No, it's a tremendous book, and again, uh, a donation of of ten dollars at 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 Crunchyroll. Correct. Gumroad. I'm Gumroad. sorry. Say it again. Yes, and Gumroad. Gumroad, yes. Gumroad, there we go. Gumroad.com yeah. Gumroad slash insider art. That's where you go. And it's a wonderful cause as well. So, uh, yeah, I mean, what can I say? Honestly, it's been a, it's been a, uh, really a, a pleasure talking about this book and making people Thank aware you. of it the last few months. And no, you know, Shell, seriously, and the same thing with um, the, the nine uh, panel grid. Uh, okay, it, amateur. Okay, amateur, absolutely. Yeah. And that's a great artistic challenge. And that's... Mm -hmm. It truly, I mean, beyond beyond your eye for for interesting stories and putting together young and old creators as you did at Black Crown in particular. That's what Chris and I were talking about. And music, right? Yeah, hell yeah, absolutely. Art and alchemy, com comics and chaos. John, I feel like my dad is like flooding your bank account. You're always so kind to me. Thank you so much. I really appreciate all the support, the enthusiasm. Buddy, like I said, I appreciate your eye, and I, I thank you for well, who's that. I, I had a when I when I was experiencing technical difficulties, I was crying into my Joe Strummer pillow. And I had to bring it to show that the other Clash fan. This is this is just to say props to anyone who follows my musical taste. Do not follow my husband's. <laughs> Fine. Sorry, me and Philip will be. Uh, Similar to our Rod McEwen albums and sighing. It's all right. That's fine. That's all right. He's a good man. So, He's Chris, uh, any any other prizes, Chris, that you can tell us about as far as uh, what we should look for on the racks? Um, we're not going to divulge anything yet, but we will say to keep an eye out for the Insider Art Kickstarter that will be launching soon because that'll be kind of, you know, um, a gateway to maybe doing some more projects together. Right, Shelly? Yeah, absolutely. I think the great thing about Kickstarter is that this will give us a chance to not only continue to get this book into, into the hands of people who may have missed it, you know, even though it's available digitally, but the thing that's so great about Kickstarter is we'll be able to actually pay the contributors a little something. Yeah. They were all so generous and it's hard working for free. You know, we all donated our time, but everybody's got to make a living, especially now. It's a it's a pretty weird environment. So if you can, just keep your eyes peeled. And even if you can't back us on Kickstarter, please just maybe share the information. Or um, even on, on Gumroad, one thing that's really interesting is on Gumroad, you can actually buy a digital copy for someone else. So oh, that's I know great. I know some people have gifted it for their friends' kids or for their nieces and nephews or their grandma. John, you never know who might enjoy this. So No, actually, now that you mention it, that's a great idea. And I, I think maybe to uh, to gift a couple of my uh, my younger cousins who have children and stuff, I think that would be very nice. That That's terrific. And, They're the right and, age. And, and I also think that it's really fair to say, like, in the age that we're living in where there is so much... Uh, uncertainty in the world, this is a way to be kind. And I just want to stress that again. I mean, it was something that I wanted to do 
because I felt helpless. And it really helped me channel my own anxiety about what was going on in the world. When I reached out on the Facebook comic book women's group, there were a number of people like Chris who immediately just signed on board and she has a day job. A lot of other people just have been working straight through. And so I'm glad to be able to thank everyone yet again, anyone who's donated, who's picked up insider art on Gumroad, um, who has maybe purchased something on the eBay channel, um, who has just shared our information. We also have a Twitter account that Mariah handles at Project Insider. We've got an Instagram page. We've got a Facebook page. Anything you can do to help us spread the word. We really think this initiative is, is terrific and strong, and we want to boast about it because we want to continue to earn money for female and non-binary retailers. They were hit hard. We've got 28 of them who are getting money every other week, and we've only raised a little bit over five grand. I know we can do better. So, Okay. Well, yeah. My, I mean final, my final note is please help us support other people in comics who are not as visible. Agreed. It's a, it's a very uncertain time right now with the market. And um, even when things normalize, God only knows what that's going to look like. Mm -hmm. So it is great. And, and again, Shell, this is the conversation that I've been having with creators and, and Chris, did you, have you found this time tough to work through or, has it, you know, energized your creativity and you've been able to, you oh, know, I mean, uh, obviously working with Shell on Insider Art, but other projects as well. Yeah, it's been tough, actually. You know, I mean, I like I said, I have a day job, but, you know, I do a comic book for a video game company, so they haven't really been affected. Okay. But it's been tough just kind of motivating myself to get through everything and every day log on to Zoom, multiple Zoom calls, and okay. try to be creative when everything is going on around you, that's just bringing you down, you know, it's tough. It really is. And so struggling through it, but I have to say project insider was like a, um, it was like a light, you know, that came in um, and it was something fun to do. It was, you know, it brought people together and everyone worked in harmony and it was just a beautiful thing to be a part of. So it really was beneficial to me. And now she has a crush on Joe Strummer. <laughs> we <can blame> her. <laughs> well, the other thing that must be said when I announced the project, I, I said that under no uncertain terms that I have to have the garage because I wanted a garage band. And it was specifically because of Garage Land, because of Joe Strummer and what Strummer represents. Because seriously, he doesn't take any shit and he gets things done. And I think he's one of the best uh, front men. I'm right? With you. right, Chris? I'm with you. That's right. I Chris agree. knows she'll be fired if she doesn't agree. So, <laughs> drummer forever, insider art on Gumroad. Gumroad.com slash insider art. Absolutely. That's the place to buy it. It's a great book for a great cause. Absolutely. Uh, Chris, honestly, a pleasure meeting you. Pleasure. And hope we have another conversation down the road. Yeah. And uh, I'll see you in the, in the words of the happenings, a terrible band that you would absolutely hate. <laughs> for I will see you in September, Shelly Bart. See you then. <laughs> Lightning round. Yeah. Hell yes. Absolutely. Uh, well, bring it, lady. Absolutely. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, everybody take care. Make sure you come back uh, for tomorrow. It's going to be a great day Sunday. More great panels from Mainframe Comic Con. Thank you for uh, joining us today in this panel and others as well. And uh, another full lineup tomorrow. Eight hours of a lot of uh, online convention fun from Mainframe Comic Con. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Have a great night. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.